dun 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 dun
flying across the galaxy, celebrating beauty, wonder. With that as a calling, there could be only one ship up to the task. It's not just for the diamond laminate panel observation deck, nor for the proprietary lightweight durable hull plating. More, it's the full ensemble of comfort and safety that the Origin 600i provides as a home away from home. The backdrop may change, but the 600i is always centre frame. I'm Thomas Farrister, and I fly the Origin 600i. Origin 600i. Luxury without compromise. A distant signal, an adventure into the unknown. The corporation explores the farthest reaches of the universe. If you always dreamed of exploring strange new worlds, harvesting new life forms and incorporating new civilizations to boldly capitalize on what no one found before, then the corporation may have an internship for you. Damage to internal organs by a parasitic alien life form is not covered by corporate healthcare. Please consult the research division in case of bloating, heartburn, or nausea. In any case, don't eat the egg salad they serve down at the cantina.
This is new Babbage Interstellar Spaceport. Queen of Dragons, you are clear to disembark. Welcome to Tasa Spaceport. Queen of Dragons, you're clear for landing. Welcome to Riker Memorial Spaceport. Queen of Dragons, you're clear to land. Good to see you, Queen of Dragons. Welcome to August Dunlow Spaceport. Welcome to Orison, the majestic city in the clouds of Crusader. This unique location is famously beautiful and has made Orison a prime tourist destination in the Stanton system. It offers breathtaking views that you will never forget. Reserve your place today and save up to 20% on the upcoming Space Whale Tour. Orison, the place of your dreams.
I've already lined up a crew to retrieve it. Transmission says it's on Hurston. Destination set. Looks like we're going to meet up with Constantine Hurston? Looks legit. A few days ago, our ship, the Shelby Thames, had an unfortunate accident. That seemed a little weird to me. I agree. Why would he want us to retrieve something from Crusader space? There's not much out there other than farmers and aid stations. Could have been a humanitarian effort? <laughs> Only if he's developing bombs that fertilize crops.
What a time to be a citizen. Dumper's Depot's having a galaxy-wide fire sale. Forget about that Olympus Principal Health Insurance when you can get this Basilisk Rampart Shield Jenny for only $25,999. You'll feel so safe you could go for a family vacation in the pyro system. And who needs jump points when you can get these WaveTech XL1 Quantum Drives for only $49,999. Only at Dumper's Depot. Hell, <laughs> these deals are so good, the Nine Tails will stop blockading stuff stations and start some honest trading. <laughs> so get on over to your nearest Dumper Depot before it's too late. This is Starship Gemini on a humanitarian mission. We've been engaged by Ninetales pirates. Assistance is needed. Red alert. Battle stations. Fight them up, warriors. Power down, and we'll let you be with your lives. Give us what we want, and we'll leave you alone. Captain, we have support inbound. Big Daddy is here. Hello, Gemini. Looks like you could use a little help. We'll handle these pirates, scum. I can't get them off me, son of a bitch. Locked on. Last one. Hello everyone, so welcome uh, to Digital CitizenCon 2951. Uh, so it's really, really good to be back in front of the camera and talking to all of you out there. Uh, I wish it was in person. As you know, we have been doing CitizenCons uh, for a long time and last year was the last year we didn't do it because of the pandemic. Uh, and we didn't want to go another year without having a CitizenCon, but we felt like this year it was a bit too close to get back to do it in person with all the issues with travel and we're doing it virtually and digital this year uh, and I'm hoping next year we'll get to do it in person. So it's been very challenging for all of us, there's about 720 of us have all been working from home, uh, but uh, you know, a silver lining to that cloud which is a lot more of you have had more time to play Star Citizen and give us feedback and get engaged. I mean we, compared to where we were in the last time we had a physical citizen con in 2019 the number of daily players that we have in star citizen is on average two to three times more than we had back in 2019 which is fantastic 2020 was a big year of expansion for us 21 is also been incredibly great 
and we're hoping with some of the features that we're working on, like server meshing, we're working on a bunch of optimizations, quality of life, and maturing you know, some of the gameplay loops that you're starting to see happen. I mean, we've got some stuff coming up like Death of a Staceman, uh, where the first part of it, the medical gameplay, is going to be there, and also the beginning of physical inventory with the personal inventory. It's not fully finished yet. Those are two major game changers that are coming very shortly. In fact, they're coming with 3.15, and there's a lot of other things that are uh, just beyond that, and we're going to continue that momentum, and uh, you know, more and more people will be discovering Star Citizen, and more and more you will be spending more hours playing it and having fun, giving us great feedback, and we're inevitably inching towards the, the finish line of having something that we can say, yep, this is the definitive experience for you guys. And uh, so I'm really excited by that. Uh, but let's get back to today. And today is about Digital Citizen Con, and we've got some really great stuff to show you. The first of that is going to be led off by Todd Pappy with Ian Leland and David Haddock. And I don't want to spoil it. There's some really great stuff. It's going to use a combination of some features that are coming very soon and some features and content that is a little further down the road. Uh, but it's going to give you a taste of life to come in the Star Citizen universe. So without further ado, let me pass it to them. Hi, I'm Todd Pappy, Star Citizen Live Game Director. Hi, I'm Ian. I'm the Art Director for Star Citizen. Hi, I'm Dave. I'm the Narrative Director at Star Citizen. So finally, we're saying goodbye to Stanton. It's quite, quite precious to us. We've been talking about it. We've been looking at it. We've been living there for quite a long time. Now it's time to, you know, move the conversation on, start to look at something new. Mm -hmm. Now it's changed slightly the jump point side is from what we saw um, a little while ago. One of the things that was quite important for Chris is he wanted that feeling of um, something that was quite wondrous, something that was quite amazing. You know, it's not dark, it's not mysterious, it's not hostile, but it's more, like I said, wondrous. So when we started looking at 
Pyro, and we had to start looking at how the jump points work when we're traveling from Stanton to Pyro or Pyro to Stanton, and thinking about border security, with the infrastructure that's needed there. What's the lore? Just because on one side it's it's very lawless versus the other side is is dealing with the UEE. So we needed to go through and really think about how this was working. And then also with the jump points, how smugglers would work with the secondary and tertiary routes that would lead into the main jump point and then funnel out. Yeah, we kind of call it internally, we kind of call it the Swiss cheese approach mm -hmm. of the, you know, there's sort of the main entrance that you would go through on Stanton, which would be the sort of guarded, have the infrastructure that you had mentioned. Uh, the security and stuff like that, but the possibility that there would be alternate ways to kind of get in yeah. to bypass that. So, which would be, you know, beneficial knowledge for smugglers uh, or criminals who are trying to, you know, get in under the radar. Yeah. And also it was, you know, if, if there's a lot of infrastructure around it, it, it sort of created this impression that that infrastructure was responsible for the jump point. When in reality, it's, it's a naturally occurring thing. An interesting balance of like, make it seem like this is a, a checkpoint, but at the same time, it's something that the, the ships are creating, not the structures. So before we go too much further into the power system, uh, let's take a deep dive into the op process with Jake Dunlop, and he's gonna be taking us through the authoring process for the Stanton and power jump points. Bringing jump points to the verse has been an interesting journey as we've been designing a new element in our game. We've put a lot of time into creating two solid examples of different types of jump points you'll eventually see all around the verse, one in Stanton and one in Pyro. We've been continuing to use Houdini as the tool to create these gas clouds. The setup we have for them is a parent gas cloud and a child gas cloud. The parent is mainly used as an establishing shot when you arrive in your ship from quantum travel, while the child is used as the main gameplay environment and is placed inside the parent. The child also has a reasonable scale, which keeps your average ship speed in mind. These things aren't nearly the size of real nebula, if you're curious. But by no means are the jump points small. Here's an example of a pirate jump point next to Microtech. To explain the process a bit more, uh, we create the parent at a large scale, then cut out a small box in the center of it. Inside the small box, we'll gather the volume data from the parent, up res that, and then add details. The details will be different depending on what type of gas cloud you want and if you want to easily fly through it or not. We usually spend time investigating different designs for the gas clouds, but with the Stanton jump point, the work had already been started and used in the 2019 CitizenCon demo. We just had to go through, clean up the Houdini file and get it game ready with a couple of extra tweaks along the way. Some of the tweaks we made to the parent were making it feel like more of a structurally sound rotating disc. This was to make it feel like a safe and well-used jump point. The child gas cloud here was changed more dramatically uh, it used to have a bunch of dark clouds around it. We felt that it was feeling a little bit too closed in, so we spent time morphing the magnetic lines in the center to create a really interesting horizontal, flowing, relaxing composition to visually show you that Stanton itself is generally a safe place at first glance. The parent gas cloud for Pirate was created with the same process as the Stanton parent, but we changed the shape of the cloud into something more menacing and violent. We wanted the reveal of Pyro to be a clear warning of what you should be expecting throughout the entire system. So we made it very closed in, uh, dense and very active. We did make it a small challenge to traverse the child, something that won't take too long, but should be something to consider when traveling through. Something that helped really quickly create a fun traversal route was creating a white box play area in engine out of solid geometry and flying around it right away. After we were happy with the route, we exported the geometry to use in Houdini, where we converted it to a volume and combined it with the up area of the parent to export that out as the child cloud. We wanted to make sure that these systems feel very different from each other. 
Some ways in which we did this was by the shape of the jump points. As I had mentioned before, Stanton feels very clean, put together and generally safe with the disc-like form that it has, but Pyro feels like it's more violent, distressed and this shows in its form. The comparison is shown well in both of the child clouds. In the Stanton child cloud, we have nice long strands of the magnetic waves that encapsulate the jump point that feel harmonious, beautiful and free. Whereas in the Pyro cloud, it shows almost the opposite. The walls feel like they're closing in on you, moving in unpredictable ways, completely unstable. Your ship could enter into a wall and disappear within a second. Lighting also plays a big role in how we feel about these spaces. You can see these are dramatically different areas in the mood and tone, and lighting is the key to that. So that's a brief look at jump points. They've evolved quite a bit since last time you saw them. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, Jake. Uh, so one of the things that players will first probably come across when they come into the pyro system is the space station. You know, it was discovered a long time ago. It was sort of deemed uninhabitable because it was just too dangerous with that, that variable flare star going on. Uh, so they kind of utilized the system for resources. And then when they kind of tapped out, they just sort of left. And that's when all the sort of squatters came in. So there's sort of older infrastructure built to sustain kind of the mining activities and the gas harvesting and stuff like that. But, you know, they, they just basically left and then other populations start to slowly move into the system, criminals, squatters, survivors, and whatever, and, and start to kind of take over what was left behind. Which gives us some unique gameplay comparatively um, to Stanton and the, the space stations there. So with Pyro, since they're in such disrepair, some of them are inhabited, some of them are completely abandoned. And then, so the players can go and explore. They can go and see what what's happened there, um, whether it's been hit by an asteroid, um, or if it's uh, there was some sort of conflict there before. But you'll be able to go and explore the different decks um, and be able to uh, go and meet new people, meet the frontier lifestyle, enjoy it. Okay, so before we go to the inside of the stations, we're going to jump now to Eric, and he's going to go in a bit more detail, the concept development process taken when looking at the exteriors. Hi, I'm Eric Gagnon, principal concept artist on Star Citizen. The goal of that initial step of sketch development is to create something not invited. Dangerous, damaged by asteroids, and surrounded by floating debris. Hiding place for Atla looks old, decrepit. Lawless, no security force here. Approach at your own risk. Industrial look, messy, but not abandoned. Some parts are wrecked, but under repair and raw looking. I like to use the black and white sketches to start. It's, it allows us to go very quickly and focus on the shape only. We then try to play with a touch of color to define more of the commercial port platform. We try different schemes to remind us of the whole look with a rusty vibe and brown tones. Adding a touch of light in some context around the sketch allows to see the scale of thing and properly view the silhouette. We expand on the ID to play with the mechanism and functionality. This is the color sketches of the asteroid Hunter Harpoon and the different angles. In this sketch, we can clearly feel the arrival of the asteroids and the dismantling our destruction, destruction zone. We also need some top angles to properly showcase the size and scale of it. With all those elements in place, we can now build a nice plate of the entire concept for the asteroids, harpoon with all the piece together. The Shantytown module habitation is a nice idea to add a kind of small city on the outskirts of the space station. So here I sketched those shapes to create something very modular. From the grayscale, it's pretty easy to do a color pass. I played with a color palette that reflects the vibe of Shantita. In this sketch, here we can easily see how cool the 
area is going to be. Another angle shot here is pretty nice too. Playing with warm and cold color contrast is interesting. All those different angles help define and expose the different elements of the concept to properly illustrate it. Now we have a nice board of this sketch face. We apply the same process here for the commercial port platform. The black and white sketches are a good way to go. In this image, we see the silhouette shape sketches for the front of the port platform structure. A quick side view plan here is necessary to well build this design. We fill the form and the ratio and the size of what we want to achieve. And of course, we create a color sketch to see what it could be. We see the industrial look and some potential details to better define and deep dive into. For those, we have a deeper design exploration of this industrial area. Pipes, tanks, angular shapes, and a color touch. Combining 2D and 3D sketches really help properly communicate the design intent. It's a common technique now, but it's really efficient to highlight areas of the concept. Using 3D is also very useful for level designers to validate the size and shape of things when creating the environment in-game. Let's talk about the big repair machinery ID. This machine could be used to repair surfaces damaged by asteroids, inspired from the heavy machinery that we see in mining. Nice to see the overall add-on IDs broke together on a single board. It gives a great look and makes you want to see the next design step. The mood looks. We also create a mood board from our different shots. This shows how lighting is used to set the tone of the environment by giving different options and color palettes. Finally, we provide some options for paint of the exterior surfaces. We work from a list of brands and faction that we need to incorporate to the design. We started from the narrative things, work to build the visual identity of the different brand, exploring different ways to represent them and the environment, stickers, flat surfaces, graffiti, or official paint job. This really brings the sketches alive and set in the universe of Star Citizen. The Outlaw Station are a sample of the Pyro system, and we hope this first exterior concept phase excites you as much as we had fun to create it. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Looks great. That's the exterior. So right now we're going to go from the outside and we're going to uh, jump to the interior. Before we really started exploring anything, one of the core concepts uh, that was discussing as a group was the idea of power and the idea of heat. Now we've got like this big interior layout of this, maybe this old mining station. How, how would they have adapted the space? You know, they would have, right, okay, we need power here. Okay, that will create heat. So we started thinking about, okay, where would the heat lamps be? And then be, where would light come from? So just the, the principal concept of power, creating heat, creating light, that was pretty much the, the core of the start of the visual development process. So when we started talking about it from a design side, we needed to make sure that we were covering certain shops, uh, just basic needs for the player. Everything's bare bones. Um, it could be that it used to be a clothing store, now it's a food shop. And, and so they've converted it, the gang's moved in. You know, it's, it's very, it's not what it used to be. And, um, but you see that old skeleton there. One of the things that definitely we've been talking about with Pyro that we didn't really get to see in Stanton uh, is the idea of the sort of the gang presence. So. Uh, you know, that, that idea that they're the sort of local law uh, in the area. So, you know, you might see 
gang members coming and shaking down some of these shopkeepers for, for protection money or, or rent, you know, type type thing. Or, uh, or even shaking down the player. Yeah, if, yeah, which would be very fun. <laughs> not, not for me. But. So when we started to explore some of the side areas, there were other things, other factors that we had to cover. Um, habitation, clinics, you, you know, players need a, a place to sleep, to log out, as well as players need a way to get themselves healed. And then we started taking the same treatment or similar treatment that we were doing with the, the main market area and started to take it into the habs and how they were possibly repurposed or the clinics and how those were possibly repurposed. So, and just make sure that everything felt cohesive in its, in its raw, natural form. And the way that we have the station structured, um, we haven't let players go into like living quarters of where um, the people that lived at the station would be, or even into the lower decks where um, where the power, where the gravity generators are. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're gonna start introducing these areas. And it opens up new opportunities for the players to go explore and, and do new things. But it's also areas that the gang might want to protect. Yeah, it offers a lot of possibilities for, for mission content, you know, whether it's actually maybe working for the gang itself or other kind of little small things you could do inside there to really kind of, yeah, drive you deep into the bowels of this thing. Okay, so that's a little look at the insides of the stations, but now we'll jump to Christian, and Christian's gonna take us on a little bit of a deeper dive into the concept development process of the inside of the stations. Hi, my name is Christian Dorat. Uh, I'm a senior concept artist uh, on the environment team. And uh, we're going to look at the concept development for the space station a little bit. So first off, we looked at the heat map. So there is a lot of, um, what I said, the electricity is gone, the, the heating is gone, and the breathable air, the oxygen is gone. So um, there is pretty much all of those connected areas. There are. Um, they are lifeless in, in a way, right? So you wouldn't settle down somewhere in between those uh, um, in between those empty corridors. We were trying to uh, sort our thoughts and get them on paper, right? So we were exploring different ideas that we on the concept team had in mind. Uh, so we were thinking about pathways um, that the player and the NPC could take. So what would happen, we were thinking about what would happen if all of a sudden one pathway is blocked off or um, another one will open up, right? So. We were thinking about verticality and um, how the players and the NPCs can traverse all of those um, interesting areas that are, in the end, pretty uh, ominous, right? So think about there are some people just screwing off side panels on the wall or they are uh, screw, uh, screwing off um, ceiling panels and you would see all of the maintenance areas behind it. So, so we'd see a lot of struts, a lot of working areas, there's cables hanging. So. Um, those were the very first sketches where we could uh, see what those eventually could evolve into. And um, we also started then slowly with some uh, loose uh, uh, 3D sketches. So getting everything into 3D and it's pretty much evolved over time where we could talk to the environment guys and we were asking for some of the current rest stops, uh, uh, geo and some of the textures and uh, then getting them uh, um, into 3D. And we were just changing up all of the props, all of the side panels or all of the, the whole uh, um, the environment. So we could, looking back at the references, then convey this feeling. We could introduce more dirt. We could introduce uh, some damaged panels, side panels, and pretty much explore this uh, side area, right? And the, the big advantage of this is that we can yeah, make the, the environment how we like. So one thing that we did is like kill all the lights uh, because we don't need lighting. We want to we wanna create our own lighting. And this is what, what I said earlier. Um, the current rest stops are super bright. They are, uh, they are family friendly, but now we want to make it ominous. We want to make it dark mood. We want to make it super dark with the players like always feeling kind of in danger and especially with the gang members in mind, right? So. This would allow us to create one of uh, uh, one of the very early or uh, one of the, the um, earlier um, 3D explorations, which then lead to one of the final uh, concept arts or the um, the final implementation of this. So when we were at a point where we were kind of um, okay or where we thought like okay, this is this is an environment uh, that we want to see, then we took care about the last 20%. So the last 20% in this case means having a final render 
and uh, painting over. So we were just um, painting over in Photoshop and doing some, uh, um, some more refined, uh, refinements for the mood and the lighting. We were painting in some, uh, some of the decaling and some of the graffitis because it is ultimately easier to do all these things in uh, 2D than in 3D and caring about the, the materials. So we were able to um, yeah, just refine the, the final concept in, in, uh, in this regard. And this, this wasn't a, a straight, straight process from A to B. It was um, an iterating process. So in between, if you're looking at some of the other concepts, um, for example, the barriers, we were at one point thinking about what would happen if we introduce barriers that the gang members then would set up on one point. So what does that mean for you as a player? Um, what is the player doing, or what is the player doing at this point? So, will he encounter these uh, um, these gang members? Will he try to find a way around? Is he going to use some of the ladders or the um, the underground vents, for example? So, we were changing the concepts here and there, um, more or less. And this leads to, in the end, having a nice vari variety of concepts or uh, different types of concepts that we then could cherry pick the best parts of it, or the in other teams, the environment team, the design team could cherry pick the best ideas from, from those concepts. And this was pretty much a rundown of uh, um, the concept development for the Pyro Space Station's interior. Thanks, Christiana. That looked appropriately scummy. So we've been talking a lot about the insides of the stations. We've been looking at a lot of the concept art. Uh, but now we can jump to Josh, and Josh is going to talk about uh, one of my favorite parts of the process, and it's when we take some concepts and we, we start to do some ideation, some uh, visual development in the engine. Hi, my name is Josh Van Zulen. I'm the principal environment artist here at Cloud Imperium Games. Today we're going to be going through the Pyro Space Station's um, visual target and pre-production sort of things that we're going to be doing for these rundown slash outlaw space stations. So what I have here right in front of me now is obviously the, the food court from our Stanton space stations. We've just dragged the wear up on all of them. So now we're getting all of this really nice grime on all of these surfaces, right? So if I turn off my working lights, which hopefully are gonna, you know, produce that mood that we're after. So I'll turn on that right now. So a number of things have happened right in front of us, right? You can instantly see where we've got lots of heavy fog coming in. Don't pay too much attention to the particles now. I'll go into them a little bit later. We've got some light panels up here, shooting through the rafters, and we've got another one over here as well. Right, so we're gonna do an, a, a quick little thing here. It's adding in some cables, right? And now this is really important, not only to achieve the art direction, but it gives us a really nice level of parallax within the scene, right? We have a couple of design constraints within this space as well. One of those being we have a, a gang and then a general civilian population, right? Now, one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of that design in this particular space was separate it out in like a kind of class type system, right? So we're gonna to start to explore some of the requirements of that. One of that being that like I mentioned before, you can't get up here unless you're in favor with the gang. So we need to put in the instruments that are going to help portray that. And that is a checkpoint, right? So, and just a side note, all of this stuff is super work in progress and nothing is final. So don't read too much into it. So from here, we're missing a few bits and pieces, right? But one of the ways that we're gonna solve that is with graffiti. All right, so I'm gonna turn on those decals now. And you can start to see that the walls here are starting to disappear a little bit. It's a very subtle effect in this particular area, but you'll start to see how much more it comes through in others, right? So moving on from here, we need to start putting the stuff in the environment. So bear with me for a sec when I turn this on. All right, so we've got here is a lot of stalls, right? We really want to get that cramp vibe in like that was kind of similar in the concept and um, start seeing how far we can push the limitations of what we can do in the engine, but also what we can do with our, our technical systems as well, right? One of the things that was immediately apparent to us is that AI is really tricky to deal with when in tight and enclosed spaces, right? So we need to look at areas like this here and this here to make sure that it's wide enough that a few AI can pass each other or a player and not, you know, look completely gross, right? Now, I mentioned lighting before. So I'm gonna turn off the uh, working lights that we've got so far and you'll start to see what I mean. So we've got 
a whole bunch of stalls here at the moment. The entire scene is being lit by the stalls itself. Now, this has already come a long way and the stalls themselves have had a bit of a lighting pass, so uh, there's, this is already starting to look quite nice, but we're not getting, you know, that that, that thickness that we were getting up, up on the top level, right? We're not getting that little bit of life to a certain extent. And we're also getting these areas here where, where they just fall completely into darkness, which is, which is not fun. So obviously, like I said before, we'd be doing lighting as we go through this process, but just to see how much of an impact that pass can do on an environment like this, we'll just turn it on for you. So you start to instantly see, we've now got a lot more thickness within the environment. And if I just double check, just to make sure that our lights are generating correctly, cool. So we're getting a lot more voluminous lighting now. We're getting all of these heaters coming in now, the heat shimmering off them. We've got these little portable ones lighting up the place. We've got some ones that are hanging from the roof, ones that are over in the corners and stuff like this, right? So we're starting to get a lot more mood in this. This is starting to feel really nice now. Now, what I was mentioning in terms of the rain, right? So, yes, we're talking about the rain now. Why is there rain inside, right? So this is generally a really cold station. And when people are, are in this area that's in the center, because there's so much stuff happening here, it's starting to get warmer, right? You've got the heaters here. You've got the gang that is kind of maintaining a lot of this stuff and, and producing a lot of the heat themselves. Uh, everyone, this is prime real estate for where everyone wants to be, right? So what happens when you have this many people cooking food in this one small area, you know, breathing hot air, that sort of thing, it all starts to rise in this, this environment and it starts to get that, that massive cavern, right, that we've got up here, all the way up to the roof there. As it goes up, it starts to cool down, right? And we start to get precipitation inside where it starts to rain. And even in, in many instances, we start to get a little bit of ice coming through as well. So that means once it's all fallen down here, it's actually quite wet and damp. Uh, for, it's still cold and a little bit warm around heaters, but it's generally quite damp because of that weird kind of event. Now, the rain as it currently sits is just a placeholder asset that we're borrowing from Squadron, and that will have to obviously be remade to suit the amount of rain that we want to have within this environment, which won't be, you know, crazy. <laughs> but um, it serves as a proof of, proof of concept for what we're trying to achieve, right? So, that is pretty much Pyro Stations. Um, I hope you really enjoyed, like, seeing the breakdown that we've done here today, um, seeing, uh, learning a little bit about the process of going in and doing a visual target, and, um, you know, just a little bit more of that earlier process and problem solving that we go through. So yeah, I hope you really enjoyed the rest of CitizenCon here today, and uh, I'll catch you later. Cool, thanks Josh, that was looking really good. All right, so as we continue our process of exploring uh, the pyro system, uh, now I think it'd be good to look a little bit at the planets and moons that uh, populate the system. Now, uh, one of the things we thought it'd be interesting to talk about is how do we design a system from the ground up? As with all of this, we always uh, start from narrative, you know, before we put any pen to paper or we have any discussions about player experience. Um, we always start from, you know, the world that, you know, Dave and, and others have, have kind of built. Yeah, I mean, you know, and again, it's also the thing of, you know, the pyro, I think, was first initially conceived very early on in the process. But once we finally are tackling it from a, a realistic, practical, how we're going to build this, what is what is each planet going to look like, uh, you know, it's important, you know, to, to ask more questions about, to flesh it out more. Because we kept it intentionally kind of vague, because we want the art team to, you guys to do what you do and the designers to do what they do. So when we started that exploration process, we knew we had like a, a ballpark that we needed to stay in. Uh, so we, we literally thought, okay, how do we, how do we design a system? And fundamentally, it, it kind of comes into maybe three key areas. So um, because we're a space game, the establishing shot of that planet is very, very important because it, it, uh, it describes everything from, you know, continent breakup, fundamental palette. So right from the get-go, we, we started to sketch in ideas of what the key establishing shots were going to be like. Uh, and then from there, then we jump into um, key art. So key art is basically on the surface, 
what is what is the mood, what's the tone that we're expecting to see. And as you're saying, like t t the first one we wanted to tackle was Parawan because, you know, David described this this wonderful um, picture, and it was already clear in our minds of, about what it wanted to look like. So we hit that first, and you know, we wanted something hostile, we wanted something hazardous. Uh, also, as part of this process is. Um, we knew our current um, tech limitations, but we also knew what we wanted to do in terms of our future tech, you know, um, future planet tech, weather, you know, so we kind of went crazy um, with ideas as, as we was exploring. So we went through the various planets, did some key art, and again, put them up on the board. And just to validate, we are keeping within that, that palette but we're getting that diversity. We're getting that diversity of, of color, hue, um, value structure, silhouettes, composition, um, because even within something like Stanton, there's variety, you know. Uh, that was very important for me and the team where you, you want to feel like you're on a space opera. You can travel around, but now we're going to a completely other system. So we continued that ideation process there. So we had the establishing shots, we had some key art, and then um, from there is we create like uh, what we call like breakout packs. Uh, this is where when we're talking through with design about, you know, what are the what are the interactables that the player maybe will come across? What are the mineables? What are the harvestables? And then from there we start to build out um, literal breakouts for or almost asset packs uh, that will go to the team. Now from there, like we did a, a first pass um, exploration. Um, and what we did is we put it all together on a single board for Chris to have almost like a commander's view of a new system. Um, you know, we showed it to yourself, Dave, we showed it to Chris, we showed it to Todd, and, and right, you know, on, on one sheet, you've got the establishing shots, you've got the key art, you've got the breakout. And, and for me personally, that's how I like to work. I like to see that, like I said, a commander's view of an entire system. And then from there, you can kind of tweak adjust and you know mold things into uh, what 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 play experience we want to put forward so that was a snapshot of the visual exploration process we use when designing a system from the ground up now we can take a break from us talking and go to an art video a sizzle video uh, created by the art team and what this will show is uh, it will show a kaleidoscope of planets and moons from Pyro, and it will also showcase some of the, the latest and greatest uh, art techniques and processes and tools that the art team have.
Awesome. I'm fully in love with Pyro and hopefully from seeing that video, hopefully you guys are too. So as a continuation now, we can jump to Sebastian and Sebastian will talk to you a little bit more about the cloud authoring process and some of our latest cloud tech. Then we can jump to Maximilian. Maximilian will talk a little bit about geology creation, how we create that type of biome. And then lastly, we can go to Uslam and Uslam will go into a lot more detail about how we take some of the concept art that we've been showing of the uh, botanicals and how we interpret that to in-game artwork. Hi, my name is Sebastian and I'm a principal environment artist on the Planet Content team. I'll be talking a bit about the data that's defining the visuals of the volumetric clouds and how we create it. Crusader was our first astronomical object that made use of the volumetric cloud deck that's being built by Carsten Wenzel and others. While working on Crusader, we learned a lot on what kind of data gives us which results and what is better to be avoided. With the tech being new, we also needed all new workflows for it. We are currently building more tools for producing the data, so we expect to get better, more complex results in less time in the future. We are evaluating everything from a very manual process that involves painting every pixel to a fully procedural one with little to no artist input and we will probably end up somewhere between the two. This essentially means that what you are about to see is very likely subject to change. Due to the way the shader works, we can either throw random data at it and hope for happy accidents, or we can be very specific with the data and what kind of cloud formations come out of it in certain areas of the planet. For most use cases, there are two types of textures that need to be created. The first of which is the global property map, which determines what what type of cloud is being used at any point on the planet's surface. It is also used for controlling the color placement of non-water-based clouds, but I'll get to that later. The other map is for defining the types of clouds and is named accordingly. The cloud type map allows us to control the cloud density and the impact of the two separately tiling 3D noises, which add detail and definition to what would otherwise be fairly low resolution shapes. The way the two textures interact is maybe best compared to forming a vase out of clay on a pottery wheel and that's kind of what we're going to do now. In this video, we are revolving half the silhouette of a vase around a circular pattern, which gives us a vase-like shape and 3D space. The big difference to a pottery wheel, though, is that we can not only feed it data in the shape of a circle, but ultimately whatever shape we want. With the density channel, we can control how thick the clouds appear. White pixels represent very dense clouds, black pixels produce no clouds at all, and then we also have everything in between. There's always a tiny bit of impact from the tiling noises, which you can see to have an effect on the lower density regions. The shaping noise and its control texture are the most impactful in terms of turning a nicely shaded volume into something we can clearly identify as clouds. How much it gets to affect the shape of the clouds depends on the brightness in the corresponding channel of the cloud tab map. By combining density and shaping noise, we can model everything from dense clouds to soft, more ethereal shapes and everything in between. The last of the cloud tap map channels controls the erosion noise. It is lower resolution than the shaping noise, since its main purpose is to add an extra layer of small detail. We usually just add it everywhere, unless we specifically want soft clouds with less definition. Black values add details in the way the tiling noise is authored, while white values invert the noise and medium gray values mean that the noise has no impact. Maybe you can already get a feeling for how clock for the complexity of the system and how every pixel in every channel can have a dramatic effect on the end result. Another thing we can change are the tiling 3D noises themselves. By default, a cauliflower-like noise is used for the shaping to model those fluffy sheep-like cumulus clouds. But by changing it to a different 3D noise, we can produce some more abstract cloud shapes that wouldn't normally occur on Earth. This is an area, in combination with different global data, we keep investigating to produce more alien cloud formations in the future. We've been advancing this approach with Pyro 5, another gas giant, which brings me to the other use of the global property map. It has a second channel, which, in combination with a color gradient, is used to control the global color of the clouds for not so physically correct coloring of the gas giants. We sometimes have to restrain ourselves to not make brightly colored balls of cotton candy. There are a lot more settings that allow us to tweak everything from how the clouds are shaded and shadowed over the global impact and frequency of the detail noises to parameters that drastically change what results the textures I've shown you today produce. 
You'll have to bear with us as we'll figure out if there is a best combination of settings and how those might change once all the features that are still planned eventually get added. By now you've probably seen a fair amount of volumetric clouds as part of this year's CitizenCon and are quite likely to see a bunch more. Because of that, and since I'm still an artist at heart, I leave you with this bad drawing of a cat instead of more epic cloudscapes. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Max and I'm a senior environment artist at CIG. I am part of the Planet team where my focus is on planet and asset creation. I want to give you some insight into how we transform simple terrain shapes to a final biome, plus a little preview of what you can expect in the future. When creating a new biome, we start by assigning ground textures to the terrain geometry. For this research and development desert biome, we chose a selection of different types of sand and soil. For additional depth and detail, we have the option to use displacement mapping. The next step is adding our first layer of ground cover assets. In our game, ground cover is any low cost asset up to knee height, which does not require collision and allows us to use a lot of these assets to create a nice level of density. Here we use a mix of gravel, patches of moss and dry grass. After that, we add slightly bigger assets in the form of clusters of desert bushes to give context to the smaller assets and add variety. We finish the object scattering pass by adding individual larger rocks and arrangements of small rocks, which give the player a better understanding of how far away something is when walking, driving or flying over a planet. For performance reasons, we use a range of settings like randomized rotation and scale values to get as much variety as possible out of the number of assets we created to mimic a level of complexity that feels organic and comparable to what you find on Earth. Something that we have been missing on our current planets and moons are massive rock formations due to tech limitations. Some of these limitations have since been solved. For example, we are now able to render assets much further. Because of that, we recently kicked off a research and development phase during the production of the Pyro system to find workflows for the creation and distribution of cliffs. Full disclosure though, this is early in development and heavily work in progress, but we still wanted to give you a little glimpse of what to expect in the future. The challenge for us will be to figure out how we can make these assets look as good as possible from all angles. If a player walks up to them on foot, they must look just as good as when a player decides to land his ship on the highest point of a cliff. But we are excited to add an even more epic level of scale to our game. That's it for me. Thank you for watching and enjoy the rest of CitizenCon. Hello, my name is Özlem and I'm part of the Organics team. Today I want to talk a bit about how we build the different biomes on Pyro 3. Pyro 3 is a planet with very distinct biomes. For example, we got the yellow moss biome that is a strong contrast to the dark volcanic regions. We have some icy areas, boulder fields, acidic fields, different coastlines and a lot more. When working on a biome, the first thing we do is to have a look at the concept art. We do an asset breakdown for all the elements we need to recreate the scene. By doing so, we get more information about what kinds of rocks and vegetation assets we need, um, the proportions of the assets in relation to the character, the distribution and frequency of those assets on the planet, um, but also the amount of coverage per biome on the planet. Um, we can also get information about the color palette, the terrain colors, and what to scatter on the coastlines. The last thing we can see from the concepts is um, the acid and ground materials. We also try to reduce the amount of the acid packs because of performance and time constraints. Instead of doing 50 unique rocks, we can achieve the same result by using just three with our procedural scattering system, since the assets will be scaled and rotated randomly. After figuring out all the necessary elements, we start with the whiteboxing phase. This means doing a very quick mock-up of the scene by using very simple assets. The white boxes should just represent the shape and color of the final object. We do that to see if the asset breakdown we did beforehand is working in the 3D space as well. At this stage of the process, we can still change the whole look of the scene if we don't like the outcome yet. We can say, let's make the rocks five times bigger, or blue instead of red, and so on. Or we realize we need to do some research on a specific asset to solve it visually, which was the case for the moss, for example. When doing R&D on the moss, we were trying different shapes and sizes, and we also had to figure out how to do the moss trends that are covering the whole mesh. 
To make the workflow for the moss strands a bit easier, we used Houdini to procedurally scatter them. Otherwise, it would have been too time consuming to place every single moss strand by hand, since there are several thousands of them. After figuring out how to do the moss strand, we still didn't like the overall shape of the moss, as it was a bit too blobby and yellow. We wanted something that looked a bit more natural and integrates better into the terrain, so we created some rocks with a moss blend on top instead. We broke up the moss shape even further because it looked a little bit too molten, and we added different kinds of moss strands to get a little bit more variety. In the end, all these things got us to a result that we were satisfied with. The usual approach to setting up a biome is to start with the largest elements first and work your way to the smallest one. If we take the moss preset as an example, we would start by adding the largest elements first, then adding some smaller moss patches around it to create a nice fall off. We continued with adding some flatter grass to make it sit nicer on the terrain. But then we realized we needed something bigger to bring the elements closer together. So we decided to add some high grass as well. The final steps are adding some ground cover like small rocks or tiny moss. As you can see, while building a biome, we need to do several iterations to get the best visuals. Thank you for watching. Thanks to Seb, Maxi, and Oslem for showing us their work. So when we started looking at um, outposts and started really from a, a ground up on how to make make it so that there's more diverse gameplay in there. Um, the player can approach it in multiple different routes. Um, there can be combat encounters. Uh, there can be social encounters. Um, so we needed to kind of rebuild and rethink the way that we were doing this. We started honing in on what, what was working, what wasn't working, and then mm. did a lot of adjustments. Yeah. We've had outposts in our game for some time. You know, when we started to hear from um, an art side for what the design requirements were going to be, fundamentally thinking about these as, as modules, thinking about them as thematic modules and, you know, very specific, then, you know, already like the mind was going of like, okay, we're going to need a kind of like a paradigm shift in terms of how we visually present these. You know, what could these settlements kind of feel like and, you know, as with everything with outposts, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a gameplay uh, or it's a location archetype. It's, it's the smallest, probably one of the smallest location archetypes that we have. And then in time that will lead to like, you know, villages and towns. And yeah. Thinking about how we wanted to push this forward. I, I mean, Chris has always talked about putting outposts into players' hands. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to think about how would this expand? How would the players be able to make these homes feel, you know, homes or outposts or even businesses feel unique for the way that they want to play? And and then there were even tools that we had to create in order to actually be able to embed these into the ground and, and make sure that it, it worked um, much better than what we did in Stanton because with those we had to have them kind of on stilts and, and uh, you know, just the points of contact were very limited on, for the ground. Right. If I connect these modules together, how do we get something that doesn't feel like... Well, it, and I, I know that design, we came up, in particular Andreas and Dan came up with a long list of things, you know, okay, well, here's what we'll need in HAPS, here's what we'll need, mm -hmm. you know, for utilitarian, here's what we'll need for defenses, here's what we'll need for mm -hmm. um, power and some oxygen, life support, so on and so forth. So there was a, a very long list and then it's, it's how can we take those and make them feel unified mm -hmm. and visually unified together. Yeah. Um, Fundamentally, the thing that probably got us the most excited is finally we've started to think about these as um, like unified settlements, you know, base building. So as you can see on some of the concepts, we, we deliberately presented early exploration shots in this kind of like semi-isometric view to see, you know, how does it feel if I'm laying out my base? How would these modules kind of, you know, tie, you know, tie together and, um, you know, it, it kind of got the team excited and finally we were thinking, all right, these settlements are gonna be more than just 
you know, like a single outpost, but, yeah. but more like a collection of modules. Uh, so just to continue on with the uh, module building and the module creation, we can jump to Christian. And Christian can talk in a bit more detail about the visual development process we did for creating the exteriors of these new outposts. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the colonialism and uh, now I'm going to show you a little bit more about the modules. So the very first thing that we did was creating all the primitives and all the primitive shapes into 3D. So as you can see here, we have a lot of variety, right? There's the, the cubic coming in, there's the cylinder coming in, the spheres coming in. For example, if I take this building over here and I uh, duplicate it and move it around, I could just simply grab some of the other ones and combine them together. And you will see later on that this is one of our um, archetypes or one that we, that we pretty much liked, right? So you can see here already, there's a lot of variety of entrances, uh, maybe some garages, maybe some smaller entrances for, um, for those uh, NPCs or for, for the players, right? And if I zoom in, all of a sudden, um, you, you can already see like how they react to the, uh, to the environment or the, the overall scale, right? So if I pan over here and you see these buildings on the, um, on the back, in, in the background, um, so you're always having a, a first person um, standpoint or a first person view. So we were not only creating those entrances, but also smaller details and very briefly looking into the modules. So what you can see here is the, the very first uh, concepts for the uh, solar panels, for example, or the top mounted, the roof mounted solar panels. In the background, you see some, some other nice details that we can then just pick and put on our buildings, right? And some of the very last that we did is then pretty much those. So those were one of the archetypes. And you see, there are small buildings for, um, for housing or housing buildings. Um, there are some building types that are more communal. We have some uh, secondary and tertiary buildings like those uh, radio towers. If you imagine you're, in, uh, um, you're a um, colonist on a planet, right? And there, are, there are multiple uh, settlements on a planet. How would they communicate uh, with, uh, with each other? So we have a kind of a radio tower or some of those um, cooling, cooling devices. So if you imagine maybe there's something underground, there's an um, even bigger uh, facility underground because you're on a very hostile uh, planet environment. So you want to store your very sensitive data underground. And uh, um, we were looking at those hints of life. Uh, maybe you are a kind of a farmer. So okay. you see already, this is the, the first archetype. This is more uh, cylindrical. And um, there are some storage spaces coming in here and there. So where would you uh, store your oxygen or your water, gases, for example. All of this is just a, um, a consideration from, from our side. Uh, going over to the next one, uh, this is more pyramidical. So we were looking at also again, the, the, uh, the same materials or changing up the materials. So now it's, it is again more concrete and the, the, the color palette is changing. There are some of the storage coming in and going then over to the next one, it is Again, looking at different materials, there's some storage buildings that are not in one big storage facility, but it's um, divided into small, uh, smaller parts. So you have to, to walk around your sediment and see like, okay, I can put some stuff in here, um, but if I need something else, then I uh, need to, uh, to walk over there. And there is some playing around with some uh, more entrances and windows. How do they react to the environment, right? So this was just one of the very many files that we we created. So those are mostly buildings, but uh, um, we have different, different files for, for assets and props and uh, how they would, would fit inside this, this, this main architectural style that we wanted to, to see more involved, right? So just a, a very early version of the refinery, for example. But all of this in the end was given us the opportunity to just cherry pick the best ideas that we felt appropriate for this specific, uh, um, this specific colonialism style, right? And um, where other people were able then to just grab the best parts and then use it in the actual game engine. Yeah, and this was pretty much the, um, the concept development for the colonialism modules. Uh, I hope you have a great time and uh, wish you all the best for the, for the next panels that are coming up. Awesome, thanks Cristiano. Uh, so that pretty much covers uh, the work we've been doing on the exteriors. So now let's jump to the interiors. So 
um, we pretty much had to follow that same ideation process that we did for the exterior, but now for the interior. Now, um, slightly more simple, we, we knew there was a few key areas that we needed to design. First, it was the social space. You know, this is basically these kind of communal hubs. We knew we wanted like that open kitchen, seating areas, windows, an area where people could kind of hang out and, you know, relax. And then second to that was habitation. You know, we knew these are gonna need to be abodes. We knew we needed bathrooms, uh, hab units, but again, nothing in here would be, you know, pre-manufactured. So we wanted actual beds, not, not uh, racks of beds. So um, everything about uh, this process was to, about, you know, creating a design, which you would look at and relate to and think, oh, I, I, could, I could see myself living there. I could see someone living there for a, a quite a long period of time. So in habitation, you know, it's soft, soft surfaces, soft shapes, um, but again, something which felt fairly integrated into the core architecture. In contrast to that, we knew we needed uh, technical spaces. You know, these could be used in the future to be, I don't know, uh, soil processing rooms or anything really within a technical bracket. So um, this one was quite a tricky one because again, we needed to describe a feeling of age and a, you know, a type of historical depth in this. So we tried a few, um, you know, visual cues, like, you know, there's the, the physical tape deck, you know, the, the clicky buttons, you know, again, to give you that feeling of like, all right, this isn't necessarily like a modern technology level, you know? Uh, and then the last major visual archetype was engineering. So these are the type of spaces that could be a power room or an engine room or some areas if, if, you, if your armor got beat up, you could, you know, repair your armor in there. Basically, it's a, it's a language which will enable us to create a variety of like engineering type spaces. And then once we'd, um, once we'd established a, a spread of um, visual archetypes, um, we knew that they were all working well together. We could take that as a format and then start to think about more about actual themes that we wanted in these outposts. Yeah, kind of looking at the who would be the people that would be inhabiting it, what are the circumstances that would drive them to be there. And uh, so we, we sort of came up with like, I call it the, the uh, triangle of, of kind of the, the edge points of the sort of the independent, the outlaw and uh, the corporate. Uh, and you know where these the inhabitants would fall somewhere in that spectrum of uh, of, of three points, and it's also important to note too, uh, you know, that this stuff would be applicable for the stuff we've done in Stanton. Like if we wanted to add these back backwards in Stanton as well, that it wasn't just exclusively pyro based. Basically, when we was doing the design process, we pretty much focused on independent. Um, mainly because that was our that was our baseline. It was very easy to kind of design these and visually design these spaces to, is it like a, an independent farmer or is it a, an independent miner? And then with that, we wanted to really create a, um, an experience where you walked into one of these outposts and it feels old, it, do, it feels relatable, but it doesn't feel recognizable, kind of similar to if you went to a, like a historic ruin or a historic pot that you'd never really been to before. Or, yeah, somebody's old farm. Exactly. So we did a lot of uh, exploration process of like, what type of artifacts would you find there? You know, what are, how did people used to decorate the house in this time period? You know, you'd still see uh, patterns, surfaces, shapes uh, in these independent, um, Outposts. Yeah, even even early versions of modern technology. So you could see that, you right. know, oh, this is like the mobile glass I have, but it's an older mobile glass, or right. just as an example. But but also when when we were, even just to back up a little bit, when we're talking about the planets, we have a, a certain style, or we have certain amounts of points of interest that we want to go to, how we pull the player around the universe. And so Dave and I and, and Will and, and others sit down and talk and say, all right, what do we need here? And all right, well, we need mining facilities. And then that helps to inform Ian and the, and the other design teams and our teams of, all right, is that an independent theme? Is it a corporate theme? Is it an outlaw theme? So. These are all kind of layers, but the first and foremost, it's 
oh, this is farming, or this is mining, or this is, you know, cargo. Because looking at something like Pyro 2, which, you know, again, starting from that sort of original Precy sentence of the planet was the idea, it was like that was a heavily mined, mined out planet that, that had been kind of stripped of a lot of resources. So there would be remaining infrastructure that would have been corporate mm -hmm. back in the day, but is now independent or now even an outlaw setting. So, and then there would be the ones that would just be a straight independent one and stuff like that. But yeah, exactly like you said, you know, we'd start, start with that sort of the base and then apply the theming to it to kind of... Mm. When we're thinking about the theming, um, we, we, we kind of wanted um, like a space catalog, like a furniture catalog. So uh, I know this is quite big for Chris, is we kind of went down that um, process of, okay, let's design this one independent outpost in a few different ways. Like how could people have decorated it in many different ways? And it's quite a fun process because you basically create space furniture catalogs which um which again are going to be ways for uh it's ways for the the developers to be able to dress and world build but you know eventually maybe it's a way for people to decorate their own spaces you know uh, when we think about uh, the outlaw uh, versions of these outposts again it, we, the process is very similar you think about the visual rule sets which would turn this into an outlaw um, outpost, uh, namely, you know, would it, has it been taken over by hostile intent? You know, is the signs of combat, is the signs of destruction still still so present? Um, the actual physical act of occupying one of these outposts, have they yeah. defended it, have they boarded it up? Yeah, it could be any number of situations. Yeah, it's, it could be outlaws are squatting here and they're operating it as a base, which makes it a potential combat space, or is it, you know, was it a potentially an independent uh, refinery that outlaws attacked and killed everybody there and now it's... is it a drug facility so yeah, on and so forth exactly uh, and then lastly on with the corporate you know um, you know it's something that we really want to advance out into in the future but that feeling that this location is owned by a corporate umbrella you know that would tie into the branding you know, maybe it ties into the, the, the costumes that you'd expect the NPCs to be in there. You know, so there's a huge amount of visual world building that we can do to, you know, present these outposts in a few different ways. And even potentially reputation as well. Like yeah. we talked before about that idea that, that, you know, if you do missions for a corporate outpost that it, you know, reflects in your general uh, relationship with that corporation. Mm. I mean, that ties into the, the clan tags. like. Maybe you've just come from um, one of the space stations that, you know, was occupied by a certain gang type, and then they sent you to um, a settlement on one of the surfaces of Pyro, and clearly it's been, um, you know, tagged with, by a different gang. So you basically want that read and that consistency uh, throughout. Now, one of the one of the uh, outpost themes that. I was quite excited about uh, getting into was the idea of a, a trading outpost. You know, we've been talking about, you know, buying and selling uh, for a while, but thinking about it in a, in a frontier context, you'd, you know, it's almost like the money's kind of worthless, you know, but it's more about the ability to barter or, or you know, trade. So um, fundamentally, I thought it'd be cool that if we, kind of design a module which focuses around one of these trading posts. So within a, a planet, you know, it's where, you know, people would kind of, you know, uh, trek to and, you know, barter or trade components and then go back. You know, we was talking about the idea of if I had a farm in the middle of nowhere, like, would I want load of credits or would I want that one component that, you know, kept my farm going, you know, so. Um, so we did, you know, we, we took that idea and, and we rammed with it and we, we, we did some visual exploration into what would a, a trading post be like on one of these frontier outposts. So, uh, as you can see on the images, we wanted that feeling of um, the majority of the stuff around this outpost is pretty much junk. You know, uh, spaces isn't at a premium, so they just keep it outside. You know, maybe it's rusting, maybe it's rotting, maybe it's, you know, getting overgrown. But I love that idea is as you're approaching one of these settlements, it's very easy to understand, all right, this is a trading post because, you know, there's just all of their stuff like um, hodgepodge around the outside. 
Well, and it opens up another aspect to it, which is the characters who inhabit it, because the, the sort of general shop experience that you have with the storekeeper is very conventional. It's just a, you know, the, what we've done so far has been a lot of franchise stores, actual companies that own, you know, that are selling wares, uh, you know, who have customer service and, and stuff like that. And the idea being that out here, the experience is going to be much more different. It's not going to be that polished. Exactly. It's going to be much more of a personal interaction with somebody. Uh, so it's been really fun talking with, you know, the AI and behavior guys to try and work out exactly like how is that dynamic supposed to work and, and you know, uh, and feel like for the player. All right, cool. So that was a little bit about the interiors of these outposts. So let's throw it over to Eric now, and he can go into a lot more detail into the visual design process we did for the interiors. Hello, I am Eric Gagnon, principal concept artist on Star Citizen. Today I will present the interior colonialism outpost concept and explain a bit how the pre-production process works. The goal is to create an interior design for the Homestead Colonialism Outpost. It was the first time we had to create a timeless design look. We have the objective to create something warm and with a cozy feeling interior. At the beginning, we started from this concept art made by Christian Dorvitz. We have a lot of information in there to inspire the interior design. In those interiors, we have a specific zones. Social area. Place to eat together, play game, leisure, the bedroom, place to relax, have a proper personal space, and of course, sleeping. The engineering room, the place for the building machine who maintains the possibility to survive there. The technical room, the appropriate space to analyze minerals, some elements of the planet entrance, used for storage material and stuff to go outside. At the beginning, we had an overview of the plant that's helped to organize the zone. To create all of those areas, we need to do a lot of exploration in design. Social area. For those sketches, we want a centerpiece on the ceiling. Could be a light, fan, or whatever that could be cool. We feel the curvy shape of that space. Here on this sketch, I play with a very contrast values in the greenish color palette. That one is the best. Long vertical windows from the side let the light inside a lot. After validation of the most relevant sketch, we do a 3D blackout. As you see, this 3D blackout follows very closely to the last sketches. From the screenshot of the 3D blackout, I did a sketch over in a great on value. That helps to better organize the coloring phase to make sure all the elements fit and will live together. After this, I like to do a 2D elevation concept. It's a good way to make sure all elements fit together and the ratio proportions between each of them. The final key shot of the social area brings it alive. Nice lighting comes from the windows. Cozy mood gives a soul to this social area. Now my concept art co-workers extract the elements from this key shot and break down the props to define more accurately. First, the homestead radial contour done by Danny Chan from the UK. That concept is the perfect blueprint to start the production. The color lighting people food is there on this one. More close-up version on specific zones of the radial kitchen contour. Some explanation are had to properly cover, convey the intent of each part. All the details are there to define a fully functional stone. For the bedroom area, the process is the same as the social area. The sketch phase is essential. As you see here is an example of grayscale sketch. From one of those shots, we get a validation from art directors and CR. And boom, this is the final one. To detail the engineering room, we again go back to the painting technique. This process, again, is key to send us in the right direction. The detail of the machinery, cabling, metal, grates really help convey the ambience of the room and also informs what players will have to do when they go to this place. For the technical room, we wanted to make sure the technology came true. Again, the same process where we start from manual painting to set the tone 
and then deep dive into color, elevation, and then the final key piece. To make the homestead a living space, the bathroom props are important to define the functionality of futuristic hygiene. Finally, let's exit by the entrance. This is the first sketch exploration I did for Star Citizen. The goal of the homestead entrance is to show what the player has access to and set the overall ambience of the place. A huge thanks to all for helping to make the final result in the game match the amazing work that is produced during pre-production. I sincerely hope you will enjoy living in those homestead in Star Citizen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Eric. Awesome stuff. Now that we've uh, shown a lot of art and talked a lot of theory, uh, we want to get into game and, and show off what we've been working on. We're going to be showing you uh, kind of uh, multiple playthroughs and how it changes um, based off of what you do and, and how you have faction with the certain game. So here we are waking up in 400 I uh, that will be released in 315. This is the competitor to the Constellation. Doesn't compromise cargo for vehicle storage. It's faster, more agile than the Connie, and it can run with a smaller crew. So this is the captain's quarters, and then we'll go out and see a little bit more of the habitation deck, and then make our way to the cockpit. So this would be the social area that you can meet and eat and, and basically plan your next mission. And then from here, we'll go to the cockpit. So here we're over Pyro 3. Um, we've come here for a mission to acquire an artifact. Um, and uh, you'll be making your way down to a trading post. So wanted to uh, just give you a quick overview and then we can start talking about the planet. Yeah, Pyro 3 is, um, yeah, just a, a terrestrial planet. It has a very thin, uh, breathable atmosphere, uh, but it's still pretty inhospitable, very cold. Uh, as you can see, some of those lightning strikes in the clouds, but uh, but yeah, very, very pretty looking. So this is uh, the first time we're actually seeing clouds above uh, a terrestrial planet. You know, we went through quite a few iterations of uh, forms. Uh, what we ultimately ended upon was something that felt quite... Uh, uh, quite dramatic, uh, still believable in terms of uh, how the wind would have shaped them. Um, but yeah, like uh, it's showcasing a lot of the, the, the more recent um, tech uh, that came online. Uh, also, what we're seeing here is like some kind of distant thunder strikes. And what this is, it's uh, kind of like a prelude to, you know, future uh, weather features that we come on board, you know, and how this will tie into, you know, uh, storms and uh, ship handling, you know, due to the turbulence. And it's great seeing the, um, you know, the rain hit the canopy glass here, you know, when you go through these cloud banks. Also, as part of the, the process of shaping, one of the things we really wanted to do is create these uh, these kind of like these pockets in between the clouds. So you're in these cavities. So as you're flying through, you get a glimpse of the, the terrain beneath you. Uh, but, you know, it, it feels really quite exhilarating, you know, to fly through. Also as well, like um, it's showcasing a lot of the more recent uh, tech coming on board as well. So, you know, um, you know, it's uh, a lot of optimizations been going on. Uh, so it's way more performant than previously uh, than previously it was. Also, like the the level of artifacting that we're seeing here is is substantially reduced, uh, certainly on higher spec machines. It also gives you a great sense of parallax when you fly through these these cloud sandwiches. A cloud sandwich? Yes, that's that, that's what it feels like. It feels like you're the meat uh, or the the cheese of a cloud sandwich. The cheese of a cloud sandwich. So as we get out of the cheese, uh, another really big feature that was important uh, for me was, uh, you know, terrain, uh, terrain shadowing and terrain occlusion from the clouds. So uh, you're actually seeing, you know, these uh, large areas of occlusion uh, cast onto the terrain. And it's, um, 
it just adds that depth it just adds that believability to uh, what we're seeing in the frame and you know when you see like these over like dark overcast uh, over, overcast clouds in the hovering above the mountains it it, it finally completes the uh, the frame especially when you see these distant rumbles of uh, thunder in the distance so james cameron who's doing the the, the run through yes that is his name um he will be taking us down to the outpost uh the goal for us is to basically make 50 of these whether they're inhabited or derelicts or or even um basically inhabited by a a, a farmer or inhabited by a gang so the goal is to have these act as different factions and so that you can develop different rep associated with them um, and you can start seeing how big these outposts uh, stretch to with the, the comms tower that's behind us and then even some of the AA turrets that you'll actually see up close and personal. That was a really good approach uh, from James there. Uh, good landing. That was a good solid three out of ten. Three out of ten. Jeez. Ian's a tough grader. Yeah, I go six at least. No one's ever got a six. You gotta watch me land, man. So here we'll go down to the technical deck. Show off the cargo area as well as the climate controlled um, component areas, and then onto the gravity generator room and the stairway out. Um, so you'll be able to learn more about the ship in one of the later panels that we have with Ben, Paul, and John. Um, I think the team did a great job on this. Uh, I think this is one of my favorite skins. Yeah. Yeah, they did a, a new skin, just um, just something that felt a lot more you know suitable for pyro. But you, know, you can see how it you know it feels suitably worn and, and weathered um, you know to fit into these these climates and you know what we're seeing here is first, first boots on the ground you know on pyro uh, i think it looks great uh, especially in, in in contrast to what we're seeing here is like actual ai on the train you know walking about going about their business um and is that an a8 or it there it is and radio comms towers and all these other elements that we want to make sure that are interactive for the player and allows them to go and explore or use as uh, use to their advantage. Um, we want them to be able to interact with these these different items. Here you can see like uh, various outpost modules. You know, to the right there, we've got the garage unit. You can see the infrastructure on the roof. But this large, beautiful, you know, archway here kind of signifies, you know, the main entrance, the primary entrance to the the main social module. I think the air looks look great. You know, fits in with the art style beautifully. The team did a great job on this. And then uh, we've seen the concept art previously in the day, and then you know here you can see it translated uh, in game. I think it absolutely looks fantastic. You know, uh, the radial forms, you know, is, is quite uh, quite special to this art style. Um, and you can see the, how that, that complements these archways that lead into other areas of the outpost. So it, with the AI, we want to make sure that it's living, it's breathing. Um, if you look back a little bit, there was a chef actually cooking. Um, there's security guards here to make sure that they're actually protecting their investments, protecting their home uh, from strangers. And then, uh, but you have good rep with them and uh, so they allow you to kind of enter into certain areas that you, the other players wouldn't be able to enter into. 
We also got a, a quick shot at the uh, the loadout that James is playing. So it's a female loadout, but it's also showing the um, the backpack, uh, which is new. Also, they want some of the new hair as well, which is rendering much nicer. So here, the player will make their way out to the training post, um, go see the dealer, acquire the artifacts. And for the for the trading post, you know, we wanted to get all of the the junk on the outside as well, uh, you know, so the player can see it as they're approaching. Uh, we wanted, you know, as many tops as we could, and you can see it's using the new soft deck shader. So these are reacting to the planetary wind, uh, you know, the same the same force that the 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 tall grass and the moss on the ground is reacting to as well. Other thing with the trading post is. Like Ian spoke about before, um, the inventory and, and what they'll be able to actually sell here will vary depending on um, where they're at in the solar system. Are they close to uh, a jump point where they might be coming down and using this as a chop shop? Or uh, are they in a very rural area that you know, they care more about um, the frontier lifestyle and being able to survive versus money? We uh, we passed the kitchen as well on the way back there. That's the that's the local diner uh, for this outpost. Tough crowd. <laughs> uh, also, so in the inside as well, you know, we wanted this, you know, kaleidoscope of, of uh, colors and shapes. Um, you know, like it's just literally the the dealers displaying all the wares, everything they'll have uh, outside in the open here. Welcome. Take a look. I'm sure I have what you want, and if not, I'll have something just as good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, very good choice. Very good. So after five million credits of disposable income, we get our first look at the uh, 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 Hadesian artifact, which is obviously going to be what is sort of a super rare uh thing that you'll you know, you hopefully be able to start finding in the, in the galaxy uh, which is sort of if you're familiar with the lore of Hades was an old civilization that destroyed itself uh, so somehow this trader has gotten their hands on uh, this artifact so here we're showing one way of actually playing through this area uh, it really depends on your standings within the gang and how they want to deal with you and then it, what's the dealer going to do? What's the dealer going to charge you? And from there, we have different ways of actually showing um, this. And, and we can look at option two now. So here we're going to run it back um, a little bit and show off a, a different way of entering into the trading post. This is a little bit more straightforward versus the in, in demo one. We we took a side route through uh, the social area. So yeah, this is just some additional warehouse space that the trading post would have, uh, and you can see it will lead directly onto the this courtyard. Um, and for the keen eye uh, people, you'd see that the barbecue's still not uh, being eaten yet. The grill master would be fired. Yeah. Still full of weirdness. So with this area again, we just want to make sure that it's filled out with items, filled out with different things that you can interact with and possibly buy. Um, it, it's like Dave said in the beginning, um, we want the stores to feel different here, uh, but it's it's still making it feel believable. Quick reference to some uh, additional traversal areas there on the right when we came in. Well, welcome. Take a look. I'm sure I have what you want, and if not, I'll have something just as good. Yeah. The guys had a lot of fun. Uh, addressing these areas. Uh, there's a lot of storytelling going into it. So here we decide not to pay the price. Um, and we want to 
we don't mind um, losing reputation with with the faction, and uh, decide that we're going to take the artifacts um, through betrayal. Just take it straight into the backpack. So here we've got uh, different routes for the players to enjoy and and to use to to flank um, and also navigate around. So each area will have different uh, secondary and tertiary routes of navigation. Um, James was really just trying to scare him there versus that was, actually kill him. That was intentional. Good, good shot, James. <laughs> you, you could also, if you notice real quick, there was a uh, the civilians are actually cowering as opposed to fighting, which is kind of, you'll see another coming up. But it's super cool. So again, here the player will have the choice, you know, do they actually want to interact with the civilians or, you know, does their conscience get better of them? I think James made the right choice there. He was nice. Yeah. Uh, one of the things when we play testing this a lot is when you see the uh, uh, the enemy AI kind of fanning out across the terrain like that, it's fantastic to see. It feels really great to see the base start to wake up to you and uh, yeah. actually trying to exfiltrate. Also, I know it's under, uh, you know, combat stress, but that yellow grass looks, just looks fantastic. That's how I play. So here, James just wants to get out real quick. slightly hinted to in the first walkthrough. Um, this is where the AA turrets will come alive. And uh, basically, if you're not fast enough, as James isn't, um, with your countermeasures, then they'll take you down. So what we saw there was the player went in and based off their actions, the faction changed against them and then uh, basically became very aggressive. So in this last playthrough, what we'll show you is if the faction is already against you from the very beginning and what are different ways that you can, you can go about it. So here we are in our last walkthrough. Um, since you're all by yourself, we wanted to show the player take a stealthy route versus if you were with friends, you could go in guns blazing. Um, but this allows the player to come in, access the the outpost from a different side than what we've shown. Uh, it also allows them to clock all the AI and see how they want to approach the problem and see what other secondary or tertiary routes would be open to them, either via the ladder or maybe a possible door. Good night. That was a great shot. Uh, also, one thing we did as well, as Todd said, you know, we, we changed the time of day. Uh, the wind is slightly stronger, so you'll see the uh, gorgeous yellow grass blowing just a little bit more intense uh, than uh, before. Uh, also, what we see here is like um, something to, to imply at the frontier living, you know, maybe the growing crops and vegetables out here, but it also gives a, a kind of like a soft cover approach uh, to the perimeter of the base. Nice. Also, with it being a different time of day, this allows us to show off the AI um, having their 24-hour schedules so that they can they can be in different areas um, when you approach it. So if you approach it at night or you approach it during the morning, you know they'll be doing different things. Whatever is uh, is valid for their schedule.
That door's locked, so there's no going through that way. But what uh, what James does actually see here as he's scouting out the next AI is, um, you know, just checking the roof line. But uh, as, as I said previously, we wanted as many kind of like um, views in uh, to the the base as possible, you know, just so the the player can con uh, continue to keep context of, of what's inside. But also when you're inside, it allows the player to to have context of where they're at within the actual outpost. And that was a great shot. The uh, the, the AI fell beautifully on the uh, the already called out beautiful yellow grass and moss. Also, so as, uh, as James is looking back, uh, what he's doing is actually uh, making a, a mental map of, you know, possible routes, uh, possible advanced traversal routes on top of the outpost. And we saw the dealer there in the bedroom, just end of the day. So with each outpost, there'll be different routes that will be open to the player or closed to the player. So some of them might have ladders on the outside, some of them might not. Some of them might have uh, basically ways to get in through the floorboards, other ones won't. But this is this is just one one version of, you know, many possibilities. So here, the player will take a secondary route of navigation all the way up to the roof, and then from here, um, this allows them to be able to check out any of the AI, also be able to look at any of the interactables um, in the future. You know, if you're uh, if you got a good reputation, maybe you need to go and fix uh, different uh, items on the roof, um, or if you are there for. Uh, nefarious means then maybe you want to take out the power and which will then turn you know kill the AA turrets or um, will turn off the the lights in the in the outpost so it allows the player to interact with different items and then uh, basically create a nice nice little sandbox for them to play in So here you can see one of those interactables as well as the AI. And just behind these interactables, like we've seen these these kind of archways. Like right now, this uh, these are just kind of empty, and uh, to just illustrate like a like a guard point. In the future, you know, these could be maybe customizable, or you know, they could contain like an AA turret, like we saw on on demo one, or it could contain like uh, cargo storage. Um, basically, we tried to design something that was as flexible as possible. So here we're showing off the looting system as well as the um, as well as the inventory system. So this will be shipping in three fifteen. This allows bodies to um, be able to be interacted with and take off the items associated with it. Also, with this um, change, you will no longer have global inventory, so you can't be pulling off weapons that you didn't take with you um, to this location. Uh, everything will be regarding uh, what you carry is is what you um, what you have, and um, so it, it really makes the players think about how they want to approach the problem, and then also encourages them to look around and see if uh, the designers and have placed different um, things that they can interact with or, or use um, to help uh, get past a, a certain um, route or a certain way that they, they maybe didn't bring with them. And we'll also be including the, uh, I believe in 315, the Knickknacks app for your Moby Glass. So now that you aren't carrying everything on your body and it's not sort of universal inventory, you'll be able to consult this app to see kind of where stuff is being stored and keep it better organized and stuff like that. So here, this allows the player to uh, have a, a quick little puzzle, but just gives them a little bit more interaction and then allows them to go on to a what I would consider a tertiary route um, versus climbing up the ladder and, and possibly having to deal with the AI or them being, being spotted by them.
Also, I think the team did a great job on the planet as well as the outpost. These are really fun to play and, and sneak around in and, um, you know, allows, uh, allows for many possible, you know, ways of attacking the same problem. What we're seeing here is like uh, James is actually getting up onto uh, through one of these like uh, rooftop storage modules, and it's it's given like the the highest point in the base. So from here, you can actually you know make probably the most informed decisions on you know how how to approach the next problem. You know we're seeing this guard routine here, and then ultimately uh, you know throwing an item to uh, distract the guard. allows them to to go and access new areas. Um, it's a behavior that we're still working out, but at least you're, we're seeing like the first iterations and be able to uh, continue to optimize it as well as um, make sure that the behavior is working properly. So we just saw that for the first time. It's like the first rooftop uh, airlock hatch. So previously, uh, route in and out. Uh, if the if if the outside wasn't pressurized, like uh, we wouldn't have this option. But now, through that rooftop uh, airlock, you can you can cycle and, and then you know infiltrate uh, through the roof. And also, what we're seeing here is um, you know potentially scouting out uh, an advanced traversal up into the rafters. You know, getting on top of some infrastructure and and get in like this overview uh, as we go into the uh, the garage module. So here, this is placeholder, but it gives you a, a very, it gives you an idea of, you know, we want to have different interactables, different loot boxes um, laid out around the, the location. So if the players um, explore, they'll be rewarded. You know, we, we want to encourage them looking in every nook and cranny and, and enjoying, you know, what the, what the outpost has for them. And one of the things that's interesting is these garages won't be vehicle spawn points. So, so it's not like a big kind of like pad in the middle, but it's more like, you know, if you want to, if you want to have your, your vehicle there, you've got to drive it in and park it. So here you can see a variety of vehicles just, just laid out how the player would have just parked them. Just gives a much more believable and realistic uh, design. So again, we're just encouraging different navigation, different routes for the player to go and see. Uh, over to the left, back there, and there was a, a possible way of going into floorboards or going underneath the, the outpost. Again, it, those those will be opened up or closed off based off of, you know, just how we want to build the outpost. Not every not every one will be built the same. Um, our philosophy for for these are to to make sure that they each one of them feels unique um, and this is just one way of us us customizing it and, and making each one feel um, different. And so the player won't always be used to the same route. So here, again, we're using the inventory system. We allow the players to go in and uh, if you take out a certain AI, um, they might have different tools or different uh, notes or different items that you'll need um, in order to solve uh, your mission. Interestingly, when we were designing these spaces, um, we knew we wanted these internal uh, uh, airlocks, um, but we knew we needed some sort of like new, uh, like pothole uh, on them, just so before you commit through, before you cycle, you know, you can just double check to see if there's any bad guys on the other side. So we, we got some ragdoll bugs. Um, I guess it wouldn't be a citizen con without any sort of uh, issues or bugs. So here, like the, previously, the players being, uh, you know, on the roof, they've come down through the main 
uh, section of the outpost. But here, what the player's doing is they're going to the, the underfloor section. So these are vents, but they're more like uh, subfloors. So they're meant to feel very dark, very minimal, but you're actually seeing the foundations of these outposts. So inside here, it's uh, the player will need to kind of uh, work out how to navigate through them. It's very much a, a like a torch-based experience. You know, um, and then within here, um, what the player can actually do is work out uh, roughly where they are in relation to the um, to what's uh, upstairs. And what you see in here, like this light bleeding down through, you know, you can kind of make informed decisions. Or okay, that's where that AI was. Or uh, right now, the player is just underneath that main social space. So if you think back, like that was that guard in the beginning, just just next to the kitchen counter. You know, the, it, we, we've intentionally made these spaces not necessarily like very easy to navigate because, you know, it, there wouldn't be a lot of light down here. You know, um, the player would have to, you know, follow, for example, like James is following the blue wire here, you know, um, you know, making a decision to like, hey, if I follow that blue wire, I'm probably going to get to something interesting or a point where I can actually, you know, exit this supply of space and get back up above. And what I like about them is, is basically just the claustrophobic feel of it. And then obviously the addition of possible secondary um, or more advanced navigation. So either going into prone or uh, just going full crouch. So here we come out uh, in the bathroom space that's on the other side of the garage. So we're on the opposite side of the outpost from where we just were. It's a good ragdoll. Now the body drag in the shower. So here, um, this is just a different wrapper on a loot box. Uh, in this case, it's a hamper. And so the player will be able to uh, really change outfits and, and adjust the way that they look so that they can walk around the outpost and, and not be, um, be noticed. Uh, there will be kind of a, a certain a certain time limit associated with it. We still need to work out the, the details on how all that will work, but the the goal is to to give them a little bit of um, leeway. And so, if you look the part, maybe you're not scrutinized as, as much, and the AI won't uh, um, won't notice you as as quickly. So here we can see back into the social space, but this time on the other side. And then this door will lead directly into the, the habitation room that we saw previously on the outside. Speaking of fun, fun ragdoll physics. That was a great one. So here, um, the player uh, decided to take the, the dealer out instead of actually figuring out how they could open up the safe. Um, so they're going to have to look around the room. They're going to have to interact with the body and possibly see, you know, is there a way for them to actually open it? Um, in other cases, uh, maybe the safe will be hackable um, in the future. And in some cases, it won't be. And then you'll, you'll need to figure out a different way of, of actually opening it. So here we spot a little clue, um, a little note, and uh, you'll notice the, uh, what's fun is like the name on here, if, if you look back and see the, uh, some of the AI we've been taken out, uh, you may notice some names. Um, so here's the clue for the player. But one of the coolest things for me here is the player is holding an item with the clue and while holding the item, they can seamlessly interact with another item to solve a puzzle. That's awesome. And then here we got a little bug. The player was able to acquire the artifact and then uh, will be able to do whatever they want with it, either sell it or be able to 
use it somehow in a future mission. One of the things that was really exciting about watching this kind of back to back to back is, is finally getting to see that freedom of choice. And it's like, it's really, really, I mean, again, the, our locations are always spectacular and beautiful, but now like having that sort of striking that balance between, uh, you know, this sort of well thought out social space and construction of these locations, but also an equally effective stealth and combat thing. It's a, it's super cool to see. So after seeing the demo play through, you know, three different ways, um, it was a huge team effort. So uh, everyone that worked uh, on the project on this part of what we wanted to show, we want to say a big thank you, you know, big shout out because, you know, we're just presenting it. Uh, it's the people that did a lot of the hard work um, that should be represented. And uh, speaking of people doing hard work, uh, now's a good chance to throw it over to Eddie and Joel, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about the uh, how we built that outpost that we just saw. I'm Eddie Hilditch. Uh, I'm a senior lead, and myself and my team have been working on the new colonialism outposts. My name is Joel Azapati, and I'm a senior environment artist too for the EU Sandbox team. So after the initial concept is done and rounds of feedback have been iterated on, we move into pre-production. This phase allows us to spend some time testing the concepts for in-game viability. Translation from concept to game isn't always one-to-one, -one, and during pre-production, we'll get rough versions of the concept meshes into game and spend time making sure that they'll work practically. The art direction can also change at this stage, so we use this phase to kind of explore creatively as well, and concept art is a fantastic jumping off point for sparking ideas. One of the first steps when starting a new location is to start look development a hyper-focused small section of the location where we can hone in the tools and methods needed to execute the concept in-game. Some things translate well, some things don't. It's important to figure all this out before going full steam ahead with the entire team. One of the great assets on the Sandbox team is we have a lot of people who are passionate about concept and design, which means when translating from concept to production environment, it's very easy to expand on the concept art. With the art styles of the Colonial Outpost, we decided to change up the way we typically author content. Our hard surface locations are meant to feel prefabricated, like there's a manufacturing plant out there on ArtCorp that churns out these flat pack space station kits so stations can be mass produced. Colonial Outposts are more personal, more handcrafted by the people who live there, based on their needs, not wants. They're on the frontier world, so they can't always choose luxury over practicality. Materials were one of the first things we tackled, and we started off by developing the idea of how the inhabitants would have built these structures and what materials they would use. We wanted to show not only the age of the outpost, but also wanted to hint at all those different layers of the structure and give you an idea how, functionally, they constructed them. One of the biggest challenges with the new outpost is how we introduce variation between each location the player will visit. Building each as a bespoke set of buildings is impossible, as we want hundreds, if not thousands, of outposts in the game eventually. The modular approach that we've developed really evolved out of our previous work on space station interiors, but with a few key improvements. Uh, this starts at the macro level, where on the planet's outposts are placed, how the local conditions affect your time there, then what kind of buildings an outpost has and how they're laid out, all the way down to the ability to independently swap out an underfloor layout in a single building of that outpost. We'll have various types of modules, from large standalone modules like warehouses or ore extractors, which have a singular function, all the way down to smaller room modules that can be connected together in different ways to form a complete headquarters building. After pre-production was finished, we had a list of the room module types that we wanted to tackle first. For the headquarters building, everything hinges around a hub module with different room modules that can be attached to extend the structure. The room modules will serve different functions in the base with various gameplay systems linking one to another for an interconnected web of sandbox gameplay opportunities. As content creators for the Outpost, we needed a new system to build, edit, and manage the library of modules we're creating. Rastar is the tool we'll use to do this. It allows us to intuitively create a location template directly on the surface of the planet. Not only this, but headquarter buildings can be snapped together directly within the tool or with an intuitive user interface. One of the other major innovations with the Planet Tech has been the ability to modify the terrain mesh and flatten areas of terrain. Previously, we were at the mercy of the terrain when it came to designing our buildings, which is why our outposts had to be built with stilts and placed in naturally flat areas of the planet. Now, 
We can build much more natural buildings with walls and entrances connected directly to the planet's surface. And also we can place these buildings in a much wider range of locations. We believe our new outposts inject a refreshing new location experience into Star Citizen. They're organic, warm, personal spaces that really convey the age and history of humanity's expansion into the verse. The new art style, the focus from design on gameplay and the flexible modular approach to their construction will allow us as developers and you as players to be part of creating a wider variety of rich and satisfying experiences for every outpost the player comes across. Okay, cool. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Joel. That was awesome. And moving on, we're actually going to talk to Corey now, uh, who is going to give us kind of a deep dive into the creation of uh, the artifact, which is actually kind of our first little glimpse of the uh, Hadesian culture from Hades system. Thanks, guys. I'm Corey Bamford, the props artist at Carl Imperium Games. I'm here today specifically to talk about the Hadesian artifact that you'll see in the walkthrough. So we knew early on we wanted some sort of MacGuffin for the walkthrough. Um, we originally had a few ideas of what that could be, Originally, it was either going to be a tablet fragment, a sculpture, or a Hadesian artifact. So initially, the concept team explored a variety of ideas. We used a lot of reference for existing alien artifacts in the game, as well as reference from the real world. You know, lots of tomes and ancient kind of Egyptian stuff as well. Just all sorts of really reference, just to get a general idea. We knew we wanted to integrate some form of ancient power or technology into the asset. We also knew we wanted it to have some sort of symbolism and text. So once the concept team iterated further on these ideas, they then presented those back to Chris, and we narrowed down the selection of assets until we had a candidate that everyone was happy with. So once we had this asset in mind, it then came down to turning that from a concept into a production asset, and that's where the props team comes in. When a prop artist gets a concept like this, immediately the wheels in their head start turning, and they're trying to figure out the best way to implement it in our game engine they need to find solutions within the engine to achieve the visual target of the concept. Obviously, it's not as simple as just taking the concept and replicating it. We have to think about the shaders, we have to think about performance. Our, our job really is to find a solution within the game engine to achieve the visual target of the concept. Once we've figured out a strategy for achieving the look, we begin to actually make the content. So for the artifact, for example, we knew that it needed to be split into three segments and they needed to fit together. The first thing we do is get a placeholder into the game for the design team to actually implement as an entity. We also then figure out how the scale actually works in the player's hand uh, and when they inspect it. For the artifact, there was a bit of back and forth between the size because we wanted to get a balance between it having prominence and also being easily carryable. After we figured out the size of the asset, we then need to actually break down how we're going to make it. So the first thing we really get into is the materials. We know that this asset is made of a few different materials. Firstly, we have the stone with the complicated glowing pattern. We also have these large copper structures and some smaller, thinner metal structures as well. For this asset, we knew we'd need to use unique textures just because of the amount of detail we wanted to achieve. One of the biggest challenges we had was making sure that the stone looked really good. To create the stone, we started with some scan data of rocks and concrete, as well as some mesh data like curvature. We also used a lot of procedural noises from Substance Designer just to add some variety. Using the height map as a jumping off point for the rest of the texture maps is quite a nice logical and physicalized way of doing things. It took quite a lot of iteration to get the final look. It was definitely a group effort. The glow was probably the trickiest part of this asset. We ended up actually using a shader some of you might remember from the Vandal Driller trailer. We created the iconography using a bespoke texture mask, and then the circles were derived from some cells within Substance Designer. We took these cells, quantized them, and then got the edges of that quantization to create the rings. And then we used a procedural mask as well as some hand-painted textures to mask out that glow. Once we were happy with this texture, we multiplied that onto the height map, which is used to drive the glow threshold. The glow effect has three texture inputs that we need to create. There's an animated glow map, which is sort of used to drive the background effect of the glow. There's also a gradient, which colors that map. Finally, we have the actual pulse itself, which is the texture map that pulses across the asset. Next up is the bronze. This was actually pretty straightforward to achieve. We didn't need any fancy shader effects for this one, just a standard set of unique textures. We wanted to get lots of nice scratches and aging on the, on the bronze. And in the concept, there was also this nice effect on the edges where the metal got darker. So we wanted to add that in as well, just to give it a more distinctive feel. Once we were happy with the visual look of the asset and engine, it then was just a case of wrapping it up. We needed to create LOD meshes for the object, as well as collision proxies. As you can tell, quite a lot of work goes into these hero assets. 
So that was a little bit of exploration into how we created the Hedician artifact for the walkthrough. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to me talk about it and enjoy the rest of the show. So we wanted to thank you for your time. We wanted to uh, introduce Pyro and show all the hard work that all the team's been working on and uh, working towards. The team has put in a, a lot of hard work in building the Pyro system, building the AI, building uh, the planets, the worlds and that you'll go and explore. So Pyro will be ready when server meshing is, and it will be coming out with Star Citizen Alpha 4.0. So on behalf of myself, I want to thank Dave and Ian and uh, yourselves for watching, and I hope you enjoyed uh, the panel, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Digital Citizen Con. See you in the verse. Reddit's burning a hole in your pocket? Didn't think so. Something tells me, though, you got a pile of junk in that hangar of yours. Turn that crap into scrap at Dumper's Depot. Old Zeke always pays top cred for all your used gear at any of my verse famous franchise locations. From Art Corp. To Crusader. Stop on by and tell them Zeke sent you. From thrusters to mining lasers, power plants to shield generators, we got your back. Dumpers Depot, because everything is valuable to someone. Dumpers Depot LLC is not responsible for inaccurate appraisals. Commercial service and delivery fees will apply. Space is cold and unforgiving. Only the toughest survive here. But even the toughest outlaw has a sensitive side. He doesn't have to show it to everyone. Because with your very own Moby Horizon, you have peace, freedom, relaxation and your very private emotional retreat always with you. Welcome to your very own Moby Horizon. The use of Moby Horizon can be addictive. If in doubt, consult a licensed physician. Stress beacon is triggered, and a quick reactionary force from the lead expeditionary is mobilized. Roger, boss. Albatross flight, prepare for drop. One minute out. Load master copy. It's dropping the ramp. Utilizing state-of-the-art technology, highly trained professionals arrive with it moments. Albatross flight, 30 seconds. Every team, power up. Rolling on three. Prepare to deliver justice in even the most remote reaches of the verse. Execute, execute, execute. Every team is rolling. Last man, every team down and safe. Roger, last man. Albatross breaking off. 
Elite Expeditionaries got your back. Here at Kelto, we have one simple goal, to bring you the items you need quickly and easily. We've got everything you need. Food, drinks, toys for the little ones, guns for the wife, all inside one store. Kelto! Just walk inside to begin your astronomical savings. Using the latest in Moby technology and machine learning, we know exactly what you've picked up and have already charged you. Want something hot and ready to go? How about hot dogs, nachos, or burritos? Kelto! We've even got the latest in Gemini ballistic weapons, like the Gemini F-55 LMG, featuring an explosive rate of fire that tops over 1,000 rounds per minute. It's the best light machine gun you can get in a convenience store. Looking for something a bit smaller for the kids, we also carry the Gemini LH86 pistol. Perfect for those small hands. So come down to Kelto today for quality products at low prices. Come to Kelto. Come to Kelto. Hey, welcome to CitizenCon 2951, our yearly celebration of everything Star Citizen is and showcase of what Star Citizen is on its way to become. As usual, I'm your host, Jared Huckabee. So what is CitizenCon? When it started in 2013, it may have had its humble roots in Sandy just wanting some place to bring folks together and a solid excuse for Ben and Pete to watch the Wing Commander movie in a theater in Austin, Texas. But as with all things Star Citizen, it grew each year to become a full day of activities, most recently held in Manchester, England in 2019. Now, with a hiatus in 2020 due to the pandemic and our desire to remain diligent and responsible in 2021, CitizenCon is back as something slightly different this year. Now, while it won't be the same without seeing all of you in person and worrying if your plastic bag helmet is safe or not, uh, we hope this year's event brings with it a similar sense of community and interaction as our developers present to you their continuing efforts to, in uh, bringing Star Citizen's future to the present. And let's talk about some of that future we just saw with a look at, we just took at the pyro system. Now, I've always said it, and I'll continue to always say it, we get better with every one of these things we do, whether that's planets, uh, spaceships, or anything else in between. And with the pyro presentation, we got our first true look at some of the new uh, planets and moons, the process of converting our existing space stations into new outlaw variants, uh, taking those colonial outposts that we've been seeing before from concept to amazingly detailed reality, and uh, perhaps most excitedly, planetary AI nav mesh in action with a 24-hour day-night cycle that will truly bring these worlds to life and provide that, that universe of gameplay possibility seen in those multiple different ways you can go about achieve, achieving your objectives. And uh, for those of you who were wondering, yes, that was really Pyro 3, that was a real outpost and a real mission. No sandworms here. That's what's coming to Star Citizen and a whole lot more. Now, because I'm a, the patron saint of bad ideas, let's take a look at some of the comments that came in on Twitch while we were all watching. This should be good. Uh, Engion says, using talent from across the globe, that's a good thing. I agree. Uh, Adderoth says, this guy is talking like it's been made. <laughs> uh, DFX2KX says they probably have the gameplay, but they want to force folks to stick around and watch the whole thing before they show it. Annoying, but typical for them. We are who we are. We showcase every part of the Star Citizen. Uh, Rolana says someone needs to hand out some meds in chat. Underfern says... I wouldn't buy a melty dog from that man. I don't know if they're talking about Todd Pappy or Ian Leyland, but agreed. Uh, lots of people said, 
420 Space Weed Vape Nation Damp 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 Dank. Uh, Gaming Fortis says, just remember, he's more scared of you than you are of him. That's the truth. And then everyone went on a claim spree for a while. Uh, James Cameron, yes, the real James Cameron, he does exist. And then finally, uh, Shorty Mac said, number 15, Burger King foot lettuce. The last thing you'd want in your Burger King burger is someone's foot fungus. But as it turns out, that might be what you get. Wise words, always can always rely on the Twitch community. And speaking of community, you may have noticed a selection of community created videos throughout the day, ranging from commercials to skits to a variety of things in between. Those are all here as part of an effort by our fantastic community team that started months ago to include as many of you in today's festivities as possible. And while we can't show every single one that was sent in, the team did expand their original idea of just 15 videos to a whopping 42 for today's show. So you're gonna see a few more as the day progresses. Now, of course, CitizenCon wouldn't be CitizenCon without the swag. Check that out, huh? Yeah. And this year, we've got it coming in two shapes and sizes. First up is the digital goodies pack seen here, which comes with the newly minted Arden SL Balefire suit you may have seen recently on Inside Star Citizen with that slick Theta Geo helmet. Uh, it's got the matching Balefire combat knife because accessorizing is always important. And the classic CitizenCon 2951 trophy, which I'm still trying to convince actor feature team to turn into a bludgeoning weapon. Just say red one one more time, people. Now, these will all be distributed Monday to all backers. So if you've been on the fence so far and decide to back the project today, you'll get it along with everybody else on Monday. Now, over in Meat Space, since we can't do the traditional swag bag that's included for attendees with their ticket, we're doing a swag box that you can purchase on the RSI store. Uh, for the collectors out there, it's got three brand new Star Citizen pins to add to the collection, as well as an individually numbered challenge coin that says there are many like it, but this one is yours. Now, both collector's items come in a neat box and bundled with stickers that you can place all over the place, like Steve Bender's desk. I know, <laughs> because I did. Now, the swag bag made box is available now on the robertspaceindustries.com website. And we've also got some contests and giveaways going throughout the day, uh, starting with this Astro Gaming Headset Contest, where folks hosting their own CitizenCon watch parties have an opportunity to submit images on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag SCWatchParty to win a custom-painted Xenothreat headset seen here. Whether your party is at home or at work or if you're Captain Richard in his car. And for those of you who don't do social media, we're also giving away some Toby Eye, Tractor, uh, Toby Eye Trackers on Spectrum today in a short story contest. So tell us about some incredible moments you've had in person with your fellow citizens and win a Toby Eye Tracker. Check that out on Spectrum for your chance to win. And no, uh, I don't have one of those to show you because as somebody said, I don't give things back. Now, let's talk about the day's activities. We just completed our Life in the Verse or Life in Pyro presentation. Up next, we've got Ship Talk, where you'll learn about the latest and greatest in spacecraft coming to Star Citizen. Then we got Gen 12 and the Multicore of Vulcan, where we'll take you through some of the new technologies that will unlock Star Citizen's ultimate performance potential. Uh, Crafting Worlds, which offers a brief look at some of the new tools that make up those wonderful pyro planets we just saw. Uh, server meshing and the state of persistence, which will give you an inside look at the process of expanding Star Citizen out to the breadth and scope we all want it to reach. Uh, the Sounds of Space, which for my money is the sleeper presentation of the day. Uh, don't miss out. It looks at the new tools that will unleash our sound designers from the constraints of yesterday's outdated processes. And then finally, Systemic Gameplay and the Stream of Thought. An entirely silent presentation where Tony beams his brainwaves directly into your skull through the TV, provided, of course, you have your SGS brainwave amplitude receiver. You all have your SGS brainwave amplitude receiver, don't you? We'll figure it out later. 
Basically, it's a big, long day of Star Citizen presentations and infos. That pyro presentation alone was like an entire season of ISC just crammed into a single day. Which makes me think, can I take the rest of this quarter off? I can. I cannot. I cannot. All right. Well, if you end up missing any part of the show or just want to watch it again, each presentation will be going up on YouTube later today in glorious 4K. But fair warning, do not look directly into Todd, Pep Todd Pappy's eyes in, in 4K. Or Corey Bamford's. They're mesmerizing. And that about does it for the housekeeping. It's time to throw it to our next presentation of the day, Ship Talk with Paul Jones, John Crew, and Ben Curtis, where they'll be, well, they're, where they'll be discussing a uh, ship you know, a ship you don't know, and a ship you weren't supposed to know, but you ended up did knowing. It's not invisible any longer. Here's Ship Talk. Through unforgiving lands, Across the impossible expanse, a mirage calls, a distant oasis. We chase what most consider myth, pursue an obsession. That's what pushes us to greatness. The Oasis. It's real. The 400i by Origin Jumpworks. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, 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 it was awesome. So we we made the 404 yeah, in the was, end. It was a ruse all along. It was a real <laughs> ship. So. Look cool though. I like yeah. it. Yeah, those trainers are always super cool to see the the artwork from both yeah, teams. Yeah, really good job of kind of showing off what what I think everyone's kind of done. Yeah. Right. So we should probably go on with the show. Uh, this is Ship Talk, uh, where we are going to talk about a variety of things today. Uh, my name's John Crew. I'm the vehicle director here at CIG. Uh, I'm Ben Curtis, and I'm the Vehicle Art Director at CRG. And I'm Paul Jones, Art Director. So the, the 400i, it's a Constellation competitor. And we've got a few of these ships in this category across the board. We have the Constellation, we have the Corsair, and now we have the 400i. And the 400i has a few interesting features that makes it uh, a compelling choice over the others. So being an origin ship, it's obviously very visually sleek and fast, but also it can carry cargo and a, a vehicle at the same time. Size-wise, there's obviously a big gap in the range. Uh, we have the, the 100 series at the start, so it jumps up to the 300 series. Then there's the big jump to the 600 series and then another jump to the 890. So finding a space for this was, was fairly easy size-wise? I think it fills the gap quite nicely. So in terms of the process, um, uh, normally what happens is we've, we, you know, we, we assign it to one concept artist and we start the ball rolling. So it's really just a, a game of sort of exploration at this point. You know, it's fast and loose. You know, we always have a timeline uh, for each concept. And so it's, uh, you know, the pressure is always on basically. Uh, it doesn't matter how many ships we've done, there's always that pressure to get it done and hit and hit the sort of key points. And so at this point of exploration, it's really sort of uh, loosey-goosey in terms of figuring out ideas, looking at shapes, looking at silhouettes, and sort of not locking yourself into uh, a line of thinking. It's basically, you know, we'll look at different ships. So we'll, some will be more influenced by the 600i, some more by the 100i. And then we'll sort of do a mix and match. And so, like I said, 
sometimes you don't quite hit it on that on that sort of you know I think like right at the yeah. beginning. Yeah, when, when you've got like a, a well-established manufacturer, it's it's really beneficial because you, you kind of you, you, know, you have that to pull from, but you also want, don't want to get into the point where it's just a scaled down 600 or a scaled up. Do you know what I mean? You kind yeah. of like you don't want them all just to look like they're the same ship, just slightly different variants. Yeah. Uh, so I think the 400 is um, it certainly stands out within the lineup, but it's clearly an origin ship. And I think yeah. it's, I mean, because we, we sort of follow the, man, you know, sort of car manufacturers, don't we, in mm. terms of uh, the brand, it's sort of expanding the brand, sort of the brand also develops over time. So we have like a double, yeah. you know, since the start of the project, Origin has sort of slightly changed its style a little bit. Um, and then like, say, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want just a mini 600. Yeah. Even though there's a part of me that would just be like, right, let's do a mini I 600. I do really like the 600. Like, yeah, 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 the 600. And even that, even at this point, I kept sort of coming back to one original sketch that had been done for the, oh, what was it? I think it was 100 yeah. I. There was a little thumbnail. Um, you know, it's literally in my head, it's about that big. And the sketch is just teeny weeny. I was like, oh, I kind of want a version like this. This looks kind of cool. And and so basically, in the end, I just went in and and kick bashed um, some ideas together. See, this was, this was before my time on the ship team, so it's quite interesting oh, really? to, to learn a bit more about the, the process. I, I, yeah, a lot of the, it's a great ship. My favourite one, Paul. <laughs> in that case, <laughs> a lot of the, uh, the little concept thumbnails get. If you see one, because we often show them in Jump Point magazines afterwards, mm -hmm. after a ship's been released, you see all the early sketches, and people probably noticed like, that 100 eye uh, mm. thumbnail that we did that was rejected for the 100 yeah. but then has come around for this and you never know what might happen with ones that we didn't choose for this one yes could yes the they future. might appear in future ships so ultimately this was this is what uh you know this is like a visual that i did so it's you know throwing together a bunch of shapes uh, what we call kit bashing from different models because it's quick as an art director, you've always got. It feels like you've got zero time to get yeah. to get a result. So it's how do you get uh, provide a visual that people can understand <clears throat> in the uh, shortest time possible. And so my understanding of the ship was it was a luxury, a luxury explorer. Yeah. And so you can see here that that's why there's a swimming pool in there, and a, and a deck. You know, the part of the process is that we show it to Chris Roberts. Uh, to get sort of direction and feedback. And Chris was quite adamant that this, this was going to be you know, an, an explorer. It wasn't, it yeah. wasn't just you know, a, a small scale party ship. It, was, you know, it needed to have a function. Yeah. It needed to be a competitor to that scale and, and kind of role of ship. Yeah. You know, we did quite a lot of interior investigations and um, you know, just sort of looking at, looking at ways of arranging space within that ship. Because like we said earlier, even though the ship looks big, it's actually really tight. Like it's like yeah. it's a lot harder than you think to achieve everything that now star citizens expect to have in their ships and yeah. all the components and all it's the like functionality. A very streamlined sort of two decks, or really like one deck that stretches most of the lower section and the the upper bit, which had the pool in it. Yes. Um, maybe one day you'll get. Maybe we get the pool. You'll get your pool one day. So in terms of this process, what happens is we finish the concept or what we what we think is finished, and then get Chris sign off, do a couple of paint schemes, and then it Done passes over it. to yeah. at your department. Yeah. So so from the concept, um, normally you know the we'll kind of take it as quickly as possible in, into the editor, and that just allows us to um, kind of really get a good sense of the space from from the player and making sure that um you know everything that we think we need is actually going to fit um making sure the components go through and like like we were saying earlier a lot of the time is um what a ship starts off with its kind of um paper design you know its official design document to the point where we're actually kind of uh working on the ship the requirements can change that might you know that's not just because you know we're like, oh, we'll add this and add that to it. it it's sometimes you know a balance pass has been done in the game and we've realized that you know a certain ship item you know a certain size shield might not be suitable for it anymore or um it might be just that yeah we think well actually it'd be great if we could fit the x1 in it because it's kind of the perfect mm -hmm. ship for it um but that wasn't like I say on the the original plans so yeah i mean 
like like you were saying, the the ship is kind of a, a hard split with its its two floors. So we've we've kept sort of all of engineering and cargo and storage and everything downstairs still, and then the kind of the habs and the the, the crew space is all upstairs with the, the bridge, obviously. Once we kind of get that white box in game, we then start just making sure that um, we can fit everything in we need. We also that's uh, the point that we kind of really start internally showing that ship to everyone that that yeah. is invested in it, and, and you know, including Chris and um, you know, everyone that, that needs to kind of have a say. And one of the kind of things that Chris was really keen for, although he didn't want this ship to be a kind of luxury party ship. He did want it to feel origin. I think originally we had like the lift. Yeah, there's, there was a smaller. I'll try not to do hand movements too much. Really. Yeah, there was just a single, small platform just for the crew that yeah, went straight up lots, into. Yeah, uh, in, it, into I mean the that nose. whole area was quite tricky, wasn't it? Because there yeah. was the um, docking ring, the docking collar, yep. yeah. the lift. Yeah, and then there was a, an entrance to the front and an entrance. You to had the back. yeah. Originally, I think on the concept, you you walked in through the docking collar. Um, and like you say, the floor was a lift, you had the collar on the side, and then doors either side, which took you to like a little antechamber that had the suit lockers in, yeah, I think it was. Suit lockers at the front, yeah. And yeah, the, the, the first bit of feedback from Chris was the entrance doesn't really feel very grand for an origin ship. Um, and that's when we kind of introduced the, the stairs and the, the kind of like the big, not marble staircase, but that, that sort of idea that you were kind of like, you know, walking into the ship felt a little bit more grand. That had some knock-ons to the, the kind of interior space as well because you know obviously making a, a one person or two person lift is something that, that's relatively small it's, it's, it's fits in a nice tight space um, but when you've got a set of stairs that need to fit or need to have a decent height change um, that requires a lot more space so what we ended up doing was kind of opening up this first chamber you walk into and rather than being divided into separate rooms that kind of whole space kind of acts as the airlock and that's got everything that you need when you first enter the ship. Um, and I think it does, like I say, just that initial entrance feels quite nice yeah. now. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. we don't have a lot of ships like that anymore, but have the go up the front of it in, yeah. inside it. Like. Yeah, I mean, we've obviously we've, we've got another one that we'll show after this. Yeah. But yeah, mo most of them, if they've got a ramp, it's, it's like cargo, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. pure function yeah. and, and not really... No, I think you guys have done a great job on this because it, it was tricky. You yeah, know, I remember it at the time, and you feel the time pressure. And, and then it was, it was when I was just starting on the team as well, so I was like coming in and be like, oh, Paul, what, do we, "What do we do? Like, where, 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 where do we go?" But it also, uh, I mean, it's also nice because it sort of dovetails with that original sketch, which yeah. has there's an element there in that oh, thumbnail. There? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I think at the time I sort of binned it off because I was yeah. just like, I don't like. I'm sure I had some thoughts about it. I mean, everybody knows we've got a sort of 64 kilobit memory, so stuff kind of like gets lost yeah. after a short amount of time but um i think we did discuss it but then yeah it was just like no let's just let's just go let's go simple but yeah yeah you guys did did good stuff yeah and then, then the next thing to tackle like paul was saying was um the, the kind of like the addition of the bike garage um it it was a bit of a headache trying to kind of fit that in and the original plan that, that you know you can see is originally we were going to have it um at the back of the ship next to the cargo or right within the back of the cargo yeah room. within the cargo room um it it did fit um but it, it kind of brought up a few quirks with it yeah. i think um the you know there, there was a few different quirks from different departments so um from a design point of view I think we could only make it fit if you sent the bike up on its own, which was fine. But because the main entrance to the ship was at the, the front, it meant that yeah. you'd get yeah. off. Yeah, to drive your bike onto this platform, get off your bike, send the bike up, run around to the front of the ship, run up the stairs. Yeah, and, and the and stairs just look at your bike. Opening things. isn't exactly like a super quick thing. So yeah. if you, you yeah, know, it just felt yeah. kind of like in terms of flow. Yeah, it's like all right, I need to quickly quickly get off planet, and you're like, oh, I'm click that, right, okay, yeah, send that up. Oh, run, yeah, okay, you go. Yeah. A minute later or two minutes later, you're in you're in the seat ready to fly. Like I say, that was one of the, the issues we kind of hit, and then the other, I guess, um, issue was it just it started eating into the cargo space, so it meant that you couldn't once you had the cargo fully loaded, there was very little space for you to kind of traverse around the um, the cargo hold, basically. You know, we, we had a number of kind of ideas we played with, and then uh, if you click on, yeah, we ended up um, basically putting it at the opposite end of the ship. Yeah. Now the 
nose. Should we call it the nose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the nose now opens up and it's got like a nice little kind of dedicated X1 garage in there. It's a nice use of that kind of spine yeah, that was there originally. Yeah, there was nothing um, really. The, the gravity drive was there, yeah. but we kind of nudged that back a bit. Um, and I guess the mounts for the guns, but they they kind of still tucked out to the side a little bit. So yeah, yeah it was um, a better use of space because it was sort of, yeah, like you say, it had the gravity generator there and it had the suit lockers, but it was weird that you had to go through the airlock to get your suit and yeah. then back out. Um, so yeah, taking up that space was, was much nicer. Um, and the other really good thing is all the controls for getting a new ship and doing this, they're all On. Right, right next to you. So you go, yep. open this, open this. Yeah. And put your bike yeah. away. Yeah. And go up. And I think that's one of the kind of like um the, the like say the nice things of it is is you know, you can I guess ride up to your ship and it, it's just there, you send it up straight up and, and you know, there's no messing around. Um so yeah, that was one of the other challenges. And then to be honest, most of the the rest of the ship kind of went pretty much to, to plan in terms of, you know, what was on concept. I don't think there was any kind of real yeah. surprises. So, you know, now as, as you enter the ship and you come into the kind of like the main body, you're into engineering, this ship does have large shields. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that was another thing to make it different. Um, obviously, we've made changes whilst during development to other ships and shields have changed. So it's not quite as unique as it was, um, but it's still very well shielded for its size uh, and the other cool thing about engineering is those rooms at the edge are cool cool uh, yeah they're climate controlled so uh, it's another nice little thing to play with gives all the teams so something we're gonna have full, extra. full dry ice and everything full, full dry yeah, ice yeah, yeah you can get the come in and the light sticks out it. and flow out a yeah. little bit of party mode in there nice. yeah but yeah um i think that's it that was one of the things i think you established early on in the concept was, was this kind of like cool chamber in engineering. Yeah, because we needed that space. I yeah. mean, you need space to put all the components somewhere and just thought, well, let's just turn it into a feature. Yeah. So And it kind of fits with the origin kind of family yeah. as well, I yeah. think. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, and then, yeah, kind of from engineering, you kind of go straight to the back and that's where you've got your, your storage. I don't know if you know the SDU size off, offhand, but... Um, Oh, not off the top of my head now. No. no. Should, you can should probably put that in the notes. Press. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so you can fit a decent amount of storage in there. You've also got the escape pods. One of the other things we were doing when we were looking at this space with the bike is originally we were kind of, if we put the bike in this area, it meant that the storage reduced. So we were looking at kind of other ways of moving the storage around. At one point we thought, oh, we could put it out in the wings, but then that didn't really make sense because, you know, Ideally, in the wings where you saw your fuel and that sort of yeah. stuff, and, and it just felt really awkward. Mm -hmm. Where this kind of gives us the kind of classic traditional big block of cargo. Yeah, right? big block of it's cargo. You can have the vehicle, can't you? Yes, it's yeah. Like um, you, you can fit a cyclone in there. Yes. Other, other smallish vehicles. Yeah. But obviously, it will take away your cargo space. Your cargo yeah. space, so yeah. it's not. You can do it. But you won't have any but cargo. But you won't have any cargo, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, we kind of make our way upstairs. Three man, three crew. Bridge, yep, three crew bridge. Um, and yeah, it's it's you know it's very to me anyway. The bridge is is very origin. It feels um, you know very very sleek. Um, get a real nice view of the, the the kind of front of the ship out in front of you, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a nice place. And it's got the classic kind of origin uh, kind of hard and, and you know, we haven't got any low tech screens. It's all kind of projected and yeah, feels graphic. fancy. Yeah, yeah. Does well, that so, I mean you can see there's a lot of 600i influence, like from the, from the original concept mm -hmm. image that was done for the 600i. Yeah. So I was keen to get those. That sort of it's almost like a like the black louvers. Yeah. And then get everything sort of. To be honest, they were one of the things that we we kind of kept referencing back during the production was like let's just go back and have a look at the 600 because that's one of the again one of those kind of shapes that really sells origin mm -hmm. to me. <laughs> and yeah, so I think it was good kind of keeping them. And that, yeah, it was also, uh, what's the origin buggy called? G12. Thank you, yeah. So, again, we've got the louvers in yeah. that. Yeah. The 890 as well as, like, all the, the bigger origin ships have this sort of arrangement of a single centre seat and two crew ones, whether they're at the front or at the back. They're all sort of that style. Mm -hmm. So it all plays together. Mm -hmm. And then, habs-wise, you kind of got the captain suite and you've yeah. got the, the crew suite. 
and you know within those they've got their own kind of lockers they've got their own kind of personal ship storage i'm not sure if it's exact but they're very similar in, in their kind of scale but obviously the captain gets the yeah. um, slightly more space a little bit more kind of luxury because you know he's he's the boss mm -hmm. yeah. so, yeah. a, at one point it was a, a four person ship and then we reduced it down to three so we've got that extra space for the oh, see i'm learning loads of stuff i didn't have that today <laughs> lots, yeah. lots of things changed during <laughs> yeah. the concept like Changing it from four to three might sound like a quick thing on paper, but then it's like you're losing a seat out the bridge somewhere. Uh, yeah, you it would have been lockers. You tough lose to fit an extra pods. seat in that bridge though, because it would have yeah. you would have had to have kind of had them two banks. So it would have been a bit yeah. Yeah, yeah, just just purely visual sort of. It feels a little bit nicer weighted if it's. If I mean, it's, the whole shape has a so it's a triangle. It looks fast. Yeah, yeah. 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 It looks fast. Yeah. And then, yeah, as you kind of progress through to the rear of the ship, um, this is where, like I say, originally it was... It was a party time. Yeah, it was the party room. Yeah, we've, we've kept some of the elements, I guess. You know, there, there's still a kitchen, a, a decent-sized yeah, kitchen. Yeah, it's still a nice space, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's like luxury. It's still yeah. that sort of luxury yacht. You've got your wine fridge. Kind of so, feel, isn't yeah. it? So, yeah. yeah. You've got yeah. everything you need back there. You've got your food making facilities. You've got your breakout area and then yeah. your big hollow table at the back. Yeah, the, and, the and that was sort of like the, um, I guess like the operations area. And we kind of, we, we tried to make that place feel like um, it was a little bit more focused with the, the hollow table than the sort of, you know, the, the breakfast bar that, that's just in front of it. And um, I think having, because we tried quite a few different ideas there as well, actually. I remember at one point we had like a war table with, with seating and stuff, but that was yeah. a bit tight for kind of maneuverability. Yeah. And also I think, um, it, we ended up going with like the standing kind of hollow table rather than a seating one because when you first kind of like look at it, it felt like an extension of the um, relaxation area rather than like a kind of planning, you know, what, what we're going to do in our operation type area. And then, yeah, basically that, that kind of covers most of the 400, I guess, as a, a whole. So we'll move from the 400 eye to something a bit bigger um, and something entirely new, which is the Anvil Liberator, which is Anvil's latest design spaceship, which is purely for transporting ships. So we wanted to do something properly uh, and sort of provide that entry level spaceship for that career. If you want to be a, a ship hauler, then this is the ship for you. It provides that good foundational base for it fairly regular sort of process on this one as Jared and I have chatted before you know these ships are often described as as births you know easy births hard births difficult births um, I think this one was a fast birth it's been a while since we've worked on some Anvil stuff so in terms of the lineup you know we have the Ballista the Terrapin the Hurricane the Valkyrie you know is probably more sort of you know it's one of those larger ships then we've got the Carrick yeah so a lot of work has already been done for those ships and we've got, um, you know, we've got the modular kits. So in terms of a concept process, uh, theoretically, it's, it's smoother sailing. And in terms of, you know, the, our process again, uh, you know, it's that, it's that investigation. And, you know, each manufacturer has a sort of a loose set of rules. I'll say it's loose because there's always space for us to sort of Slightly veer yeah. and slightly tweak the manufacturer. Well, I think, like you said earlier, like manufacturers yeah. change with time yeah. as well as they evolve. Yeah, it's not like every ship came out with the exact same date with the exact same manufacturing processes. It, it kind of all. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, I mean that's kind of what I like about Star Citizen is we've got this sort of it's this sort of rolling kind of like design. You know, it's sort of design everything is being updated. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's nice that you know we. When we work narrative and they're like, oh, well, actually, it's based on this old design. Yeah. Or whether it is, it's a new stuff. So, you know, one of the early requirements from John, which you can see here in this uh, fabulous des designer art. It's top quality design yeah, block. Yeah, yeah. I'm liking it. I'm not sure about that uh, shade of green, but <laughs> not quite anvil. But basically, this is super easy for us. And also, you know, because we're working with a contractor about sort of laying out the limits of... You know, because we always, you know, we like to make ships big, you know, um, so it's always, okay, we've got our metrics, it has to fit within this, like, whatever you do, make it cool, but it has to fit within these bounds. Yeah, so. it was quite strict on the landing pad size, but you need to fit a number of ships in it, 
but also make sure that it really kind of stayed within its, otherwise John will give us yeah, uh, big slap rests. I'll of, come after you. Yeah. Because um, on, on that image there, you can see there's the red box, which is the maximum bounds that the ship can be. If, if you go outside that, it literally won't fit through the hangar doors yeah. and ceiling. So obviously it has to be in there. And that's a max, not a goal to hit, because yeah. we've ended up in the past with ships that have a centimetre or two's clearance right, right. at the edge. Yeah. Carrick. 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 Uh, so when you're coming in and out of the hangar, you just clip, yeah. As soon as you clip one side of it, then it throws it into yeah. the other one. Yeah, um, it makes it difficult. And you can see there for the, the extra small landing pads, uh, the green size. So once you've got three of them, so at this point in the, the design brief, it was just three extra small ships. By the time you've got these three green, and they're actually, they have some Z height to them, which I didn't put in here. Um, mm -hmm. By the time you've got these green blocks, they're like, you've got to have space for these and you've also got to fit in this, then you sort of start funneling yourself into Yeah, and I shapes. think, I mean, you'd, you know, you provided a reference image right at the start, which is of military hovercraft. Yeah, the, the American, uh, I can't remember if it's the Navy or the Army. Yeah, and so that was like, uh, I, I mean, people will see straight away the, the correlation between the two and the sort of influence, but it, you know, it also makes sense, right? It's, it's a, very, a functionality. I'd say it's a very functional ship, isn't it? Yeah. So, and it feels like, like say, obviously, the real life version has been made for that function, and this this kind of follows suit. Yeah, definitely. And so, you know, we'll basically be looking at some of our exterior options. And again, it's always, you know, it's quite difficult when you have something like that that reference image yeah. of the military hovercraft because instantly it sits in your mind. Yeah. And you sort of get, um, you kind of get sort of stuck in that thinking, and so you know, part of my job is also to sort of push push the concept artists, and say, right, okay, well, what about this? What about that? I think you know, it's always a, you know, it's it's always a sort of a dual role. You know, we sort of you know, you work together, and kind of uh, two minds is always better than one, right? So in in this case, we're sort of looking at, you know, this is a sort of first first stab at it so there's a lot of similarity with the valkyrie so those are the valkyrie engines you know it's it's pretty standard it's just one one floor plate and it's symmetrical then we look at some cleaner stuff it's not you know it, it's a nice design but uh, it doesn't really speak of um anvil to me yeah. i mean but i you know it's cool. I like it. There's some, there's some interesting things. Certainly very hovercrafty. Yeah, yeah. I think just, just uh, too too simple. For, too wedgy. Yeah. This one was asymmetrical version. You know, we've got that massive tank on the side. What it does, I'm not quite sure at this point, but it's, you know, it's just visual exploration. We've got the asymmetrical wings. Again, in, you know, sort of interesting stuff. At this point, we're starting to push... Um, into like terrapin territory so we've got the sort of uh, essentially like the, the bridge and it's kind of like got a, a cowl it's like a sort of you know it's kind of like the little turtle head mm. from the terrapin and sort of mixing and matching and so you know it's kind of interesting again you know the, we're doing these things rapidly so you know has has some pros and cons design design wise well because obviously we have the x y metric but you also have the z so a lot of our hangar metrics are quite tall um, mm. So the, the problem with this one was it was just to the height of the ship. I, the actual yeah. actual height it would have needed to be would have been double that. So then you end up with this really tall, gangly yeah. thing yeah. because we've also shortened it by a third. So I like you trying to get yourself into like the shape of a ship. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. tall. Yeah. <laughs> and then here is like um, where we sort of start hitting upon something that um, I don't know where the decision was made, but you know it made sense to have the garages. Yeah. on that lower deck. Mm -hmm. Here, you know, you've got two tanks lying side by side, which, it, you know, is cool, it looks good, but it isn't actually like an official feature. Yeah. At, it was around this point where we, we were looking at the, the double layer thing uh, and trying to get these two layers to work or two floors to work with the three larger ships. So we changed it from the three extra small pads to two extra small pads, which basically take any single seat fighter in the game and somewhere else, so I think a prospector also fits on there. Yeah. And yeah. then we scaled the, the front one down to an extra, extra small, so mm -hmm. that's things like the, the Argo MPUV, uh, Origin 85X, 
uh, and smaller flying ships like that. But also, interestingly, that extra, extra small metric is sort of the same as the medium vehicle metric. There's, there's like a meter difference yeah. in height, which is the ballista and Nova. So we went from these three extra smalls uh, to two extra smalls on top, one extra, extra small at the front, and then these two garage slots, which can also, if you're willing to try and fly your small ship in there. You yeah, you were playing around. You could fit quite a few combinations yeah. of yeah. ships I mean, in I there. I mean, I had you? a shot. Yeah. I treated it like I was a fan and basically just and basically filled that whole carriage. There was no uh, sort of like door opening space at all. It was yeah, yeah. yeah it was the uh, cyclones and we know what the players DS's. are like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it looked good. I mean, it looked like um, you know, it looked like a ferry. You know, when they're just full of the vehicles all just stacked up. Um, just increases like the risk value of flying it, doesn't it? Like if you've, you know, <laughs> yeah. you've got three ships on it, all right. Yeah, you've got fifteen. And need a big insurance yeah. and payout. So uh, you know, once we have the you know an exterior that we were happy with, then it's you know then we move on to the interior, and you know it's only two crew. Yep. So it's it's two crew. Uh, you have obviously the, the person flying the thing, uh, and then the the second person who can either it, sort of a flexible role. There there is a turret that they can control. Mm -hmm. They can go sit in it and uh, shoot anything that comes at you, but it's not really a ship that's a combat ship. It's mm. it's a transporter ship. If you want protection, you need to bring protection with you or rely on the ships that you're carrying to provide that protection, which mm. is another benefit of this open-topped yeah. ship. Is yeah, you, can just you come under launch. attack, yeah. Yeah. everyone can launch out straight away. You're not having to fly your ships out one by one out of a tube. They, they can get off pretty quickly. We haven't done launch tubes yet, have we? One day. One day. One day, one day we do launch tubes. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I think about that. Um, so, yeah, basically we've moved on to interiors. Again, it's, uh, it's just investigation of, um, you know, we've got our function and what it needs to achieve. But, you know, in the last what, two, four years, definitely the last two years, like our process has just been a lot, a lot stronger in terms of player flow. So there's no more of the Starfarer. Uh, uh, Higgledy Piggledy mystery tour. I mean, that was our first yeah. multi crew ship, so the yeah. pipeline wasn't in place. I, I mean, spaceships, interiors was like, I don't know. So, I mean, there's been a lot of learning going on, and so now it's like, okay, if I'm a player, what, what, what experience do I want? Yeah. Like, how do I get from A to B? I don't want to do A to G to H to get to B. Yeah. None of that business. So, so as we look at these, um, uh, interiors we just sort of looked at sort of different flow basically different ideas so um, it feels quite good and we sort of worked on again just flow so if you're in the garage you can easily get from the garage into into the living quarters um, you know the elevators just run the full height it's one for crew one for passengers so if you're under the ship you can just easily get up and down and so uh, the whole process is a lot more streamlined um, and there's even like even if you're in that top in those top rooms um, you know and like it's you know there's a call to action you've all got to get out we've even put a nice little set of stairs that just run down the side of the yeah. ramp and so you can just pipe you know run down get in your whatever it is whatever vehicle <laughs> and then off you go so a lot of I feel like a lot of thought was given to just like and, improve. And I think it's really nice as well the fact that you've got, like, say that that passenger section kind of sectioned off, and they're always ready. But then, like, say you were saying about like, the bows of the ship and how that's that sort of all that technical stuff's like hidden at the the bottom, and that that feels nice that that's crew only and and yeah, you because know, you don't want passengers. Just, yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Just definitely milling around. And then moving on to you can see here the garage space and where the cargo is stored so originally that the cargo was going to essentially take up one yeah, of the garage spaces it was going to be a, a a compromise choice that the players could make of that the cargo is stacked down either down the middle of the, the the lower garage or across like one of the pads so you could choose uh but then decide to uh well we had a bit of space well yeah, had a bit basically of space to fill. Uh, the concept guy when I went rogue I was like, oh, what about this? This is cool. And we were like, right. 
Yeah, yeah, it does look cool, yeah. Yeah, he's like, all right, John, can we have this? Coming yeah. to a meeting. Oh, I've just done, gone away and done this, uh, this, this thing that we're not going to talk about, but it's, it's turned <laughs> yeah. into the cargo storage room. So yes, it's, yeah. It's a, a good sort of save. Of <laughs> well, we want, I mean, you know, for me as an art director, I want, you know, I want my team to feel like they can take those little forays off if they want, if they've got a good idea. Um, and you know, luckily this time it's yeah. it's panned out, yeah. and makes good use of the space. I mean, because like I said, the ship is it is quite big. So then we get to the fun part, which is when we get onto promo. Uh, I think it's everyone's favourite part involved with this sort of stuff, and that is really sort of I call it selling the dream. So it's um, you know you're really sort of honing in into what a player's experience might be. Um, and I, I love doing this sort of stuff as well. So, um, so here we've got you know a fully loaded carrier. It's the the uh, core of what that ship is for, like you have these these smaller carry, carrier borne ships, is what Chris likes to call them. Like they're they're not deep space fighters. They can't go long distances by themselves. They they need to be from a, a parent ship. So the the Liberator is unless you suddenly got an Idris to carry things to with this is you. this yeah, is yeah. this is what you're going to see going through these wide and long star systems like pyro is incredibly large compared to stanton and stanton's already quite big to go from one side to the other so we really need these ships to help you lug all your stuff mm. from point a to point b yeah. because if you do it in your in your hornet that's going to be i don't know 50 100 little stops where are you cram it in one of these and send it on its way. It's going to be a much better experience for everyone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm, I think this is going to be, a, like I say, a fun one to kind of get onto. Yeah, yeah, I think your team's going to like that. That's pretty much it for the Anvil Liberator. Um, ship transporter at its core, two-man crew, designed for, for hauling three spaceships and some ground vehicles uh, long distance. Uh, mm. Very cool. Let's let's talk about the Banu Merchantman then. It's that that ship that's been around for for a long time. For a long time now. I think fans have been waiting quite a while for this. Yeah, from... we we haven't really shown a, a huge amount of it beyond those original concept images. So no, and I think um, you know this is my second round on this. So I think maybe like three years ago we did a we did an initial concept yeah. round. Around the time of the Defender, I guess. We, we I can't that. actually remember. So long ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But sure, let's, um, I think fans are going to love this. So there's a few things that need to be updated for the Merchantman. Uh, obviously, we've talked about this many times in the past. Uh, as Star Citizen develops, things get added, uh, things get refined, we, we improve our, our workflow. So number one thing we had to do was look at the size and the scale of the ship because I think it was... It was 160 meters wide and 160 meters long, so it's in essence a cube. Yeah, uh, but mm -hmm. it's a very tall ship as well. Yeah, it? but yeah. it was it was very vague because we had never done a full interior layout, so not not to like the new system. No. Yeah, so we need to make sure it fit everything in. So it was a good starting point. Um, the cargo numbers were they've never really been changed since they were originally concepted as freight units, not standard cargo units. So mm -hmm. The scale of cargo has changed since we did it originally. I don't remember freight units. Yeah. It, was, it was yeah. It's a long, my long time. time ago. The marketplace slash bazaar yeah. uh, needs to have a good working out. And then lastly, uh, we wanted to have some synergy between the defender and the merchantman. So we we found a way to get a defender hangar on board. So that obviously has big consequences for the ship. So let's talk about the exterior. I guess the thinking about it, it seems so seems so long ago since I started on this, um, but the addition of the the defender to the ship basically had the biggest impact in a way, like just because because the defender is not a slim ship, is it? No, it's, it's deceptively yeah. big to me. Like the defender, I always think in my head that it's this tiny little yeah. thing, but it's, in fly it's, mode, it's quite slim. Yeah, but and then when it's landed, it's got this sort of you know big stance. Yeah. So um, this has been, uh, I, th I, can't, I think I've probably been on this for maybe a year, something like that now. 
Um, and I said before, you know, we, we did an initial round of concept work and it was sort of done more in isolation. So we didn't really have uh, a full interior. We sort of treated it more as, OK, we need a corridor. We need a, an idea of a marketplace. We need an idea of a bridge. Um, and, you know, we'll kind of sort of uh, piece them together. And so that was maybe like three years ago, something like that. Obviously, process has changed, you know, as we've discussed today. It's more about the player experience and the flow and things making sense, less less rule of cool. If we, we still have the coolness, we want it to work right. Yeah. You don't want it to be frustrating. Uh, I, think, I think when when you kind of do it, like, obviously, this big ship, so you think, oh, yeah, you know, we can make whatever room this size and it'll be, it'll be fine, but that kind of always sets us up for just a lot more headaches when it comes to, to our side. So by you spending the time to actually like fully flesh out the interior, it just saves us so much time when we come to actually yeah, do the production yeah, side of it. Definitely. Kind of takes all that risk away from us and puts it up front onto, onto you, basically. Yeah. So thanks, Paul. Yeah. 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 You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, we've tried. We've tried hard. I mean, you can see here that, you know, the ship did have to scale up. Yeah. We talked about earlier, we have those, those hangar metrics and scaled up it now doesn't fit doesn't fit the hangar yeah, so we'll, we'll get to the i think we'll get to the solution in a little bit yeah and just a quick shot of the front and you can actually see that from the front it hasn't actually changed that much you know it's grown a little bit in height but you know gained a little bit of body mass but overall pretty pretty similar i mean we've you know sort of you know the ethos of this whole thing is you know the ship was really cool mm. anyway like Everybody really liked the ship, so it wasn't that we wanted to change it just for change's sake. It was just we need to make it work. We do need to advance it. Um, and so between myself, concept artist Mike Oberschneider and Mark Gibson, um, one of the CIG's designers, we've, we've basically met twice a week, every week for months. And basically gone through the ship from top to bottom, inside to out. Yeah, um, there's a huge amount of ship. To, yeah, to yeah. With. And, yeah. It, it, you know, hands down, this has been the most difficult and hardest ship to date. Like, um, I went, I've not had a nervous breakdown. Actually, you know, the, the whole process has been quite nice in a way, um, but it's just been long. It's the long, it's the... I think this is the one that, like... It's a marathon. To, to begin with, I was really scared. And then the, the kind of like the closer you've kind of got to finishing your work, the kind of like the less scared I'm getting and the more excited I'm getting. <laughs> and I'll probably have, when we get into production, I'll be like, oh no, what are we going to do? And then, it'll, then again, once we kind of start, actually kind of get over that hurdle, because it is, it is a, it's quite an intimidating ship. Not, not like just visually, but, but like. Yeah. The, the, you know. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, we're seeing here the sort of hangar opening. Mm -hmm. um, so basically we've, you know, the one of the sort of, design philosophies of the Banu um, ships is they they sort of incorporate tech where it suits them. So they use tech from humans, they use tech from Xi'an, um, whatever suits them to sort of achieve what their needs are. So for this ship, we've leveraged a lot of Xi'an tech. So it's a lot of that um, essentially levitation tech. So stuff doesn't have to be physically connected to move. Sort of, it sort of hovers and then, and then shifts along. So it's it's basically given us a lot of opportunity for creativity. So hanger here, you know, it's always multi-part as well. So it's always mm. kind of nice. Basically shot from the front. This is with the the front guns out, which are S eight. That's yeah, correct. Big, is it? big size eight guns. One of the the original core cool things of the the match was all its weapons are sort of tucked away and and hidden. So it yes. gives you that non-threatening aura to start with. And when it needs to, then Everything. I was going to say, it's going to be quite off. a powerhouse, really, isn't it? Like, yeah. You know, yeah. With its, its guns and its turrets. It's a proper, it's... and it's a proper transformer, this ship. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's probably no area that doesn't transform almost, especially on the exterior. And again, you know, like John said, it's just to keep with that kind of like, oh, well, you know. Just a friendly trader. Yeah, just a yeah, friendly trader. Peaceful. Don't worry about me, just yeah. going on my business. And then suddenly everything just pops out and, and it's all business. So. Again, sort of multi-stage animation for the guns. Again, for the turret. Um, I mean, the turret featured in the original. Um, you know, there was a hidden... It was never map. really fully explained. No, was, no. There was a, a turret, a man turret there that you could get in 
and defend with, and it was in that top fin, I guess. You yeah, call it. and when when you know when the weaponry is unmanned, it's a lot easier. We can get away with a lot smaller spaces. Once you put a person in it, then it's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah, and just the player experience, and it's it's a uh, you know twin twin gun. Twin, yeah, twin S <laughs> yeah. five. So it's not giving you a little tickle. It's uh, yeah. quite a big punch. <laughs> yeah. and even though it's only a, a yeah, you know, a, a turret, a gunner. You you still got to kind of take all the consideration you're taking in a like a pilot seat in terms of their visibility and, and everything else. And, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. And, and yes, you know, you you expect to see the big guns and the silhouette and get that kind of like the real feel of, of being in a gunner seat. But it, like I say, it's it's quite easy for it to just kind of grow in complexity quite yes. quickly. Yeah. Um, so I mean, basically, we've you know we've used the GM tech again to help us sort of reveal the turret. Also to elevate the turret, um, still, you know, we've, we've had we've got multiple ideas for that, so I think we'll just have to figure that out a little further on. And then we have these, I mean, these these guns look tiny. In yeah, don't they? they're, they're still they size. Like so these these are guns that most fighters have equipped to them, but they're on these um, point defense turrets. So obviously, the ship was big to start with. It's bigger now. It's more of a target for missiles and torpedoes and. One of the best ways we have in game to counter those is these automated point defense turrets. So, Bano again, well, humans have these phalanx style guns that shoot down incoming threats. We'll, we'll take that and we'll use our own guns. Uh, so, there's, it's got four of these on the hull. So, there's two on top near the bridge, and then I think we see uh, the other two uh, underneath. Uh, so, you've sort of got your, your 360 degrees protection from, from missiles mm. from those. And then there's a, an additional pair of size four remote turrets under the wings. Uh, these are controlled from the bridge. Uh, the bridge crew mentioned them. So, yeah, it's, it's not lacking on. Not lacking on. The, the thing is, it, it can carry a fair amount of cargo, and and you know it's got its own trading floor. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. your livelihood. Yeah, yeah, you kind of need to make sure that. I mean, you basically, can that. yeah. There's a. It's it's a bit of a TARDIS. It's a bit of a. Mm. You know, yeah. There's a. As people will see, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff that we've squeezed into this compared to the first one. So there's always been this feature on the on the Banu, it was there on the original, but it never really had a function. You know, some people called it the paddle, some people call it the flipper. But Chris was like, okay, it needs it needs a reason yeah. to be yeah. in there. It, it is very dominant. Yeah. In the yeah. Isn't it? So I, I, but, I'll always remember that one bit of Defender concept art where it's just there, just destroying a mountain. <laughs> it flies over, just dragging it through. So we've, um, you know, it's it's a multifunction essentially because um, one of the difficulties was is, uh, at the top of that flipper, fuel scoop, sorry, um, is basically the entrance to the marketplace for traders and the public. So it was, you know, there's that challenge of what it needs to look uh, you know, it needs to do its job, but it also needs to look visually appealing because it's going to be the entrance. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, and we'll see that a little in a second. Um, but it was, yeah, it was always it was always a bit of a tricky thing to solve. And so, you know, again, we're seeing here the, as John mentioned earlier, the ship got wider and didn't yeah. actually fit on a landing pad, which, which meant we had no hangers that it would officially fit in. We yeah, could, could only ever officially land at docking stations with docking yeah. ports or on a planet's surface, which is, you're, as a trader, you're missing out on Living. all the places you could land to, to do trading. So we had to find a, a, solution. a solution. I mean, the funny thing is, this is, this is, the, mo this is the simplest of the, of, the, um, of the solutions that we came up with. I mean, there's probably like 10 others that we did. Some of them were super crazy, you know, part, you know, parts just folding back on each other and all sorts of things. So, but, in the end, I think I mean simplicity wins out. I mean, it's it's it, they're not small bits of wing to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of. I mean, there's gaps it? here, and we you know we haven't got the mesh in there, yeah. but there will be. We'll we'll work it out for you, Ben. Yeah. So you can see here, this is basically a shot of what is the fuel scoop, but it transforms again and becomes this pathway to the marketplace. So you'll have this basically wide this experience again. It's kind of the red carpet treatment. You're walking up into the marketplace. It's not in this image, but you know we will have, or hopefully, um, we'll have like soft like awnings, basically that will sort of come out as well. And so I'll have that sort of marketplace. It, it, I think 
for me, this, this is one of the ships that really excites me because um, it is very different to, you know, yeah. not all the, a lot of the ships that we've kind of we've done. Um, and I think that sort of like initial experience, like you say, of seeing this thing kind of like come and land down, and and the trade is kind of inviting you in and, and entering into, you know, it's it's very other world worldly, yeah. kind of entering up that walking yeah. up those steps out of you know, one of our kind of space station like you know, our human space stations oh absolutely so i think it's really kind of really exciting to kind of i mean the idea is experience. that as you go up those stairs you'll have you know holographic visuals of products that are in the marketplace yeah. and so they will sort of pop up and just be spinning so you'll have like it's again it's just that sort of shopping experience and mm. it's like oh okay i can get that and get that or maybe even artifacts that the traders picked up um I mean, you've got options basically. So. Yeah. Um, and then also the cargo that yeah, changed. Car didn't cargo it? is a big uh, <laughs> topic. Um, it was one of those things in the the original concept. Even digging out the original design brief was wasn't particularly clear on was the cargo bay internal, was it external, was it uh, yeah, and it, and was we, it a walkable space? And we kept yeah. it external for yeah. the first half of this yeah. development, and mm. and then uh, during a meeting where I think. A bunch of us in there with Chris, and we were all like, "Oh no, it's internal." And then someone else was like, "Oh no, it's external." And, and we just decided, like, let's make it enclosed. Um, we'll keep the the styling of how it was in the original concept, so you have that sort of, to how you want to call it, shuttering or on the outside. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm struggling to actually remember it now because I'm kind of like yeah. not locked into this one. But okay. it was more that it was it was you saw the cargo crates, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, they were exposed. Yeah, 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 they were they were exposed. Certainly from underneath, you could see them all. Yeah, they were tops top mounted, and you, they could all drop down. But that caused huge problems with the entrance case, where if they could all drop down at the same time, then you couldn't get in the ship to start with. So we did have a solution, but yeah. this is definitely better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now it's now it's enclosed. You just have one way of dropping at the front. And then we'll see later how it's all managed inside. So you just have you can have the front ramp open and cargo coming up and down. Mm -hmm. The two the two systems are not interfering with each other. Mm -hmm. and yeah, your cargo thing. is more protected as well. Yeah, and that's kind of I guess a key element of it, isn't it? Is is you know not only having the um, like footfall into your your marketplace, but these big trade items you're going to need to deliver them. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. So we're going to move on to, um, so we've been looking at sort of uh, sort of functional images of, you know, basically explaining um, how we've been dealing with design decisions and how that's affected art. And so now we move on to the sort of the sexy stuff of looking at how we've taken the sort of the existing Banu materials, you know, from the early Merchantmen, which uh, there was a lot of good stuff on that, and then just progressing it a little bit further. And, you know, again, this is still probably, you know, this is subject to change still, you know, it's, it's previs, but in terms of where it's heading, you know, it's really quite exciting. And so, um, you know, not everything is modeled in this. So, you know, there the probably will be more folds in the metal, mm -hmm. kind of like there is on the Defender. Where, yeah. You know, you yeah. If you look at the concept images versus where it all ends up pivoting on those those arms, yeah. and there's a lot more detail. There's a lot added. more, yeah, there's a lot more sort of intricate sort of folding of the metal. And so we're just kind of like working in, we're kind of sort of turning it into more, it, it is more ornate, it's more of a sort of, uh, a, a sort of special item, essentially, um, and sort of really trying to sort of get that impression. So, you know, we're layering in the gold, we're layering in the sort of all the sort of, um, sort of Art Nouveau line work, sort of with a sort of Banu influence. You know, we're looking at sort of taking um, sort of uh, materials like opal or whatever the Star Citizen equivalent is of that, and also integrating that into the ship. So it really is sort of a display of wealth. It's yeah. like if you've got this, like, you you're loaded. <laughs> <laughs> it's the crown jewel of your fleet. It is so. Uh, you know, I think it. You know, it, it's it's going to some really nice places, and so you know, we're looking at this heavy bruiser of a turret, um, and this is still work in progress. You know, ideally there would be more work to do with this, and so we'd get more of the sort of 
um, curvature in the in the metalwork and stuff. But because we're on a you know because of time scale and stuff, we've got to make some compromises. But um, we'll pass that information on. To yeah, you yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll get a, have a good kick off on this one. I like the tarot on this one. Yeah. It's good. So that's the exterior. Um, we'll move on to the interior. Um, Yes, we'll go over how it was, uh, mm -hmm. how it is, and then we'll go on a magical mystery tour through the interior. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So um, it was uh, a lot simpler, wasn't it? Yeah. Back in the day, it was pre pre metric, so we didn't have all the requirements in place. Yeah, no components. No components. The marketplace is a lot simpler in here, and so with with. Banu Merchant Men 2.0, or in my head, it's 3.0. Um, you know, we basically moved on to a, a fully upgraded interior roll drum, and so you can see from this cutaway. And it's kind of hard to show uh, all the pathways in this ship. We, we and I'm, I feel like I'm banging this drum, but again, we did a lot of work on pathways and navigation, and so you can. You know, as a trader, you're locked off to a certain route. As a crew, you, you, you've got access to everywhere. But as a trader, you're like, okay, well, you've got these areas you can get to. You can come in from a docking collar, and there's two different docking collars. You know, there's the, there's the larger ship one on one ship side and the ship to station. Yeah. And then that funnels you into the marketplace. And then you can go back down through the flipper or vice versa, the fuel scoop. And so, you know, in terms of what's changed, you know, we've, you know, just we've had to create space for the cargo of, you know, the hangar for the Defender. That was a massive one. So a lot of just shifting, just shifting the internals around. Um, you know, there's two elevators in this. There's one for crew. There's one for traders. Again, just I, think, I think that kind of like builds on the experience of, of someone coming to buy stuff there, though, and... To, to me, that's kind of like part of the, the lure of the ship is that, you know, like I say, the, the crew have their own everything yeah. itself, but yeah, the, yeah. The, the kind of like the people that are coming to spend money, that experience is like the, the kind of like one of the core elements of that ship. That's what makes it kind so, of so yeah, special. A different experience to yeah. coming on board it that way versus living on board it and yeah, totally. working on board. And so we'll see here that these are like previous images. These are straight straight out of 3D Studio Max with a bit of Photoshop magic. But it's just giving you an idea of that going up the fuel scoop or the or the market entrance, you know, you'll have the you'll have the awnings all folded out. It should be a real grand grand experience. Will we have red card? I, I, I kind of like I don't know why in my, in my head it's like Aladdin's cave. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that, totally. That's what it kind of. And we've got we had some reference images as well. Oh, okay. For the marketplace, and so you, here you basically you've walked up, and you're you're again. This is always in this concept uh, theory has always been this tree of life essentially. So basically you enter at the base of the tree, and then it forms the spine, and then that tree branches out and basically reaches to the front of the ship. Mm. That's the theory. Like, yeah. It's always been this organic it's theory. The same in the Defender. You, you come in the Defender up the ramp. Yes. And then you have that big central tree yeah. which houses components and then that stretches out and back around to form. So the, the line work in this is is a little more sort of refined. Into it's, It has gone less organic um, compared to the Defender. Kind of gone for a slightly less alien feeling. Yeah. Just to... Like, like doesn't... Feel like it's actually a tree that has grown yeah. and they build the ship around yeah. this kind of organic thing it is a ship yeah absolutely and so here um, is a capture from 3d studio max just so it's super clear like this is where this is the lower lower floor so the marketplace is split into two floors eight shops on each floor yeah or is it no sorry eight, uh, four eight, shops four on shops each floor. eight total um and then you have this little walkway that sort of goes over the top you can kind of see here obviously we've got a flying jellyfish <laughs> but the theory is that that'll be a holographic display and you know hopefully the captain can choose what's on there yeah. it's been a special know. offer for the day could be special offer could show a weapon could just could just have like butterflies flying around whatever but this really gives you a vibe of um you know the complexity of the the banu sort of folded metal that organicness 
and sort of just that overall experience. The headaches that you're going to cause me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And that yeah, Aladdin's cave. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've got the little jewels hanging yeah. off the. All I really, I really like those, like the, the kind of like the treatment of light in a lot of concerts. I don't, I don't know, stealing your thunder from no, future fine, thing. Yeah. yeah, but the the sort of. Um, you know, these, these jewels and stones that are kind of going to be used as light source throughout the ship, and I think that's kind of like very really nice. Yeah. Just, just like a bit different, different and, and it, yeah, fluorescent tube, yeah, LED think. lights, or yeah. Something. And so we really sort of pushed on that on this one, and so here is like, in there's basically as part of the tree of life in the in the marketplace is the elevator shaft, and so mm. you can then go up there into the negotiation mm, yes. room, which was in the original one of the the. Images that everyone remembers from yes. the, the original concept was that room with the table and yeah. looking out over the cargo. And so we've kind of kept that, and we'll come to that in a second. But before you get there, you come out of the elevator and you're sort of in a in a central corridor, which also leads to guests' habitation rooms. Yeah. In law, these trades often take a, a long amount of time. So there's, there was a lot of down. back and forth with the, the narrative team on this ship in particular with... How, how do Banu trade? How, how do they eat? How do they... Because for the Defender, it was sort of very small scale. Mm -hmm, this, mm -hmm. It's long duration. Um, so it's the, these trades can take days, weeks, well, or maybe months. So the, the people that are coming on board to trade need a place to stay yeah. whilst... And, and it's not like, like you know, the people that are going to be kind of flying this, they, they don't have a... Well, it might have, they have like a base of operations. Like, this is their, their home. This is their home. Yeah. So... You know, like you say, if, if you're trading your, I guess some of these things could be their livelihood. They're, they're you know, they're trying to trading these really expensive high end items, and that's kind of. And you want them to feel special, like yeah. you know, the the thing about this always has been that you know making making the people feel you know that they're in something quite unique, and so you can see here, you know, in this image we've got massive gemstones. They could be whatever, but you know, in terms of lighting opportunities, you'll have mm -hmm. the, the core sticks and the light. You know, if they're rotating, there's a lot of cool opportunities. And so here is the the conference room, which we just mentioned. In the original concept, it was smaller, a lot more compact. But obviously, the ship has got bigger, and therefore we've got more space. But also, it's it's a display of wealth, right? If you can afford to waste a bit of space, essentially, you know, if you could be like, you know. I don't need to pack it with everything, you know, just got to make this nice uh, player experience where everyone feels sort of relaxed. And so that's kind of what we've been pushing with. So there's a lot of there's a lot of commonality that we've taken from the original and fed into this, but then also pushing pushing further. So again, you can see the sort of like carved gemstones inlaid inlaid with more gemstones, inlaid with gold, and so Again, you know, in terms of player experience, it's going to be totally different yeah. to anything yeah. that's happened. And we've still kept that viewpoint looking into the into the hangar. So, the cargo bay. Sorry, into the cargo bay. And so, yeah, it's it's been quite a tussle trying to trying to get everything into place. And then this is an example of um, one of the one of the hubs for like if you if you want to do, if you're doing long term trading. And this is uh, really sort of based on, again, keeping with the organic theme, the, the Banu shapes, but pushing in a slightly different palette and materials. And so it's kind of based off of the interior of a Nautilus shell. Um, and so you can't really tell from here, but actually it circles back on itself. So there's a, a little internal wall there that you go behind and that's where um, toilet and yeah. shower and all that sort of stuff is. And then you've got the bed in the back and then you've got lockers and little seating area so you kind of like a real sort of organic journey so again just pushing on um, leveraging that Xi'an tech as well so the chairs and the desk and even the lights sort of are just sort of held yeah, held in space yeah. so yeah. Um, quite different quite different and so that's that's where the traders go but yeah. the crew obviously has got access to the full ship and so slightly less grandiose, but not. Yeah. So the docking cargo, um, that, that, that docking corridor is is still quite elaborate. But that's going to be shared between. Yeah, yeah, it's more of a shared space. There's some more technical elements in there in terms of venting and stuff, and we still want to 
you know, this has always been a theory of you've got your superstructure, then you've got your tech, and then you've got your layering of um, the bodywork, the yeah. cladding, yeah. yeah, and then you know there'll be there'll be areas where the sort of tech is revealed and stuff, and so um, by balancing those two, the proportions, you sort of you can kind of like alter the, the feel of the space, and so I mean it's going to be a it's going to be a journey for you guys yeah. of like how you know how we achieve all this, but this is the corridor leading to the uh, marketplace from the docking area, and so you've got that great big green ring, which kind of sort of you know it, that we kind of put there that there and kind of thinking of it shows green when it's safe. Yeah, you know the docking, you know, yeah. it's not some kind of a yeah, vintage you, going on. Yeah, I was having this conversation with the team this week actually about that exact thing about kind of uh, communicating to the player, but not in just a you know as simple as something flashing on a screen or, or whatever else, but right. just having something a little bit a little bit more elegant. So I think again, this will give you some really good opportunities, and again, it's just uh, the new materials, the folds, um, and you know, moving on to the habitation section where sort of crew can go, you know. People who are familiar with the Defender will really sort of see the sort of common common thread here. So, you know, the amount of gold and shiny stuff, <laughs> to put it bluntly, is reduced. And so it goes to more matte materials. You know, it's a little less display of wealth. It's a little more functional, but still got that 3D printing. You get a lot of, of that sort of like layering in here as well, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. That's In the middle is the, what do we call it? The magic tagine. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. so it's fed from underneath, and you you know you choose what you want, and then it appears, and the top comes off, and you get your food out, yeah. and you get your cutlery. Um, you can speak to narrative for a while about sort of how our aliens eat. It's, it's, <laughs> that could be a whole talk in itself. I feel it's, it's a tricky one because it's a it's a navy and it's a Banu ship, but it's got to support humans yes. operating yeah. it. Um, if you had an entirely Banu crew, if you were playing as a Banu, then. Some aspects of this you don't need, but as, yes. as humans, yeah, you the, do, the, the so banner will cater for both, yeah. don't they? Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of complex stuff to sort of get our heads around. Engineering, this is a work in progress shot. It's one of my favourite bits. Though. Yeah, I really like this. And you can't really tell from this shot, but it's essentially set over three levels. But you've got that main middle level, and you can sort of get on mini lifts to drop down to components or walk up the stairs to some elevated stuff but essentially this is leading to the main central engine and that is like sort of counter rotating all those elements and so you get this awesome um, shadow play basically going on in the room like really sort of cinematic it looks extremely cool in, in motion just and if we can tie it to either de was it were you talking about whether tying it to damage or the state of the it sounds the like engine. a good idea, so I'm going to say yes. So, you yeah. know, if the engine's <laughs> malfunctioning and it's sort of slowing yeah. down and stuff, that would be kind of cool. I'll, I'll, take, I'll claim that one. Okay, yeah. yeah I'm not yeah. sure it was. But <laughs> and then, you know, in, in terms of the, the cargo space, what we're looking at here is like the 32 SCU sort of cargo yeah, these, these are the, the big cargo containers that you see in all the, the rest stops and the cargo decks. These yeah. are those, like, the modern-day big shipping cargo containers. shipping containers. Yeah. There. yeah. They're quite hefty, and you can't, you certainly can't pick them up by yourself, and you can't really do it with handheld tractor beams. So you need something big. Yes, and so we've got we've got a hefty um, a moving mechanism in there at the moment, which you can control from this position that you can see in this, in the screenshot. Um, and so that'll be something else to work out, Ben. Um, but it's like how to work out, John. <laughs> but you know, it will be a really cool area, and sort of just below you, that's basically where the sort of the loading platform is. Yeah, because it moves the the cargo containers into that space, yes, and then that and space then kind of down. drops down, doesn't yes. it? Yeah. So there will be that sort of like, oh, I need the bottom one on the third yes. stack. All oh, right, okay, yes. let's let's shift everything out, and there yeah. is that sort of mini game of Jenga almost with mm. how stuff is going to how you're going to access stuff. Yeah. And all the time you'll be able to see from the negotiation room the, into the poor the... guy moving it around, just <laughs> yeah. to yeah. mess it up. Um, but yeah, as, as a result of all those changes, the the cargo capacity has gone down a little. I think it was it was a nebulous number to start with mm. that had never really been proved still out. It's big. still big. So yeah. it's, it's around two thousand eight hundred, 
uh, which is not a small amount of cargo by any means. Yeah. Um, so it's still well above most ships, but until you get to the whole series, you. I was going to say, yeah. what, I can't remember what a whole series. The, the hull is over 3,000, so it's... Well, but still, it's, still, yeah. It's a lot, um, but it's maybe not quite as much as people were hoping for originally. Although I think... It looks maybe, pretty, though. It does. A yeah. loss of cargo, but you're gaining so much more. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's always a give and take with these things of we, we could make every ship do everything, but then <laughs> they just become yeah. these humongous vessels. Um, yeah. So it's a... It's always a trade. So moving now up to the bridge area. And what we're looking at here is very much work in progress. I mean, we are literally working on this right now in the sort of top left, I had to think then, is um, an image that we created sort of on round two. And we're, and we're sort of leveraging, leveraging that heavily. So a lot, of, a lot of those shapes will appear into this new stuff. But in this new sort of configuration, you're able to access the bridge, but you're also able to access the remote, not the, the man turret. It's more of an experience. And then also you've got side corridors, which leads you to... Oh, it's got a special name, though. It's like a med It's not a meditation room. I can't remember the name oh, of it. There was a, a approved name, wasn't there? Yeah. I can't think what it is. Um, it's kind of like a sort of sacred space. Um, where sort of the Banu can sort of pay, you know, we've kind of got sort of equivalent of prayer wheels. That's kind of the theory. So it's like this little, this little nice little calm space. Um, so that's been quite fun. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the areas on this on this ship are very sort of multi-threaded. Mm -hmm. You know, you often have your central area and then stuff coming off it. Um, so like I said, there's been a lot of a lot of thought given to navigation and in this area also are two two lifts which also can take you quickly to other areas mm. from this bridge it's a an eight person crew now um so there's space for four on the bridge obviously there's there's four uh, stations there uh, you have one person that can go to the the manned turrets towards the rear one person that can fly the defender and that leaves two to to deal with everything else whilst you're flying around because you, you can still trade whilst flying around, but it's probably not the the wisest of ideas if the person who's come on board to trade has left their ship behind. So, it's, I, I mean, it might I, be good for negotiations. Yeah, good for negotiations. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the eight crew can then fill the eight shops if you're just landed on a planet somewhere. You, mm -hmm. you, sort of, you pull double G. You don't need, obviously don't need to be flying if you landed. You can menu shop or you can let one person do, do double duty in shops. Yep, yep. This is a um, an example, well, a full size image of uh, that round two concept of of the bridge, and again, you can see the sort of the superstructure that's and all the layering basically. So you know, you know, we have changed the configuration since this image, um, but a lot of a lot of that theory is going to get transposed onto this new one. Same with the materials, and again, just continuing with that flow of from from back to front basically always sort of this tree of life and going to the nose of the yeah. ship by the time people see this we will have actually we will have. actually had someone start yeah, yeah that's true start working on it yeah. so it's actually in production now after after all these years yeah, yeah it's gonna um, be good so. this is actually one of the ships that i'm really excited about kind yeah. of playing with in game um it, it's just such a kind of like i say it's got that kind of uh full trading experience but it feels like a proper home that you can can live on and it's got a load of weaponry as well which yeah yeah, yeah. if in doubt then just yeah get the guns out yeah you will buy it <laughs> yes yeah. so that was the merchantman pretty cool uh looking forward to seeing that go into production yeah, uh, go through production because it's by the time people see it it will be in production yep yep So to close our, our talk out, I uh, thought we would revisit the, the idea that we had the last time we, we did one of these panels. We showed some concept ships or some ideas for concept ships mm -hmm. and talked about it and everyone voted for them. Obviously, as this is pre-recorded segment, we can't interact with the crowd and uh, get a feel mm. of that. So Fight amongst ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Arm wrestle for which one we do. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. 
No. Um, so <laughs> it's not a good time. At the end, Jared will uh, explain how you can sort of vote or express your preference for what we show today, uh, and we will see what comes of that. But first, let's go over what we did last time. So we had this ground mining vehicle concept. We had the uh, Xi'an small cargo. We had the Tavaran light fighter. Uh, people may recognize a sort of a pattern emerging here. <laughs> Uh, and then a small refinery ship. So let's see what's happened to those over the last few years. So that small ground miner turned into the Grey Cat Rock and the Rock DS. The Gatak Raylan was the Jian Small Cargo, and that was very close to that, that concept thumbnail mm -hmm. that we did. It was, wasn't it? Uh, we have the Asperia Talon, which was the Talon Light Fighter. And then the fourth one, which is a bit of a, a, a mystery. <laughs> A misc story. A misc story. I like this because I wasn't involved with this last time, but you've got a couple of my favourite ships in that, so yeah, it's, it's good. Read mm -hmm. your mind in the in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that fourth one, the small refinery ship, obviously people don't know about, but uh, I can pretty confidently say people will know about it very fingers soon. Crossed. Fingers crossed. So it's a, a new year. We'll do it all again. We have got four more sort of cuts of options here, so we go over those. Option A is a, a big explorer ship. So we obviously have the Carrack as the, the, the pinnacle of uh, explorer ships, but they, they can always be more. Yeah, it would be nice to get a bit of competition in for the Carrack, really. Yeah, maybe something misky. We can go in the misk line. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm down for that. Then we have a selection of ground vehicles there. So there's, there's a there's a right mismatch there. So we've got two little small vehicles and uh, what looks like a, an APC based off the ballista chassis. They, they all look cool. Yeah, the ground vehicles are kind of, um, although they're not as, as grand and exciting as the ships, I think they're just really fun. Um, yeah. and, it, and it's nice, they're nice things to work on because they are kind of contained and they are quite small. They are, I was going to say like less complex, but they're probably not that much less complex mm -hmm. than a ship because they still require all the same sort of setup and everything else. Yeah. And but, the confinement. Yeah, you, everything you've got everything in a, in a small space. Um, but I think I think the ground vehicles kind of um, they just add that extra element of fun when you are playing with your friends. That it, it's it's um, you know it's not all just about space. We've got some beautiful planets and being able to explore them not by a foot is good. Yeah. I don't see a floating noodle bike in there though. A floating, <laughs> floating noodle bike, that's still on the list. Yeah, <laughs> it's not my PJ list. special, yeah. yeah. I've got a few that I'm trying to like just wear John down with. Maybe, the, well, maybe option C, this hover hover vehicle could be a floating big well, pennies. Delivery bike. Delivery quad yeah. bike. Yeah. Could be. So you could have like flying green zones though, wouldn't you? And that would be like, all, all, yeah, actual kind of landing zones would be all sorts of difficulties. Yeah, mm. yeah so that's, that's, we have some gravel of bikes in game at the moment but this is a, a sort of a more stable secure option because anyone that's flown gravel bikes has experienced probably some mild terror as yeah. they, they try and do it's turns. It's been a while since we've done. Yeah we've not done a, I'm trying to think when the last proper gravel vehicle was. Well I mean, it's been a while. Yeah. So the, the last option, option D, is a, a bomber ship. So we, we have the Hercules A2, which is coming this patch. Uh, that obviously carries very big bombs. Very. Or a collection of smaller yeah, bombs. But bombs. it is our only dedicated ground bomber. We have bombers like the Retaliator mm. and the Clips, but they're more torpedoes. This, is, this would be another single man, get in, get out, drop your bombs, job. Um, so nice. I know I've kind of said I like all of them, but for, for like... I think the visual aesthetics of the bombers is kind of like the single seat bomber. They just look, they just look cool. I think a hover vehicle for me. Yeah, I'll go for the uh, the explorer ship at the start because I like that. I like big ships. And I cannot lie. <laughs> do you know? I was wondering if you were going to do it. And you <laughs> it's did. going in my head. Yeah, so I like, yeah. Uh, do, I, do I stop with this? No. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think a nice big explorer ship that you can have all your friends on board because that's really. Where you have the, the huge amount of fun with Star Citizen yeah. is getting a group of friends together yeah. and just yeah. going off I just think and causing chaos. Visually, the small little, small little uh, <laughs> kind of 
compacts are cool. Can yeah. we have them all, John? Maybe. I guess we'll find out. Well, what happens if we, if we do get like a perfect yeah. split on the votes? Yeah. Like, Jason come back and be like, well, actually... Def definitely don't condone on. trying to split the votes. Yeah. So we have to make them all. But Just double but your team, Ben. Double the team. It could happen. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a, a little wrap-up at the end of the, uh, the show. So mm -hmm. obviously it would have been easier to do this in person, but the, the world we live in doesn't allow that at the moment. Hopefully next year, but mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jared will come on in a minute and explain how to vote for these. Uh, leave your comments and suggestions on them and we'll, we'll see what happens. That's a wrap for us. I'm John, if you don't realise, I'm the VIP director. I'm Ben. Uh, first season con done. Woo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the club. Yeah. yeah. And I'm Paul Jones, art director. And thanks for watching our, our Ship Talk panel. Do you hunger for the challenge? Pitted against nature, you will need discipline, determination, and the courage to never give up. Looks like you need a beer mate. Accepted. Report to Emery's Harbor. Welcome to Nova. Today you can join one of our five branches. Nova Corps. Specializing in industry and commerce. Nova Skyline. Recreational activities and public relations. Nova Defense. Aggressive negotiations and security management. Nova Relief. Our medical aid and first responders. And Nova Frontiers, the science and exploration branch. The future is in your hands. Nineverse, where a hardened reaver on the edge of civilization soothes his loneliness on the spectrum. But I am too old to find love. That is a load of space whale crap, and you know it. Where a slaver in the heart of Cathcart meets new people every day, but just can't find that someone special. I can't handle it anymore, Maldice. I'm leaving. But who will subjugate your slaves if you leave? Perhaps a little magic can happen in the cold vacuum space. From the producers of Replace Me comes a romantic comedy with a pirate's heart of gold, Sleepless, in Stanton. Coming soon to the Spectrum on Cathcart Public Access. We build more than money could afford and grow beyond what would define power. We venture into the future and stand together in unity. We are the Galactic Union. Welcome back. You're watching Citizen Gun 2951. Just in case you saw the Benny Merchantman and lost all sense of time, space, and reality there. That was the Ship Talk presentation, followed by another set of community videos. Uh, so the 400i is real and visible. 
Uh, the Anvil Liberator may become the hero of Pyro when players are left without all the gas stations everywhere. And the Banu Merchantman aims to take the crowd of coolest spacecraft in the game. Like it didn't have it already. Plus, you can vote to prioritize one of the next ships to move into development. Uh, voting should be enabled now on the very special comm link of, uh, found on the robertspaceindustries.com website. And uh, if it isn't, give it some time. I'm willing to bet the site is being hammered just a little bit at the moment. Now, as for what you folks had to say during the presentation, we're going to try this again. All right, Twitch chat, don't let me down. Uh, Dial Tone said... Yo, dog, we heard you like ships, so we made a ship to ship your ships so you can ship while you ship. Uh, Aura Valido said, they're shipping the shipping, ship, ship, shippings, ships. Been enjoying, enjoying Citizen on a lot. Thanks for the amazing work. Uh, Medusa One says, it's so stupid. I love it. I don't know which ship he's talking about, but we'll take it. Uh, Enig Marin says, the new most important ship in Star Citizen. That's still me and Jay Lee, dude. Uh, Blix88 says, Pocket Carrier! Yes, finally, Pocket Carrier. And Lars19 says, Balloon Merchunkman! I asked for the best of the best, and they gave me Lars19. Back to the 400i, that promotion should have launched just a little while ago, so be sure you check that out as well as the pre-Q&A FAQ where the community team anticipated some of your most likely questions and put them to John Crew ahead of time. I hope there's at least one question about the bathrooms there. Now, of course, what we really want to do is fly the 400i. And I'm pleased to report that the 400i is not only straight to flyable, but will be available when Alpha 315 goes to PTU for Wave 1 testers, subscribers, and concierge. And as for when that is, I'm told the platform team is literally watching this stream right now, waiting for me to say the word, and they will drop the patch. So all I have to do is say the word. Whew. That's a lot of pressure. But if I say the word and the patch drops in the leaf and I'll be here by myself, why would I want that? You know, this reminds me of the time when I had that, that big crazy beard that I said I would shave when 3.0 came out. And then right before 3.0 came out, uh, everybody was on the go live call and everybody was like, yeah, it's ready, yeah, it's ready, yeah, it's ready. And then CR made everybody wait an additional five minutes just to torture me. You remember that, CR? Pepperidge Farms remembers that. All right, I've pushed the gag too far, as it seems. All right, here we go. Countdown ready. And three, two, one. That was predictable. All right. Let's go now to Allie Brown, Christopher Bolte, and Daryl Barnes and learn more about Gen 12 and the, uh, the multi-core of Vulcan. Hi, I'm Ali Brown, Director of Graphics Engineering here at Cloud Imperium Games. And today we're going to be talking about Gen 12, our new multi-core renderer. In addition to myself, we'll also be hearing from Christopher Bolte, our core engine architect, and Daryl Barnes, our graphics programmer. And today we're going to be talking about the need for our new renderer, the architecture and how it's built, Vulkan, uh, which is the back-end API we use, and the progress of how we're doing so far, and then what's next for the graphics team. So to help understand the need for the Gen 12 renderer, I first want to take a look at the high-level structure of our existing renderer to try and understand how the new render will differ. 
So here you see a diagram very simplified of our overall architecture. And on the left-hand side, you can see the 3D engine, and this is what manages all the visible objects in the scene, for example, their position, their size, and ultimately is responsible for the culling of them objects and deciding what should be sent through on screen each frame to the renderer. And obviously the job of the renderer is just to feed out the image at the end of the frame. And to do this, to manage this process, all of these objects have to pass through this single universal pipe, this conduit of information in the center. And as a result of that, every object has to come through with a certain amount of uh, settings or paperwork and baggage to describe how they should be configured and this type of represented on the diagram by these uh, switches. So this type of design initially seems very flexible. Having this universal pipe, you can very easily toggle certain settings and get a very different rendered result for each object. But the reality is actually that the objects and the renderer both end up extremely complicated because they have to decipher this list of instructions and distribute these objects through the various pipelines and stages inside the renderer. And this has to happen for every object, every frame. And this deciphering ends up resulting in quite a significant performance problem. And it also makes the renderer quite inflexible because it's, it's quite complicated and hard to change the architecture. So how does our Gen 12 renderer differ from this? Well, the methodology we're taking on is to try and make everything as explicit as possible. And we're trying to minimize all these redundant connections uh, and switches and configuration options and try and get things much more streamlined. So to do this, each object in the world will directly communicate with the render pass responsible for drawing that object at startup time. So when the object is first spawned, it will communicate directly with the pass responsible for it and pre-configure everything possible at that stage. Now, this has a bunch of benefits. So by speaking directly to the thing that's rendering it, it doesn't have to worry about all the other rendering systems. So they end up with a much more limited set of parameters, both on the object and on the rendering pass. And all of the settings we do have are very relevant for the task, which makes things much less complicated. And it's easier to optimize, more flexible, and more modular. So each of these passes then goes on to generate lower-level commands that are actually going to map directly to our graphics API, which is the piece of software that sits just above your GPU driver. And this backend collects and executes all of these instructions. And because there is no high level knowledge of the rendering in this backend, it is just simply just issuing commands. It ends up very simple and streamlined and much simpler than the equivalent on our old renderer. So the benefit of this simpler code is it's much easier to multi-thread, which is to say to run it on multiple CPU cores in parallel, something that is crucial for modern CPUs. So multi-threading is a complex and often misunderstood paradigm. So I thought it was worth us talking briefly about how we optimize multi-threaded code. And for that, I'm going to use an analogy of building a house, which is another complex engineering task with dependencies. So here you can see a list of tasks for a builder, a joiner, and an electrician, all running uh, one after another. And those dependencies between them shown in red. And in this example, the house is equivalent to rendering our frame. Each tradesman might be a different system. And then the capacity of three people in our house is equivalent to the three CPU cores we might have on our system. And the occupancy, as in the average number of people in the house, is effectively the same as the CPU or GPU utilization numbers you might see in Task Manager. So in this example, we can see the, the project takes 11 units of time and is, on average, 60% full for this house. Now, this occupancy of 60% isn't the direct reason that it takes 11 units of time. And that is, in fact, down to the critical path of work where the builder is blocking the joiner, and the joiner is then blocking the electrician. So the obvious answer here is that you need another builder or multiple builders to work on this in parallel to unblock the joiner, and, and so on. You can keep on parallelizing this work to try and reduce the critical path. And that is our focus when we are optimizing multi-threaded code. However, not all tasks are trivial to run in parallel, and sometimes it's impossible to actually run them in parallel. So you will end up with these unallocated capacity space and these bubbles. And in this case, if we imagine the electrician was, in fact, our GPU, then the fact that it takes longer is just going to result in a CPU bubble, which is unavoidable. And this type of thing happens very frequently if you have a configuration, for example, a very fast GPU and a very slow CPU, then unavoidably one of them two systems is going to have a bubble. So we can fill these bubbles with non-critical work, like streaming meshes or textures. And this can help fill the unused CPU capacity. And this can be useful to try and get some extra work done, but it ultimately it's not going to improve the performance of the frame. And the point I really wanted to drive home was that the CPU and GPU utilization, which are often looked at as key indicators of performance, aren't actually the direct thing we should be looking at. They are useful statistics, but ultimately the frame time is the only thing that matters and the critical path that resulted in that frame time. 
So as we roll out Gen 12, we'll hopefully be putting some new statistics in there that the players can see to help them understand the performance and understand these bubbles. And that should hopefully give a little bit clearer insight into the performance of the renderer. So how we can actually achieve this parallelism in practice, that's going to come down to two major changes. One is the architectural changes, which Christopher will talk us through. And the second is the Vulkan graphics API that Daryl is going to talk us through. Welcome to the next section of our Gen 12 renderer presentation. My name is Christopher Bolte. Core Engine Architect here at Cloud Imperium Games, and I would like to spend the next few minutes introducing the high-level architecture of our in-development Gen 12 renderer. For this section, I will focus on the rendering of object instances in the world, for example chairs, walls, characters, or spaceships. This part of the rendering pipeline is called Scene Object Rendering, and has the largest impact on runtime performance. There is also a lot of work happening on the architecture to manage operations which work on all pixels on the screen, so-called post effects, but I won't cover those. The current slide shows our existing renderer code setup. We have a main thread, which does all game simulation as well as figuring out what objects we should draw for every frame. And we have a render thread which takes all those objects and translates their description into GPU comments to render them on the screen. The system is set up to double buffer the data. In other words, the render thread is working on data from the previous frame, while the main thread produces data for the next frame. Such a setup allows easy performance improvements in some situations, but it also has two issues on modern hardware. First, the rendering code won't scale over multiple CPU cores, which can result in a bottleneck during execution. In other words, every visible object adds a certain cost. The more objects we render, the higher the cost. And as a single CPU processes this cost, no matter how well we optimize, at some object count, we will run into performance issues. Second, since the main thread and render thread must be synchronized with vSync, we can end up with very bad load balancing. As shown in the slide, if the main thread takes longer than the render thread, the render thread has to, to be idle and wait. And vice versa, if the render thread takes longer, then the main thread has to wait. During such wait time, the CPU is underutilized, especially if waiting for the single core render thread. One goal for the Gen 12 renderer is to remove this kind of bottleneck and extend architecture as a system without those waits and allowing every operation to utilize all CPU cores. When we utilize all CPU cores, we would still have an object limit, as every visible object must be processed. But we can process a higher object count and at the same time reduce the latency on the main thread until all objects are processed. As we will be making better use of modern multi-core CPUs. Let's take a look at some details. For example, please keep in mind that the size of the sections are chosen to visualize the cost. Relation in size doesn't necessarily translate to the same relation in CPU cost. When looking at the cost of the operations done by the render thread, a pattern quickly emerges. We pay a similar cost for every rendered object. This is called a draw call. For every draw call, some time that is spent inside our own renderer code and some part of it is spent in the GPU driver code. In the next slide, we will cover our current process as well as the next steps to move the draw core cost out of the render thread onto multiple CPU cores. We already have a level of parallelization on the main thread, used to find out what objects are visible. There we use our batch worker job system. This is a parallelization system to execute the same code on a different object instance of all CPU cores. To give an example, checking 400 objects can be split over 10 threads, so that every thread will be processed 40 objects. By doing that, the latency on the main thread until all 400 objects are done is divided by the number of threads, reducing said latency to 40 objects only, roughly at least. As in the actual system, several low-level factors affect the execution, making this statement not fully true, but covering those would be out of scope for this presentation. The visible check itself happens multiple times per object in a frame. As an object can be visible in the main camera, but it can also be visible in shadows, or via remote location rendering, the so-called render to texture or RTT rendering. The slides show those passes simplified, as we can have more than one shadow pass, for example. 
Those visibility checks or culling operations are performed in all CPU cores with the batch worker system. When an object is determined to be visible, its vendor and description is copied into multiple temporary buffers. Those temporary buffers are processed on the next vendor's web frame to submit every object's draw call to the GPU. In other words, object culling is already at the point where we want to have the draw call processing. Right now, we are in the first implementation phase. We have to find our low level code building blocks, ensure our APIs work, and are now in the process of moving our own rendering code out of the render thread into the existing batch worker execution. This is a very time consuming refactoring, as we need to change every rendering feature in a very old and large code base. But we have set it up in a way to allow us to gradually move over parts step by step. After this operation is done, we still copy state to a temporary buffer to be processed by the render thread. But the state which we copy is prepared in a way that we can directly send it to the GPU with minimal processing on the render thread. Doing this step will already give us performance benefits when we are render thread bound, as less code will be run on the render thread. Additionally, this is a necessary stepping stone for the next phase. After we manage to move our own rendering code to multiple CPU cores, we will start to utilize the Vulkan API, one major selling point of the newest generation of graphics APIs like Vulkan is the possibility to generate GPU commands on multiple threads. That is something which wasn't possible before, and mostly the cause for the existing renderer design. The catch is, to allow efficient parallel generation of GPU commands, the data must be prepared in a certain way. And that is what we are doing right now as part of porting the scene object rendering to Gen12 and moving our renderer code to the batch worker system. When this is done, we can implement a parallel work in backend and remove the render thread. After all that work is done, our renderer should be able to process a very higher number of visible objects at lower impact on the frame time. At the same time, it will make better use of the available CPU resources and have less idle time when major systems wait for each other. Thank you for your time. Daryl will now take over to cover the work inside of the Gen12 renderer. Hi, my name is Daryl. I'm a graphics programmer here at Cloud Imperium Games, and I work closely with Vulkan and our graphics renderer to make the game look as good as it does. So what exactly is Vulkan? Well, Vulkan is a modern graphics API that allows us as developers to take greater control over what you as a player sees and also affects performance greatly. As you know, we already have a few areas of bottlenecking on the CPU, but the design of Vulkan allows us to alleviate these bottlenecks by submitting work in parallel to the GPU. So I would like to explain a bit more about the software stack that's involved with our graphics in the engine. So from the image, you can see that we have a renderer front end, a renderer back end, and as well, the graphics driver. The Vulkan API generally sits at the renderer back end and allows us a fine grained control over what we develop and how we develop for it. It also gives us flexibility for cross-platform including Windows and Linux, and anything we may want to look at in the future. The graphics driver stage is not managed by us, but we look at that and we gather information and process any crashes or any issues that might happen, and then we can deal with those further down the line. So you can see now how graphics APIs have changed over time. We're, of course, in the more modern section where Vulkan is on feature parity essentially, with other APIs such as DirectX 12 Ultimate. You might also be wondering what a graphics API actually is. And we see that as a tool that is used for development that can interface between your graphics card as a player and us as developers so that we can give you the latest and greatest. Vulkan also has many features and extensions available to it that we will be exploring in the future, such as variable rate shading, bindless resources, and GPU accelerated ray tracing. To address any issues 
we also need to collect data from our player's hardware so that we can use that to target specific features and extensions. We're not aware of any large-scale multiplayer games that captures Vulkan data live in the exact same way we do. Capturing this data allows us to plan ahead for any optimizations and then leverage that for the larger majority of players so we can bring you the latest and greatest. On screen at the moment is a diagram that shows the distribution available for Vulkan API versions amongst currently active players. This was captured in the last three months. And as can be seen, there is 98% of players that are able to use Vulkan fully in 1.2. We did see a negligible amount of 1.0 and some that were unavailable. We are actively looking into these cases, especially those that cannot currently run Vulkan as it is seen as unavailable. I'd like to take this opportunity to also say, please update your drivers as we do see a few cases where this can take you straight to the latest version. I'd like to now explain a bit more about the render graph and how this works hand in hand with the Vulkan API in order to improve our usage of Vulkan. So a render graph can be seen as a collection of stages that depend on each other. This then determines the ordering, the scheduling, and the flow of the actual frame. This allows us also to then achieve any synchronization that we need to during that frame. It also helps us from a design point of view, as we can look at the render graph and see where there may be issues or potential optimizations. The render graph also allows us to keep track of any state of resources, and we can also validate against those resources as well. Now I would like to explain the render graph as a whole and give you an overview of how it works between the GPU and also how it works in terms of our frame. So a frame is made up of a collection of passes and sometimes we require a texture to switch states, perhaps between read and write. The graphics driver used to do this for us, but now with modern APIs such as Vulkan, we need to carry out this work ourselves. What the render graph will then do is insert a pipeline barrier into the render graph and pass this work along to the GPU and switch the state. We can also cache the render graph and use any data we had from a previous frame or perhaps similar resources as an optimization. I'd now like to talk a bit about the synchronization that happens within the render graph and how resources change state. So the idea is that we want to switch the state of a resource as early as possible. We need to then also validate that this resource is in the correct state. So from the diagram, we can see that the depth prepass writes to image A, but then later on, we require to read from image A in the G buffer. So to this end, we insert a pipeline barrier for this transition between the two passes. These barriers are scheduled as GPU work, following a strict ordering dependent on other work that may have happened previously. All the work for a single stage within the frame can be carried out in a single pipeline barrier. I'd now like to talk about some of the more nuanced areas of our Vulkan implementation and how this affects us as developers and you as players. We use the DirectX compiler for our shaders and this can compile our HLSL code into Spear V. DXC is a more modern compiler and has features that span both the D3D set of APIs and Vulkan. HLSL is a shader programming language that we as developers can utilize and read in order to make work happen on your GPU. This HLSL is compiled down then into Spear V. Spear V itself is not as readable as it is seen as an intermediate language between HLSL and shader microcode. Spear V gives us less driver overhead at compile time 
we can use this then to create our shader modules in Vulkan and optimize any dead code away. DXE also gives us Shader Model 6. Shader models have progressed over time in HLSL, with Shader Model 6 now giving language support for GPU parallelism, as well as variable rate shading, amongst many other features. We can see here now a diagram of how our shader compilation happens. It starts at the shader author level. This is where one of our many developers will write a shader using HLSL code with some markup integrated into that HLSL. This HLSL is then passed to the preprocessor. The preprocessor then removes any of the additional code that we don't need and is dealt with accordingly, whilst then outputting just HLSL code. The HLSL code is then passed to DXC, and DXC will change this into Spear V. It's at this stage that we can carry out any additional compiler optimizations and improve compile time performance even more. Spear V is then passed to the driver, and the driver will then change this into microcode, which will run specifically on your GPU hardware. As I've previously mentioned, there have been several Vulkan core versions over time. Each one has added new features and extensions for us to reach into and develop with. Two of these I'd like to explain a bit more in detail now that we would like to look into and develop for in the future. These are both bindless resourcing and also fragment shading rate. Fragment shading rate can be seen as the same as variable rate shading, as you may have already seen. What this does is works on groups of pixels instead of a singular pixel at a time within the shader. This allows less overhead in the frame, whilst at the same time allowing variable amounts of these groups, including variable sizes, in order to have less fidelity where may not be as important to look at. Bindless resourcing is where we can take large groups of textures, for example, and reach in and grab one of these inside the group. This gets rid of the overhead of specifically binding two slots within the shader. This also extends to other resources, including buffers. I'd now like to talk a bit about the video RAM involved in your graphics card. VRAM used to be managed by your graphics driver, but with Vulkan and other modern APIs, this is now managed by the developers. There are existing solutions towards this. However, we have decided to use our own implementation. This is because we know exactly what resources are used upfront and how much memory these resources use. Using this, we can potentially beat what the graphics driver used to be capable of. As we know all of our resource life cycles, we can take advantage of that. From the diagram, we can see memory being paged in and out as it used to be when it was managed by the graphics driver. On the other side, we can see memory being allocated and then sub-allocated, and we can then offset into the data from this sub-allocation. The memory paging of years past could potentially result in a performance loss because this was seen as a more one size fits all. We of course want to avoid any of that performance loss and the memory cost involved by offsetting into these larger buffers. This can also help mitigate cache misses. This then leaves us with all of the allocation, freeing, usage and reusage of resources. I'd now like to pass you back to Alistair Brown the Director of Graphics Engineering. Following on from what Darrell explained there with the explicit memory management in Vulkan, we intended to expose some of this memory management to the player through the advanced graphics options. We're going to let you tweak the memory assigned to each system so you can balance the preferred visuals and performance for your experience. For example, you may want to balance the output resolution of your game to a higher resolution, but then sacrifice some shadow quality, or 
maybe you want to use a lower internal resolution and rely on upsampling to achieve uh, higher texture quality. These options will all be available to you and obviously only capped by the hardware that you possess. So to summarize, with our Gen 12 renderer, we're hoping to achieve something that is more efficient, modular, flexible, and minimal abstraction to the hardware and uses modern graphics APIs like Vulkan. So now you know a bit more about what Gen 12 is, I'll try and let you know where we're up to. So we've done a huge amount of work already. The architecture is all in place, and we're using this hybrid rendering approach where we're combining elements of the old and new render at the same time to allow us to move piecemeal to the new system. All of the post effects, fog, and lighting have been converted over, and they're all enabled by default in 3.15. And the fundamentals of scene and geometry rendering are all in place, but they're still being worked on. So our main focus is finishing that off at the moment, and once that's done, our folks will shift to the remaining major systems, which are gas clouds, the render to texture system, and a few special cases for transparency. After this, that's where we'll start seeing the public milestones, and the first of that will be 100% uh, usage of Gen 12 and none of the hybrid approach. This will still be at DirectX 11, our current graphics API at this point. And then our second milestone will be the Vulkan API release. That will be optional at first and then mandatory after we've removed all the bugs. And then our final milestone will be when we have performed the optimizations for multi-threaded. So that will only happen once the Vulkan is in place and we can finally look at the performance on the final graphics API and optimize all the remaining code. So after Gen 12, I just briefly wanted to touch on what that comes next for the graphics team. So a lot of Gen 12 has been focused on CPU performance. So after Gen 12, we really want to start looking at the GPU performance. The first few things we'd look at here were things that wouldn't change the visuals, just improve the frame rate. Things like DLSS, FSR, async compute, and variable rate shading. After we've type of improved this GPU performance, we want to start looking at some of the more exciting visual features. So then there is also mesh shaders and primitive shaders, which is technology we can use to generate procedural geometry. And this type of thing could be really exciting for things like the planets or asteroid fields where procedural geometry is critical. And then there's the big one, ray tracing. We're very excited to get onto ray tracing, especially to use it for lighting, such as global illumination, but also reflections and shadow quality. There's a lot of exciting areas for us to look into, and we can't wait to get into it. So that's it. I just wanted to say a big thanks to everyone who's been involved in this technology. It's involved the graphics team, engine team, VFX, and Planet Tech all working together on a huge piece of code. And we can't wait to get into your hands as soon as possible. Caledonians. I heard stories about you lot. Bounty hunting, piracy, 
assassins. <laughs> You're the scum of the verse, I say. No job's too dirty. Is that all you've heard about us? No. You have a code. Which means I ain't talking my way out of this, am I? Yes. stars? Exploring the galaxy? That's lonely, lonely, hungry work. Always remember though, Big Benny's with you. Big Benny always has your back. Big Benny, eat his food. The dude really said, update your drivers. These are my favorite kind of panels because they're precisely the kind of thing no other game studio would ever dream of sharing with folks. And as CitizenCon 2951 rolls along, there was a lot to take in there, wasn't there? I know server meshing and the like are the big buzzwords, but there are a lot of imp uh, performance improvements to be gained throughout the teams on Star Citizen. And for graphics, they're not only moving to Gen 12 and the faster and more flexible renderer that it brings, uh, they're also focused on re-engineering for multi-core systems to provide improved CPU performance and remove some of our worst bottlenecks. And that all of this work starts with DirectX 11, but will transition into Vulkan once things are ready. Now, the work of these folks, the meshing folks, the database folks, the optimization folks, and countless other folks, I've used that word a lot, uh, from teams across every studio is how we're going to get Star Citizen to that performance promised land. And it takes all these teams to make that dream a reality. And speaking of dreams made reality, hey, Sleepless and Stanton folks, don't think I forgot about you. Don't think because you're a community effort, I can't expect and demand a full length feature. I await my screener. And in other community news, uh, one of the best things to come out of the Star Citizen community over the years has been the creation of an app called Game Glass. It's an app that turns your tablet or phone into a control surface for the game. So let's take a closer look at that now. Up next, we've got Anise, Mark, Morgan, Will, and Marco taking a look at some of the new tools currently in development, including Rastar, which you may have seen a little bit of in the Pyro presentation. Crafting Worlds, Planetary Tech and Tools starts now. Hello, I am Marco Corbetta, VP of Technology, and we're going to talk about some new Planet Earth features today. First, Anis is going to give us an introduction about Gen 12 and what that means for planets. Then Will is going to talk about dynamic foliage, shaders, plants and seasons, and he's going to show us a river demo as well. Then Mark and Morgan are going to talk about Rasta, our new base building tool. So let's get started with Anis. Hi, 
My name is Anis and I'm Senior Engine Programmer here in Cloud Imperium Games. My main responsibility is the development of Star Citizen planetary technology, with a focus on planetary elements rendering. While there is another talk dedicated to Gen 12, I wanted to touch a little bit on how it applies specifically to Planet Tech. It's our Rendering Abstraction Layer API. It aims to provide next generation features for our 3D engine by reducing some CPU latency and rendering common submission over it, which is a significant bottleneck for our game. Part of our recent efforts have been put to modernize our old school renderer to shape it in a conformant modern API rendering style, to be suitable for the newest low overhead API, such as Vulkan. Today, I'm gonna talk a bit about Gen 12 benefits for planetary rendering features. As I said, Gen 12 key aspect is performance. The way this is achieved is to make common submission easier for multi-core CPUs. All Gen's rendering APIs rely on a single thread in which you have the view of a single timeline where GPU commands are guaranteed to be executed in order. The driver does the rest and is responsible to handle memory and synchronization. Gen 12 can scale much better thanks to the ability to dispatch in parallel commands that are submitted from different execution units. The memory is directly handled by the renderer and synchronization primitives are used to make sure commands dispatched in the right order by considering cross-dependencies between resources. Since the rendering driver is thinner and more responsibility is given to game developers, this opens a new opportunity to forge a new renderer for specific needs a game like Star Citizen might have. Our planetary technology introduced a new set of engineering challenges so we need to be very creative due to the fact that, that most game industry standards techniques are not working very well for Star Citizen. Thanks to Gen 12 optimizations, we can push our planetary rendering computational budgets to perform more GPU operations. This translates to better visuals, more details and less compromises. As a member of the Planet Tech team, I will show you some improvements we've recently made for our planetary terrain rendering pipeline. We made two important terrain improvements. The first is at ground scale level, and the second is for large scale purpose. Both techniques use dynamic tessellation. Dynamic tessellation is a GPU feature, which allows to increase the triangle count on the fly before rasterization stage occurs. The new triangle are then manipulated to shape the terrain high frequency details and improve surface visuals. This new technique is replacing our parallax relief mapping, which is a per pixel technique. And instead of creating geometric details like tessellation does, it works by simulating details after the rasterization stage with a cheaper approach by tracing rays from camera to surface. The second improvement targets planet visuals at long distance. This technique is also tessellation driven and it aims to improve terrain-ocean intersection, where CPU geometric representation lacks for enough control points in the geometry. We've reached the conclusion. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of CitizenCon. Thanks, Anise. I'm Will Hayne and I work on the Planet Tech team. Over the past few months, I've been working on a number of improvements to our ecosystem spawning system, which is the system that spawns all of the objects on all of the planets. We've been doing this to give our artists more power and flexibility, as well as improved performance for everyone playing the game. The first thing that I did was a complete overhaul of how we spawn the objects. We used to spawn them on each terrain patch as that terrain patch was created, but this meant that we were limited in our control in that we could only spawn new objects when we were creating new terrain patches. The new system has an entirely separate grid division of the planet, and this means that we have a lot more control over the resolution of our objects when they're spawned and how we spread it across multiple frames, which means that we get better performance in the client. This also means that we add, we're able to add a setting for the clients to control how far away each object preset was spawned. The next improvement we've started to look at is making the ecosystems react to their situation and surroundings more. For example, we can now introduce scaling biases for temperature and humidity so that certain objects when in higher humidity can be bigger or smaller and the same for temperature. 
A new system has been designed for animal and entity spawning using tokens, which means that we can specialise our object presets better for different planets. For example, we have something similar for rocks, that means if you put a rock on a snowy planet, it goes snowy, and if you put it on a sandy planet, it looks sandy. Now we can do something similar for animals. We can specify a small herbivore, for example, and in the snow, this might spawn some sort of arctic rabbit, and in the jungle, this might spawn something completely different. We've also begun to experiment with a new foliage shader that takes into account the health of the plant based on its surroundings again, and the current season of the planet, though what you're seeing on the screen is far from final. In the same vein as that, we've been working towards having more dynamically placed biomes around natural areas. We've created dressing object presets that are automatically placed around coasts, and of course my favourite thing to work on, rivers. In the most recent couple months, I've been doing more work on the rivers to prepare them to be closer to what we would consider shippable so that we can get them out to the players. This has included finer control of both the shape of our rivers as they flow from springs to larger rivers, but also the objects that spawn around our rivers so we have control over what spawns in the water, what is spawning on the banks of the river, and what is spawning further away and blending it into the biome that it flows through. The other thing that we've added as well is a wet edge around rocks, both in the sea and in rivers, which reflects the fact that they were probably wet from the river, and so they look a lot more shiny. We've also been working on introducing basins to the river system so that we can have more natural pauses in our river systems and other bodies of water than just the oceans. Another major change was to stop using the planet's ocean mesh and just displacing it up to the river, and instead building specific river mesh sections around the river. This means that we can have far more control over the shape of the water, and we can use our own specific river material and shader, meaning that we can specify colours, flow, and other properties of the river water separately to the ocean of that planet. Rivers aren't done yet, but they're closer to being used in production than ever before, the next steps include a planet populating tool, so one click to create an entire river system across a planet, and maybe working on a little bit of lava flow, but we'll have to see when that comes. Next is uh, Mark and Morgan. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm a tools programmer from the Planet Tech team, and now I'm going to talk about Rasta. What is Rasta? Rasta is our working progress tool for planetary locations, creation and addition. The name stands for a mix uh, of RTS, the game draw, which takes the inspiration from its map editor system, and Star, as well you know. Its goals are to replace our previous placement system based on prefabs to a better object container oriented solution. As our previous system was based on prefabs, any changes to location was source of issue, as it needs to re-enable a whole set of data to have things like missions or shops to work again. With the new system, any change will be easily manageable and won't require us to redo work when a change is made. Plus, as it's now object container oriented, it can be used for outposts, caves, or even derelicts, and more. It works as a modular system, where locations will in fact be made of small elements that will be placed just like you do in City Builder RTS Editor. In a matter of minutes, we now have a new location where we can now create a bunch of cool gameplay. Let's go to Mark, who will tell us about the connector system. Thanks, Morgan. So, I'm Mark. I'm also a tools developer for the Plant Tech team. Do you know what's better than placing everything by hand? Not placing everything by hand. In order to do that, we use what we call connectors. Basically, artists create small parts of homesteads that we can then snap together. Every part is modular, so we can uh, interchange multiple ones in order to have uh, procedural homesteads. Every change is very simple. We can change like, the whole inside of a homestead or only a building that is a part of the homestead. In that way, it's very easy to make a lot of different buildings. Once something is connected, it is considered a part of the whole. So it moves as one, it can be deleted and changed, and it's basically all for connectors. So uh, back to you, Morgan. 
And last but not least, some of you might have noticed that the UI is not looking quite like an engine UI. And that's normal, as it's based on our in-game UI tech building blocks, and that for a reason. Well, today it's being used by our developers. One day, when it's ready and been roughly tested internally, we'll make a version available to you, the player. And Rasta, it's what? We'll make you a pioneer. Thank you for watching. We are very excited about the tech we've shown you today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of Digital Citizen Con. So that was a small sample of what our team is working on. I hope you have enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of CitizenCon and thanks for watching. No, it's not me! It's time for... Push up, push up, moving, moving. I got you covered. Pushing. Got visual on the bridge door. We're going in. Get, Get down, down on the ground. ground. Hands where we can see them. No sudden moves. What the? What is this? It's goddamn failure, that's what it is. Come on, the target is gone. We've been stitched up. Bastard! The hut's still on. When you catch this bastard, you will run out of luck eventually. Are you tired of that same old commuter train? Feel like you're just one in the crowd? Was that burrito the best thing about your day? Out on the frontier, there are opportunities aplenty if you know where to look, and if you've got somebody to help you find them. Somebody to pick you up when you're down. Somebody to watch your back out there in the black. We are recruiting across our industrial, security, exploration, and merchant divisions. So if you think you've got what it takes to make it on the frontier, think Frontier Consolidated. It started in Port Olisar. The first case was six years ago. Nobody knows what happened. He just dropped dead. Now it's spread through the Stanton system. I've seen it hundreds of times. Last words are backspace. 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 We followed an elite team of researchers in a race to contain it. Why can't I recreate it? I just don't know what we're missing. Professor, there's a new case nearby. We need to check it out. Can they stop it? in time. Are you struggling with your career out in the verse? We 
are too, but we're here to help. The Garden Interstellar Initiative. The Garden Interstellar does not guarantee fruits and vegetables will be available for all and cannot be held accountable for the lack thereof. I feel a little called out by both Project Black Space and Garden Interstellar. And hey, at least we all know what my surprised voice sounds like now. That was new. That was the Planet Tech panel, and the big news watching the chat was clearly Rastar, the beginnings of which will one day let players build their own outposts like the ones we've seen and others still yet to come. But up next, the cosplay contest returned this year, and it's been open for a couple months now. So the community team narrowed it down to a couple finalists, and then their panel of judges have selected the winners. And... I was not asked to judge this year. Why was I not asked to judge this year? It might be because they figured out I was buzzed on British cough syrup during the 2019 event. Could hardly tell. So let's take a look now at some of the finalists. And the winners, let's see what we have here. In third place, Calamity, who's worked to prove that it's not all about armors and weapons. Sometimes you just have to look good on the dance floor at Wally's Bar. In second place, Diabolus, back again and always a force to be reckoned with, this time rocking legacy heavy outlaw armor and a laser sword. You can't just add a laser sword, can you? And finally, in first place, it's OG star citizen Ken Shadow who returns with a gray cat arrow armor, complete with backpack created through a combination of EVA foam, 3D printed PLA, and poured resin for the clear pieces. Now, true story, I once spent the day pushing Ken Shadow around Disneyland in a wheelchair, but he never actually explained to me what his injury was. It's possible I was taken advantage of. Now, congratulations to all the winners, but there's still a fan favorite award. You can head over to the website now and cast your vote. Um, I forgot to ask what the prize was, so I have no idea what any of these people won, but I'm gonna assume it's a 15 minute call with Tyler Wicken to ask all the when questions you could ever want. Congratulations, everyone. Up next, it's one folks have been waiting for, Paul Rendell and Benoit Beausséjour take us through the programming and engineering looking glass with server meshing in the state of persistence, starting meow. The concept of server, which has been ingrained since the beginning, has changed to become a mesh of servers. So how do you solve this? The answer should be simple. Hi, my name is Paul Reindel and I'm the Director for Online Technology here at CAG. I wanted to take this year's CitizenCon as an opportunity to give you some insight into our exciting persistent streaming and server meshing technology. In this talk, I will cover a quick overview of the current streaming and server architecture and how we plan to transform the existing tech into what we call persistent streaming and server meshing. I also have Benoit Beausejour with me, who later in the talk will give you more insight into the graph database that is powering persistent streaming. Hey Ben, how's it going? 
Hi Paul, hi everybody. I'm super excited to share some of the details about what the game services team at Turbulent has been working on to support the efforts to build this technology and make it a reality for you guys. Cool, uh, let's get started. Before we look into persistent streaming and server machine and how this new technology will work, let's have a brief look at entity streaming and how our solar system is set up. Each solar system can be seen as one giant level containing every single object inside the solar system, from the sun to the wind or rock, stand in one large map. Since this is a lot of data, the setup is split up into a hierarchy of nested object containers, which can be streamed in and out individually. If you look at an abstract view of Stanton, it all starts with one solar system root object container. This object container contains the sun, the planets, and the moons around each planet. Each of those locations then has its own object container, and if you take a closer look at a moon, you will find the entities placed around the moon inside this object container. For example, a space station orbiting the moon. This setup keeps repeating, and the space station could be set up via multiple rooms, each defined by its own object container. Additionally to the static hierarchy of object containers, there are also all the dynamic entities which bring the universe to life, NPCs, an interactive vending machine, and of course players and spaceships. Most of these entities are made of a hierarchy as well. For example, a player has his body, an undersuit, and armor attached to it, and they are all child entities of the player. The streaming system treats these mini hierarchies as streaming groups to make sure that an object like a spaceship is always streamed in as one unit. Loading the entirety of Stanton into memory and simulating every single entity would be very expensive, especially on the client, but also on a single server. That's why we developed Entity Bind Culling and Object Container Streaming, which allows us to stream object containers and streaming groups individually. When the game server starts, all entities and object containers within the solar system are loaded into local memory of that game server. These entities are not streamed in, we just store the initial state in server memory. When a player connects, we create a so-called streaming bubble around that player, and object containers as well as streaming groups that are visible from the player's point of view are considered inside this bubble. Any object container that is inside the bubble will stream its content, and any streaming group within the bubble will also be streamed in on the server and then replicated to the client. Entities are considered inside the streaming bubble if their projected screen size on a virtual 1080p plane is larger than 5 pixel based on the distance of the player. So while a large object like a moon will be considered inside the bubble from far away, a small object like a ship will only be considered inside when it's much closer to the player. When the player starts moving across the universe, entities that leave the streaming bubble will become unbound and the replication layer will remove these entities from the client. Entities that enter the streaming bubble will get bound to the client, which cause the network layer to replicate these entities to the client, effectively streaming them in. We call this technique entity bind culling because streaming on the client is driven by the network layer, binding and unbinding entities. If entities are not in any client streaming bubble, so no players in their vicinity, these entities are also streamed out on the server. They go back into a dormant state where they are not simulated. This model works quite well on the client, however it doesn't scale well on the server. While we do stream entities on the server with no players close to them, a poor distribution of players will cause the DGS to load most entities and the more clients we try to match to a given game server, the likelihood of a player being at every single location increases. And that basically nullifies the benefit of server-side streaming. So how do we solve this? The answer should be simple. Allow multiple instances of the game server to work together so they can split up the work. Well, it's not quite that simple. Let's have a look at the current architecture. As of today, we have a traditional client server architecture. One instance of a dedicated game server serves up to 50 clients. This is called instance as the dedicated game server has its own instance view of the persistent universe. Once the server is full, we start a new server instance, which then serves additional 50 players. As we've seen before, when a DGS instance is created, it loads a unique version of the Stantum system into its local server's memory. Therefore, each dedicated game server instance has a unique copy of every single object that's part of Stanton. 
as these entities only exist in the memory of the game server when the instance is shut down, these entities are deleted. The goal of server meshing is to allow multiple DGS instances to work together and divide simulation costs between each server and the mesh. In the best case, we can scale this to infinity by adding more nodes to the mesh. As we saw earlier, each server node stores the state of entities locally. If we want to mesh these servers together, we need to find an efficient way to synchronize state between each server. With our current architecture, depending on the vision of the simulation and the overlap, this would require a lot of synchronization points between each node. It's an exponential problem, as in the worst case, each node would need to talk to each other node in the mesh, severely limiting our ability to scale it. To solve this issue, we are separating simulation and replication. Instead of just meshing multiple dedicated game servers together and have them synchronize state between each other, we are introducing a new layer called replication layer. The replication layer has two major functions. It holds the state of every entity in memory and replicates the state to clients, but also to server nodes. I set server nodes because in this setup, the traditional dedicated game server becomes a game server node. This server node connects to the replication layer, very similar to a client, and only a subset of entities are replicated to that server node. Replication of server nodes is controlled by the network bind culling algorithm that we saw earlier, and is driven by streaming bubbles. And it works very similar to how it works on clients. The server node has certain streaming bubbles assigned to it, which will cause the replication layer to replicate entities from these streaming bubbles to the server node. Contrary to a player's client, a server node has the additional responsibility to execute server-side authoritative code for those entities, controlling AI, doing damage calculations, etc., etc. The result of the simulation is then written back from the server node to the replication layer, and from there it is replicated to all connected clients and other server nodes. Since streaming bubbles can overlap, entities may be replicated to multiple server nodes, exactly the same way how they are currently replicated to multiple clients if players are at the same location. To avoid two server nodes trying to simulate the same entity, only one server node can have authority over any given entity. And only that server is allowed to write entity state back to the replication layer. This is usually the first server node who replicated the entity, and other server nodes will only run client code on those entities. Basically, you can see a game server node as a client with authority to write the result of its local simulation back to the replication layer. Authority can transfer between server nodes. For example, if an entity leaves the streaming bubble of the current authoritative server, it is then transferred to the next server node that has this entity currently streamed in. Further, authority can be transferred between server nodes on demand in order to load balance the mesh. Since we now mesh multiple server instances together to simulate a shared state of the universe, we no longer call this instance, but instead we call it shard. A shard is still a unique version of the universe, and we still have multiple shards running in parallel. However, the server mesh will lift our current hard limit of 50 players, and it will enable us to steadily increase the number of players we can support within one shard. It will take some time, and in our first version of server meshing, we will still have a very similar situation as we have today, with quite a few shards running in parallel. However, this technology is going to enable us to start scaling the universe to become a true MMO experience. There are some fundamental differences between a shard and an instance, and for this we need to take a closer look at the replication layer and talk a little bit about persistent streaming. Previously, the entity state was held entirely in memory on the dedicated game server. And besides some selected persistent player items, all that state would be lost when the server is shut down or crashed. The replication layer is fundamentally different, as the entire state of the universe is stored within a graph database. We call this entity graph, and it's an evolution of the original iCache. When we create a new shard, the initial entity state of the universe is seeded into this database. This happens offline before we let player join the shard. When the shard comes online, the replication mesh caches the state from the entity graph. As player connect to the shard, and as we start to spin up new server nodes, simulation begins and alters the state of the universe. The replication layer does not only replicate these state changes to connect players and server nodes, it also replicates the state into the entity graph. 
Since the entity graph is a persistent database, the state of the shard is never lost, and even if the shard is shut down, the state persists and can be resumed at a later time. Benoit is going to show you some more technical details about the entity graph. Thank you, Paul. Get ready for a deep dive into the entity graph persistence database. The entity graph is our approach to persisting the game world. This is fundamentally different to what is happening today in the game where only items you own are actually stored. Our objective is to be able to save the state of the replication layer, which includes all entities in a given universe shard, in order to provide a truly persistent world where actions you take as a player can influence environments in the game world permanently. The entity graph, as the name implies, stores game data as a graph. This representation is native for the game engine because it is how internally those data structures the game uses are addressed and manipulated. Using a graph also has several advantages. We're basically storing and retrieving from a gigantic index list of nodes and edges, and those edges between those nodes are optimized in a sharded database. But in order to properly explain the system, we must first view the game world as the game engine sees it. Game objects are constructed of several game entities linked together in a hierarchical structure. You can picture this as a tree, which is a specialized kind of graph. This is how the game engine holds and simulates the elements on screen as it is running the simulation. In a server meshing world, this is also how replicants hold the entities in memory for each of their assigned territories. For example, a ship is made up of several entities that make up different parts of the entire playable vehicle. Each part is parented to another entity until the root of the ship is reached. Each of these entity nodes holds properties with regard to what the entity represents in the game. The class of object it is, the item type, its legal owner, orientation, and of course its very precise physical location within the game world. Each edge in our graph qualifies the relationship to the parent. In the case of a vehicle, our edges store properties that tell the system which port is being used to attach the entity into the parent and what kind of attachment it is. An item port attachment, a zone attachment, many others. In a constellation, for example, the different major sections of the hull are entity nodes with edges to the ship route. We call this small graph of item an aggregate because it is a whole movable unit. The ship root in this case is called the aggregate root because it sits at the top of a logical object. You can think of what you normally call an item as an aggregate, with the aggregate root being the actual item you are talking about. For example, a first person weapon with attached scope, mag clips, and laser sights is a small hierarchy of entities. We distinguish the aggregate roots from other nodes by giving it a label. Labels allow us to distinguish and rapidly look up and find nodes of a specific type, either when we retrieve parts of the graph or when we look up specific nodes. Those labels exist to allow correct reversal of the, of the graph data when we query for specific things in the game world. Other labels include streaming groups, universe root, star system root. This allows us to really look up and index those types. But the tree depth doesn't stop there. Additional information is required for a fully functional ship. The insides of each of those structural entities have to be fleshed out. Object containers are the building blocks of how space division is achieved, which aggregates and what part of the hierarchy they're in. In fact, most major areas of ships are represented as OC entities attached to the ship root or another OC. The shape of this data actually takes in reality is driven by designers. Of course, then, each of those object containers also contain entity hierarchies as well, expanding to have the common static and dynamic entities you're used to playing with, like elevators, beds, guns, seats, gimbals, and others. In addition to object containers that make up the structure of the ship, other aggregates can also be attached within the hierarchy of our ship. For example, a rover parked in the cargo bay of our Kani will be attached as a sub-aggregate attached to your ship's cargo grid. Same goes for turrets, which are changeable and themselves expose item ports, allowing guns to be mounted. For each of those entity nodes, a snapshot document is also stored. This document contains all the runtime values, the game components attached to those entities. This data is the dynamic part of the model where game developers can persist variables on any entity in the game world according to the rules of a game component. For example, damage state and health data are stored within the snapshot. Uh, document of those ship entities. 
storing and retrieving data in graph form really have some awesome properties. It's a native structure to the game engine, so it gets loaded rapidly. It's very simple and effective to serialize and transport because it's just a list of nodes and edges. There are optimized databases that we can use that allow us to fetch entities recursively in a traversal rapidly. And the data set can be sharded across multiple database instances reliably. One key element here and one big advantage of having a graph data is also that we can reduce writes. So uh, in order to reduce that, all the hierarchical changes that we need to do can be minimized. For example, if we want to add detach mutation command, we'll detach an entity from the hierarchy. In this case, a single edge must be erased, which is a very inexpensive operation. A nice side effect of this is also that it's the same operation where there were detaching a single entity or an entire aggregate. In both cases, the single edge must be erased in order to perform the detach. Rolling away in your stowed rover, detaching a gun from a replacement or uh, for a replacement or selling a turret becomes really a cheap operation to persist. That is good because that happens very frequently. Compared to a columnar approach where index columns must be maintained for every write, linking all objects to the aggregate root, this is a really a great performance improvement. The same properties apply with the attach command, which will only have to create a single edge when rejoining items to the hierarchy, be it via attachment or parking another vehicle on a ducking hub. The attach and detach commands are two of the many semantic commands that the entity graph API proposes, allowing to express a mutation to the graph. Other examples of the different commands are create, possess, transfer, stack, unstack, change location, change snapshot, bury, stow, and unstow. One important change and addition that comes about with the entity graph is also how mutations are applied to the database. Each mutation is composed of multiple commands which are executed in sequence but committed transactionally to the database. They either succeed together or fail and roll back together. This ensures that the changes to the graph are always consistent and no lost writes or errors can cause data corruption. For example, a mutation consisting of detach, transfer, and then attach commands would succeed only if all three commands are applied successfully. The system retrieves a constant ordered streams of mutation from the replicant scribes that are part of the replication layer and are enqueued in durable queues to ensure that no message is lost even if the service is unavailable or paused. It's important to understand that the graph does not only cover your ships and items, but the entire game world is made up this way. Your ship is actually attached to the zone host location you travel in. Your playing character is attached to your ship seat when you are piloting it just like planets are attached to their star system routes. The game world, though, must exist in persistence before it can be replicated and mutated. This is part of a process called seeding, where a new database is created by the replication layer. It is during that process that millions of entities are initially created in a sort of a big bang. At this stage, every object container, every minor or major entity from planets to doorknobs are inserted into the entity graph in their default state. That is, the state that the designers decided was the initial state of the world. This process goes down from the universe route to the star system route and into the different areas and planets, into their landing zone, their buildings, their rooms, down to the smallest possible entity. There are multiple types of entities that are created during this process. First are unstreamable entities, which make up the skeleton of the universe. Those are entities you do not get to see, but are part of and always present on every worker node in the mesh. It is by looking up unstreamable entities that the game world is able to stream in the other types of entities into your client and into the server mesh. It is from those, all from those entities that others' entities bloom. Static entities make up the game world that you cannot interact with. Most map objects that make up buildings like the Hurston Tower, rooms and walls of hospitals, or the bar at G-Lock are all made up of static entities. And the last type is dynamic entities. These are entities that you as a player can manipulate. A bottle on a bar, a door in a level, a ship component, everything you interact with when you're playing the game. Of course, during seeding, all object containers are also seeded as part of this hierarchy and inform the shape of the loadable subgraphs. The seeding process takes a couple of minutes to complete, 
Once created, this newly seeded database represents a full dimension of the universe and will now persist as it is modified by players. As you play the game and go about with your ship, your playing character entity moves from location to location getting attached to new zones as you travel. Your player aggregate is itself part of the Jang graph and your location and state are persisted by the replication layer scribes to the entity graph of your given territory. When you interact with dynamic objects and their properties change, the state of that entity will not persist until it is it's, this instance of the database is undeployed. There are, in fact, multiple copies of the universe that are seeded at a given time. We call those shards. Each shard is a unique copy of the game world, complete with all of its entities and unique states. Think of it as an alternate universe. Dynamic entities that have been modified in each dimension will have different states. The bottle on the bar was moved, or the door was destroyed, might not be in the same state between shards. This technique is a way to gain scalability as our player base grows. A single shard can grow to host multiple millions of entities. Even if each shard database is itself clustered and can grow substantially past a single machine, there is a point where multiple clusters are needed. As you join the persistent universe, the matchmaking system is getting retooled in order to select the correct universe shard for you to play on. Using multiple data points like your friend's location, your active party, your last game session, and or which shards still have items on it that you own. This is to ensure as much as possible that you end up on the same shard you expect to be as a player. In order to provide a seamless game experience, it would be terrible if you lost items you used when you were in a given shard versus another, or if your character was bound to a shard forever. To alleviate this, the system includes the concept of stowed and unstowed entities. An item is considered unstowed when it is currently active in a shard database and being actively simulated on by the worker nodes of the replication layer. Stowed entities are player-owned entities that are stowed in inventory containers or location inventories. Those entities live in another database entirely, called the global database, a large cluster database that spans all shards. Aggregate routes in that shard are stored and linked with edges to inventory nodes. Any entity in a shard can have an inventory node in global for stowing things in it. For example, a box entity that is unstowed in a shard would have an inventory node in the global database to store its content. This allows to keep unsimulated entities in a non-shard specific database while keeping the live aggregate within the shard. As you transition between shards, your playing character gets unstowed into the selected shard. This process effectively moves your player aggregate data from the global database to the shard database. Your player entity now gets simulated by game worker nodes and is being updated at a regular rate as you play and move around the game world. Accessing items that are stowed, like a ship, from the ASOP terminal is basically reading the inventory contents of the global graph at your location. Same goes for personal inventories or cargo inventories. When you request a ship to be spawned, the system will unstow the ship onto a landing pad by submitting a shard mutation. Alternatively, when a ship gets despawned during parking at a rest stop, the ship gets stowed back into the global database, making it available for unstow in any shard. The global database is where all of your stowed items will live. Hero items will always be available for unstow in any shard if they are not already in use. The process of stowing and unstowing also helps to alleviate problems related to entity authority so that only game worker nodes in the right shard can update unstowed entities in that shard. This brings about a nice property of the server meshing and persistent streaming architecture in that the state of the entities are being persisted transactionally during play, be it in a shard or a global database through stowing, a single server crash, or 30k, should no longer result in item loss. This model also has a real scalability benefit that stems from the separation of the read-intensive work no workloads that are isolated to the global DB from the write-intensive workloads that are handled by the individual shard database. The global graph exists to provide seamless access to your belongings no matter what shard or alternate universe you're currently playing in. Okay, let's go back to Paul to learn about some of the benefits of the server meshing architecture. 
Yeah, the first benefit is obviously the advantage that we don't have this issue of synchronization between different server nodes. Each server node has one single connection to the replication layer, which is used to push and get updates for entities of interest. The second advantage is that the same streaming and replication logic that we already use for clients can be applied to servers and that server nodes will only stream in a small area which will greatly increase performance. It also allows us to increase resilience down the road. As long as a client is connected to the replication layer, the client stays connected even if the server node crashes. In this case, the simulation for an entity may be stopped for a moment, but as soon as a new server comes online, the simulation will just continue. While the underlying tech is close to completion, there are some upcoming challenges that we need to solve before we can give that into your hands. The first version of this technology will contain a static server mesh. Instead of the fully dynamic mesh that we saw earlier, the static mesh assigns server nodes to predefined sections of the solar system. This will reduce the amount of authority transfer that game code has to address in this first release. Um, there will also be a lot of challenges for the game services and uh, game feature teams. Or maybe Benoit can give a little bit more. Yeah, there are many parts of the game that are affected by this new server meshing uh, architecture. So any gameplay features that uh, has to rely on the concept of a server, right? Currently, when you connect to a game server, we know what match you're in. So to send messages and update to that server, we simply locate your active match and then send those messages out there. That concept needs to change because we now have a mesh to deal with. And so there are multiple game servers that need to receive this information. They need to be able to subscribe dynamically to it or unsubscribe dynamically to players transitioning uh, through them. So you can imagine that this will affect things like missions that currently are spawned locally on the game server. These now need to be spawned globally within the shard and also persist their state. So all services that are attached to missions, uh, where, whether it's the quantum system in the, back, in the back end or the quasar tools, need to now know about the concept of a shard. This also goes deep into like things that are mechanical, like you know getting global chat to work on a server. That concept now needs to be extended to the shard, where this will probably push us to implement this as a location-based chat, for example. And so many teams in the company now need to change their feature to take into account the meshing technology that's behind it, because the concept of server, which has been ingrained since the beginning, has changed to become a mesh of servers. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I also want to shout out to the network team who's working on the replication layer and the bind culling, as well as the persistent tech team who's working on the entity and object container streaming. And as Benoit said, also all the other teams that work on gameplay features or gameplay services that are affected by this new technology, um, there are a lot of devs working on this and we are very excited to push on this new technology. Thank you for your time. Incoming transmission. Is this working? Good. Hey, look, I don't have much time. They call me Chris the Menace, and I have been framed for homicide. I am here at the Clutcher Rehabilitation Center. I have a bounty on my head for 500,000 credits. I am offering 1 million credits for somebody who come and rescue me. I can't leave. I am being watched. I need help. I don't have much time. Please come and help me. Come. Miners are of a unique breed. It's not about doing the job. 
It's about doing the job right. No matter how small or big, you need the right tools. Argo Astronautics, doing the job right. From our starfarers to our labs, offices, and facilities, and in communities around the verse. We're continuously innovating to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. Ultima Energy. Who said he could use my set? All right, fine. So we're going to redo the whole thing now with no graphics and uh, orange lights. Ready? So we introduced the replication layer a new and improved architecture for meshing servers. Uh, it solves our problems observed in the naive meshing approach, namely multiple connections and authority. Uh, the entity graph is the persistence of the replication layer and uses graph data to persist the entire game universe. And the main focus of all of this is on making all game systems and features work in a no server concept where multiple servers are needed. Also, that the first release will likely be a static server mesh, and it will come, as all things do, I see you asking in the chat, when we feel it's ready. He really comes in here and uses my lights. Now, moving along, earlier in the day, we saw the first look at the Anvil Liberator, revealed earlier today during the Ship Talk panel. So check out the website to learn more, and you can submit your questions for the Q&A on Spectrum that'll be released in the coming days. Also, don't forget about the hashtag uh, SC Watch Party on Twitter and Instagram contest. I can't help but notice that uh, morphologists and Burks have one going, and I wasn't invited. I mean, I wasn't invited to any of them now that I think about it. I mean, 315's not out yet. I could just backspace and respond there in a jip. I was going to do a gag where I hit the button and then fell on the floor, but I don't feel like it anymore. But up next, my vote for sleeper hit of the day, Addie and Graham take us into the world of Claudius, the next big thing from CIG Audio in the sounds of space starting now. Hi, my name's Graham Phillipson, and I'm lead audio programmer here at Cloud Imperium Games. Hello, I'm Eddie Kelch, and I'm one of the sound designers working at Cloud Imperium Games. And we're here to talk about some of the big developments we've got going on in audio tech, specifically SIG Audio and Claudius, which is a new audio engine layer and associated tool that we hope will greatly improve the development experience of our sound design team. Getting started on this project can be quite challenging due to the amount of tools that we have involved in implementing audio into the engine. And with the Claudius tool, we aim to streamline that process as much as possible. This talk will be very much focused on workflow and tech, and as such, there won't be too many sort of exciting explosion sounds going off and things like that. But you know, this is all about how we improve the workflow for our sound design team, and we know these guys can make amazing sounds anyway. Thanks, Graham. So before we get into the new stuff, let's take a little look at the history and where we are now and what inspired us to go down this development path. Up until this point, so much of the data that we use has been owned and stored in the data of other tools that are not owned by the audio team or by the audio code team. Tools such as Mannequin, the character tool, TrackView, UI code, DataForge, all of these tools are designed for other teams to work with and audio can sometimes feel like a bit of an afterthought within those tools. Additionally to this, because the data is stored within the files for those tools, 
we end up with a lot of data that's scattered around different areas. It can be difficult to dig in and find what we want. Also, when we're loading these tools, we have to load up all the data. So for example, if it's an animation tool, we have to load lots of animation data when really we're not actually working with that. There can be huge learning curves involved and lots of time spent switching between tools that impacts our development by swallowing up time. A lot of our ways of working haven't changed in a very long time, and we thought it was time to take a step back, look at all the challenges we face, and see if we can come up with solutions for all of them by coming up with a completely new design that addresses all the issues that we face day to day and tries to overcome them in an elegant way that makes the sound designers' lives much easier and makes their jobs much more fun. And this is what we came up with. So with Claudius, what we did was we put workflow at the very core of the design. From day one, when we started working on the design of the SIG Audio and Claudius systems, we wanted to make sure that workflow was always the focus of how things were working. We never wanted the tools to get in the way any more than they need to. And we wanted to make sure that the tools could be as smooth and as fun to use as they possibly could be. I think that this uh, designer comes first workflow is quite important and it's going to become an integral aspect on this project. Currently we have quite a bit of focus shifting and that tends to break momentum. Um, not only that, uh, audio seems to be treated a lot as a production aspect of the game at the moment and this tool is going to help shift that to post-production where it should be. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. One of the main things we wanted to do with the tool was to make sure that it could be used as a post-production tool so that you could take, you could effectively take a finished feature of the game where no audio guy had seen it at all. The audio code could be implemented really quickly, and then the sound design could be implemented on top of that really quickly, and this could all be done completely downstream of all the stuff that happened before it. Uh, obviously, in practice, we're working on this game in parallel with lots of other teams, and we never work in the, in the, the sort of post-production way that like a, you know, an actual film post house would work. But by carrying over some of those principles, we've, we think we've made a really good tool, and Part of how we've achieved that is by sort of completely abstracting the audio data away from the code that calls it. The calling code knows nothing of what the result of what it, will, what it is saying will do. So it will trigger some parameters and some events, but it doesn't know what the audio system will do as a result of that. And there's a very clear decoupling between the audio system and the game that calls it. And likewise, within the audio system, we, uh, we don't care where the events and parameters came from. All we care about is what we do with them and how it makes things sound good. And now, with all this data in one place, uh, it's going to make it extremely swift and also a lot more inclusive uh, to fix bugs. By inclusive, what I mean is audio QA is going to become an even more integral part of the team. They're going to be able to quickly fix these things on the fly. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Like, because we've got all this data in one place and we've also got the game's behaviors in one place, what we've done is we've integrated all the debugging tools into the exact same tool that the sound designers are using. So an audio QA person is working in exactly the same place, but they've got an interest in some different data. So what they care more about is like, why is something not sounding as it should? Or is the system behaving as it should? And we want to offer up all the information that they need. And what that means is that then they can easily pinpoint where the problems are. And in some cases, they can probably fix them because the fixes become so obvious. Coupled with that is that we want the sound designers to be able to completely trust the tool so that when you implement something in Claudius, you know it's going to work in game. And fundamentally, there's, there should be no difference between you implementing something and playing it out and actually running the game in a real game scenario and doing the same thing. So what we want to do is make it so that if anything doesn't work, that's a code bug, that's on us guys, we need to fix it, and you guys can completely trust the tool. And that means that you don't need to spend lots of time testing I think uh, trust is a good word. I think that trust is also going to be uh, coupled with the just a whole new improvement in uh, in our daily lives when it comes to implementing audio into the into the game. So let's take a little look at Claudius itself. Uh, what we've done is we've introduced a uh, visual scripting language that allows you guys to implement whatever you want, and we provide tools that hopefully allow you to do all the creative things that you need to do with the audio. But the design of Claudius under the hood is, is, is interesting because the tool itself doesn't hold any data of its own. All it does is exposes data that exists within the game engine. What this means for us is that live update, as in when you make a change in the Claudius tool, it live updates in the game and it immediately responds and the change that you made is immediately apparent in the game. That means it comes as standard. 
because we're actually operating on the data that the game is running with. And actually, because of the design, it's not possible to implement an audio feature without implementing live update. And that was at the very core of this design, because again, we were completely thinking about workflow, about ease of use, and about limiting the amount of time you guys spend sort of, you know, rebooting the game or you know, trying mm. to get your actions to be reflected in the game. You already uh, mentioned it, but I think that you know, little to no code support aspect of Claudius is really going to be groundbreaking for us. I think that life is going to become iteratively a lot easier uh, as we're able to just quickly, you know, just not again, focus shifting, right? That's not going to really be a thing anymore. Uh, and that's going to be great. Not only that, uh, all these parameters that we want to get access to based on the data, uh, we're going to get access to that by just going into the game, playing with something like a weapon. And by picking up that weapon, now that's going to, you know, be inherited by the by the character, so it means that we're going to be able to attach all these different sounds to that gun based on what the player is doing. And I don't know, it, it's going to make so many of these things uh, possible, and it, it just wasn't before. Yeah, what we're trying to do is make so much data available to you where you need it and in an intuitive way. And what that means is that, you know, when you, as you say, if you spawn a weapon in the game, it immediately becomes visible in the Claudius tool. And if you perform an action on that weapon, such as firing it or reloading it, those actions immediately become available and visible in the Claudius tool and available for you to implement. And what that means is that we're putting the implementation right alongside it happening in the game. Claudius uses a, a reactive programming model. And what that means is that as the data comes in, the visual side of what you see updates live and it updates immediately. And it also has some sense of what's relevant because if you're running an actor around, then the most recent events received by the game or sent by the game would be the movements of his limbs, the footsteps, that kind of thing. And you get to see those things immediately in the tool. Mm. And you can even filter by time. So you can look at things, you, you can like clear out the view, perform an action, and now that's the only thing you can see. So you get really quick, easy access to all the data that you need. Yeah. And all of this tech, I think, just puts us in a great position to continue to support the ever-increasing demands of CIG's games. I also think that the designers are going to be quite empowered by the amount of time that they're going to have to focus on the creative aspects because of this tool. Yeah, that's the whole philosophy of this design, is to empower the sound designers to be sound designers. Yeah. So let's take a look at a practical example, marking up a weapon in Claudius. As we've mentioned, all the events and parameters that arrive in the Claudius interface are things that have happened in the game. The game is just describing what's happened and it doesn't have any preconceptions about what the audio system should do. It simply provides data. So for example, the weapon fired, it now has five rounds in the magazine. The weapon fired again, it now has four rounds in the magazine. And lots of other information as well, such as you know, you know, the weapon fired and there was this much atmospheric pressure around it, or it was out in space and there was no pressure. You know, all these sort of contextual things become available. And the decisions about what that data actually means to you guys all completely come down to you. So all we do is we, as programmers, is we provide as much data as we possibly can in a place where you can use it. What amazes me about this tool is it's, it's going to just be as simple as, you know, hooking up a couple nodes and seeing the results in the editor. Uh, not only that, all this com complex logic that we have, uh, we're going to have access to all these parameters super easily. So the, the idea of, let's say, having a different reload sound based on the amount of ammunition in the mag, is it's going to be, you know, rather simple to, to implement. Yeah, absolutely. What, we, what we've done here is we've gathered all the data that may or may not be relevant to you, and we don't mind whether it is or not. We deal with all that code side, the efficiencies of that, and you guys get access to any data that you may or may not be interested in. So you could do like crazy things if you wanted. You know, yeah. you could make it so that the reload sound sounds different if there are, like you say, if there are d different number of rounds in the mag, but you might want to make the reload sound sound different if the, if the character's wearing armor or not. Yeah. I mean, that makes no sense, but, to, but you know, all this data becomes available to you, and it's totally up to you guys what you do with it. So we're opening up lots of you know possibilities. I think that comes back to empowering the sound designers again. I think all this freedom, creatively, is it's 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 going to be great. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that sort of giving you that creative freedom, I think, is going to be amazing to see what comes out of that. Because you know, for example, we can have uh, we can have something like a 
a parameter that says whether it's nighttime or not. And if you wanted, you could change the whole aesthetic of the game, change all the sounds based on it being nighttime, yeah. and, and that would require no input from the code team because we've given you the data that you need. So let's dig down a little into some specific features of Claudius and look at budgeting and aggregation. In this video, we have a set of audio trigger spots that are all playing the same sound. We haven't applied any sort of budgeting to them, so they all play, they're all taking up resources, and we can hear them all, so you know, the mix can be a little bit sort of muddied by just how many of them are playing. I want to show here just how simple it is to deal with that and to reduce the budget for the sounds that they're playing. So here we go to the audio source settings and we, we're going to add um, we're going to add a new category, which is how we budget. And we're going to reduce the number of sounds in that category that can play at any one time. As I said before, this whole updates live. So um, every change we make now is going to be reflected in the game. And when we spin back to the, the game view now in the editor, you'll see that because we set the, the budget to five, only five of those sounds are now playing, represented by the sort of lighter green. We can go back and we can change the budget. And again, that will you know, we'll drop it a little bit more. And you can see now only the closest three to the camera are currently playing. And then we'll just whiz the, the budget back up so you can see they all come back again when, uh, when you do that. Now, that's the budgeting feature, and that's one tool to sort of reduce the amount of resources we use. But what we also do is allow you to deal with what happens when all those sounds that are not allowed to play because of the budget are prevented from playing. So what we do is uh, we have a system called an aggregation system. And every single one of those sounds that hasn't been allowed to play can contribute to a further sound that attempts to represent that crowd of, under, of, of sounds that were not played. So here we're going to do a really simple example. We're going to hook up uh, a sort of more musical tone to this, uh, to this aggregate. And what this aggregate will do is it will represent all of those sounds that aren't playing. Now, we offer lots of parameters to this aggregation system, but the aggregate is aware of how many sounds it represents. It's aware of the position. It's aware of the spread of them. So lots of information is made available to the sound designers so that they can represent this mass of sounds with just a single audio source. OK, so now we can see that there's a further green, light green blob in amongst all the dark green. And what that is, is that's the aggregated sound. So that will move to the center of wherever the crowd of non-playing sounds is. And as you can see, it kind of skips around in this video, but we, we have smoothing options so that it doesn't sort of jump around and become jarring. Um, it just moves around as quickly or slowly as you want it to with the crowd of sounds that it's attempting to represent. And what this means for us is that it makes it a lot easier to sort of clean up the mix if you've got a lot of things that have been added to a level. They've been added by a non-audio person and with maybe not so much understanding of the consequence of that. It gives us really easy ways of dealing with that. You can see here, if we increase the budget, the, uh, the aggregated sound moves further away. And then if we completely reduce the budget to nothing, then you end up with just a fixed aggregated sound right in the middle of the, uh, all the sounds that are playing. Uh, sorry, all the sounds that are not playing. Now, this is a really simple example. None of these sounds are moving. But if they were moving, then that blob would move appropriately to the position where all those sounds were moving. I think what this tech has showed us is um... For ambience work specifically, the designers are going to have quite a lot of uh, uh, creative freedom uh, to kind of go wild and rely on this technology to to help us clean up not only the mix but um, you know the the voice count and the channel counts. It's also a, a good way for us to create accurate uh, background dialogue, or as we call it, walla, for bespoke locations. And uh, I think it's going to bring a lot more life to to locations. Absolutely. But also, aggregate logic doesn't have to be used for those purposes. It can be used for more abstract purposes as well. So we can use the logic system within the audio system to understand how many of a certain thing exist in the game. So if, say, every tree tells the audio system that it exists, we don't necessarily want to play a sound on all those trees, maybe unless it's windy, which is a decision we can make if we want. But we can track counts and we can track you know, how many of a certain object type there are. And we can use that information to inform something like the mix. So you can have a mix that's maybe specific to forests. You want something to sound like a forest. You want to bring in some ambience that makes it sound like a forest. And that can all be driven by this set of data that we're not actually playing sounds directly on, but we're just using it to inform the mix.
Another feature that we have in Claudius is logic inheritance. And what that allows us to do is to implement a set of audio logic on a certain audio node and then inherit it on child nodes of that node so that we can override it, repurpose it, or make it just basically do the same thing as the parent node does. Now that's quite an abstract thing to say, I know, but um, what it means is that we can use a single set of events and parameters to express audio across multiple nodes in the game. I think this comes back to the example that we used before about you know a weapon reloading. Um, and so by overriding that logic, we're going to be able to place audio events on specific parts of the weapon uh, and make them perform based on what the character is doing. Um, yeah, it just seems like a really powerful tool to have. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's all about putting all the power in your hands. Yeah. You know, for example, you might have something like a, a, a character who jumps and lands, mm. and that jump event can be expressed on any bone of his body. So if he's wearing a watch, you can make it jingle. Yeah. You know, if, if he's if he's got a, a cracky knee, you can make it crack when he lands or something. And you know, all these different things can be done, and they're all available to you by default. And quite easy to implement as well, as we're yeah. seeing. Another thing we have in Claudius is a set of systemic parameters. And what they are is a set of parameters that are available by default to any audio node in the game. Things such as uh, atmospheric pressure, velocity, acceleration. So for example, you can do something like take the atmospheric pressure and the acceleration of an object, and you can use that to express some wind noise. And uh, that's something that previously would have allowed, would have required code support, but you guys can just dive in and do it on literally anything. You can add an audio, a SIG audio component to something that the audio system's never seen before, and you can start expressing the audio on these things in this way. Claudius, I think, rationalizes the whole process of uh, being a sound designer on this project. All that relevant information is going to be in one place, and it's going to be quite digestible, especially for people just getting started. Yeah, absolutely. We want the sound design process to be as organic as possible, and we want you guys to have the freedom to just express yourselves, and that's the point of getting all this data to you by default. Mm. So let's take a look at an example of something you can do using SIG Audio and Claudius without any code support. Here, we're adding a SIG Audio component to uh, an entity type that's never had one on it before. It's a really simple thing to do. We just drop the component in in DataForge, and then uh, we can jump over to the editor, and we can spawn one of these things. And I'm going to use the example of a, a plushie here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use some of these systemic parameters and events that are come for free without any extra code support. And we're going to use them to express it's a bit of a silly example. We're going to use them to express the contents of this plushie. So uh, what looks like a cuddly toy right now is going to turn into some sort of water container. So we're going to put a kind of water sloshing loop on this thing. So we need to respond to its spawn event and uh, also its despawn event. So the sound stops if it ever gets despawned. And we can add an audio source that is the water sloshing sound. And then if we hook that up, it's going to start playing that sound. But the way these uh, sounds are set up is that they don't play anything unless certain parameters are set on them. So they're muted until, for example, uh, they have some sort of rotational or directional movement on them. Because you don't want a, uh, an object to just sit there playing a sloshing sound when it's not moving. So we're going to hook up some parameters as well. We're going to hook up the uh, systemic acceleration and velocity parameters. And we're going to just demonstrate a little bit of, you know, we're not going to go into sort of too complex logic here, but we're just going to demonstrate a little bit of what you can do. So we're going to multiply them by each other. And then the result of that, we're going to set it on a couple of uh, parameters on that object. And then, as I said before, you know, everything is live updated. So we're going to see the result of what we do here. We're going to hear the result of what we do here immediately once we've done it. So just finish hooking this up and we'll pass over to uh, the editor view once that's done. Oh, one last thing we need to do before we can make that happen is because this entity's already spawned, we need to send its spawn event again. And in Claudius, you can send any events that are set up uh, for debugging reasons, uh, which is really useful. So now we can see the green blob, which says the sound's playing, but we can't, we can't hear very much because there's no velocity or acceleration. Now, as the character runs around carrying it, we can hear the sloshing sounds, we can hear them play when it's dropped, and all this is coming from this set of parameters in Claudius that are being multiplied together just for a bit of fun.
So all that was done without any code support. The, the code system had never seen that entity before. It could have been literally any entity in the game. And what we've done there is we've been able to express the contents of that entity without any additional help from the code team. So that's a really sort of freeing thing for the, uh, the sound designers to have available. As we've seen with how easy it is to implement something like this, uh, we have a lot of control over the physics, and it gives us no reason not to add sounds to literally everything in the game that's interactable and that can move. It's going to bring a lot more life. Uh, the speed that we can get this done with, it's going to make iteration a lot more plausible. And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's going to be have quite some interesting outcomes. So yeah, it opens up a line of creativity. It opens up a line of uh, experimentation. And that goes you know, hand in hand with how quickly this was uh, achieved. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the example there was quite a silly one. It was, it was you know, putting a water yeah. sloshy sound where it doesn't really belong. But um, as I said, you know, the, it doesn't matter what that entity is. It could be a little cuddly uh, plushy thing or it could be like a, a 400 foot tower that's falling and hitting the ground. And those same parameters can be used to express the sounds of that thing, to express the weight and the size of that thing. And, uh, you know, this tech isn't so limited to props and carryables. It can be used on literally anything. Anything that can move, you can express its movement using these parameters. I think you touched on a really important point there, which is a cause and effect. Um, I think that's one thing that it's quite a tricky phenomenon to implement into games. Uh, but with Claudius, it's it. I mean, it's going to be you know almost a breeze. Uh, we're going to be able to hold values uh, based on a parameter, for example. So let's say if you shoot this plushie, it'll you know trigger a very high value for for that movement and uh, based on that we'll be able to change the sound that you know happens after so let's say if you shoot the plushie pick it up again instead of a cute cuddly noise it can make like a really angry like why did you shoot me <laughs> sort of grumble um and and yeah it's 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 gonna add a whole new level of depth uh to to these interactable objects and other things in the game as well yeah, and those examples are just, again, it's all about unleashing creativity. Exactly. It's about sort of offering all the data that you need to be able to do whatever you want. And, and there may be things that we never even thought of, but by abstracting these systems in such a way that, and by making all this data available to you, it no longer becomes a coder's problem what you guys want. We just give you everything. Yeah. The SIG Audio and Claudio systems are designed with collaborative working in mind too. So the way that communication and uh, the way that actions are performed in, in Claudius is that the Claudius app sends a request to the game engine to make some sort of change to the audio logic. And only when that request is fulfilled does the change actually reflect itself back in the Claudius UI. And this is tied into that whole concept of uh, there's only one set of data owned by the engine and we change it live. So by having this design, what we've been able to do is allow multiple connections of multiple Claudius clients. And because they're all connected via web sockets, they could be on separate PCs. What this means is that if a sound designer needs some assistance or just wants to collaborate with another sound designer on some sort of logic set up in Claudius, they can do that incredibly easily. They can uh, connect their Claudius client to somebody else's game client simultaneously while that person has their copy of Claudius connected. And then as they make changes to the logic, they're reflected on both users' Claudius screens simultaneously. I think that's uh, quite a cool feature to have. Uh, a lot of the time when we're working, you know, I'll need to call up either technical sound design or a colleague um, and share my work. And they'll just be through sharing the screen. And there's a lot of, you know, no, go there, go there and finger pointing. Um, and it, 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 you know, it can be quite time consuming and make it difficult to, to quickly get a point across. Um, and with this tool, I'll be able to, like you said, connect and just mark up, you know, a gun, for example, or one of these uh, physics prop on the go. Um, with them. And uh, that can also spark quite a few ideas, just that that very easy back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and every connected Claudius con uh, client has full control. Mm. So you anyone can make any changes, even the undo system works across all clients. So you could make a lot of changes uh, to demonstrate something and then disconnect. And then the other person can just hit the undo button to get rid of all that stuff and then start, you know, 
doing something else that's maybe inspired by what you showed them or something like that. And I think it all just really sort of uh, lends itself to having a lot of collaboration between sound designers, which is always a good thing. I think now with the whole working from home situation, a tool like this is really going to be invaluable. It's it's going to allow the sound designers to connect a lot more. QA to work with sound designers is a lot easier. Uh, technical sound design, dialogue, it's, it's really just going to, you know, bring us all closer together and uh, hopefully spark some very interesting ideas. So let's take a little look at some of the code that underpins these systems, because when we went away and wanted to start designing this thing, we, we obviously had workflow in mind and we wanted that to be, uh, to create a, a situation that was as, as smooth and as easy as possible for sound designers. But as a code team, we serve two masters. And what we don't want to do is to um, implement those things for the sound designers at a cost that's too great for the engine team. So we need to avoid uh, high CPU usage. We need to avoid blocking the main, you know, the critical paths of the game. And we do that by moving all of our audio processing onto audio threads and onto audio jobs. And all the commands that cause that audio processing to happen are all transmitted through uh, lockless queues. And what that means is that the game can tell us what we need to know and we get out of the way as quickly as possible. And that allows the game to run as freely as it can without audio sort of contributing to frame rate drop or contributing to um, high CPU usage. Because we've moved all that stuff into the audio system, what it means is that something like a, a, a feature that we would have maybe in ship code, like something that's very specific to thrusters, would now become a systemic feature in the audio system. And what that means is, again, it frees up your creativity because we might have created something as an idea that assists with making thrusters sound good, but instead of it being kind of hidden away in the thruster code and only able to be used by those, it's now available to you wherever you want. And you can kind of use some of these tools in, a, in whatever sort of uh, you know, creative ways you can think of, whereas you know, before they were hidden away, now they're completely available to you. And this also frees up audio coders' time because we spend a lot less time sort of, you know, working to make features that exist in one place exist somewhere else. Literally, every feature exists everywhere for every system. So that, again, so helps um, the audio code team to uh, spend a lot more of their time being creative too, which is a really good position to be in. We also have some features that even bring audio code into the realm of post-production, much like the, uh, the sound design is. So we can live rebuild the code while the game is running. And that's something we've been able to do for a long, long time. But what Claudius does, because it uses this reactive programming model and it, and it can react to the game's sort of transmission of events and parameters immediately and present them to you immediately, we can actually boot up the game and start up a feature we've never seen before and start playing around with it and find the bits where the audio needs to be. And then we can live add the code, rebuild it on the fly, and then it's already available to you guys. So we're making it so that collaboration between sound designers and, and audio coders becomes something that is just, it's almost as good as a collaboration between sound designers. It's like something we can, we can uh, go from nothing to a fully working feature without stopping the game. And then because of all the design that this is all built on and you know all the way that we want to make sure that everything persists, you don't need to like go back into the game and test it. What that means is that we can effectively implement both the code and the audio setup, save it, and we're literally done. And that's just saving so much time compared to sort of um, all the iteration time that they spent like rebooting the game, rebooting editors, rebooting tools, swapping tools, and all that kind of thing. So yeah, this, this puts code, uh, you know, at least partially in this production or post production realm as well. Yeah. So we've looked at a lot of the features that we've already developed for Claudius, but we have lots of plans for the future too. Um, the design of Sig Audio and Claudius aims to solve future problems before we know what they are. And where it can't solve them completely, it's going to make it easier to solve them. As new game features come along, and we don't know what they're going to be yet necessarily, um, we want to be able to support them as quickly as possible, but also we want to be able to reuse everything we create. And the SIG Audio and Claudius design is, is central to that. It's all about reuse and it's all about having systemic features that are available to sound designers. I think what's so great about this uh, technology is that we're going to be able to take all this information from the game, uh, bring the audio engine into the game engine, um, and just you know make it all so easy to access. I think one key aspect of uh, 
of Claudius that the audio team is really looking forward to is sympathetic audio. So this is the cause and effect that we were talking about before. I think it, having this uh, like one event trigger another, for example, it's going to make the, the game a lot more cinematic. Um, everything's going to be real time. We're not going to have to pre-render all these events. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's basically going to become procedural, which means that every, you know, a lot of these scenarios that you get into, a lot of these different contexts uh, that, that you can get into while you're playing the game, um, we're going to accommodate them. Um, and you're going to get, you know, really uh, just vastly different experiences every time you do something. And this is because we can infer so much from the game data um, and create those links to create a beautiful experience. Um, a lot of the time we think about like, how can we sonify this nonlinear spectacle of a game? And I, I truly believe that that is through cause and effect. It's, it's having things done in real time and conveying all this information to the player uh, that, you know, can be critical. So if, if, for example, you're flying and you start to enter a debris field or an asteroid field that all those things can start having an effect on the, you know, environment around you. You can start hearing creaks. Uh, if you're entering the atmosphere, you can tell like that your ship's going through some strain and uh, instead of pre-rendering it, it can happen in real time. It can take values uh, from like atmospheric pressure, temperature, and you're, it's, 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 it's going to be, you know, quite a amazing experience for the players. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, at the core of uh, sympathetic audio is this idea of resonance and, and with the sympathetic audio design that we have, we'll be able to give objects resonant frequencies and we'll be able to make it so that you know, if something sort of uh, broadband in its frequency uh, spectrum goes off like a, a huge explosion or something like that, then you're going to expect a lot of uh, metal panels and, and glass windows mm. and things to, to rattle and resonate in, in, in sympathy. That's yeah. got in sympathy with uh, with the explosion. That's and, no, and all we really have to do is just set up the logic for that to happen, and it'll happen. Um, and yeah, really eager and interested to see what um, the players are gonna have happen to them yeah. through their playthroughs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you know all the all the features that we're looking to develop. Uh, are, are all about bringing this game to life more yeah. and, and, and making it more cinema cinematic and, and making it, you know, just feel more immersive. Yeah, super high fidelity. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're looking at sort of improving the mixing support so we can gather some of this. You know, we've got a huge amount of data coming in now that can be used in lots of ways to uh, decide which sounds play and what, para you know, how those parameters affect those sounds. But we can take a step back and look at the bigger picture and say, you know, we, we've got all this data that's telling us what's going on in the game. Can we then use that to sort of decide how the game should be mixed? So, for example, if, uh, if you're exploring a moon or something like that, you're going to want to hear a lot of the ambiences and maybe some distant mining going off and things like this. But then if you sort of end up engaged in battle with someone, that's something that the audio system's aware of through the data that's coming in. And maybe it can change the mix so that those ambient things don't really get so much of a look in anymore. And it's all about the battle focus and things like mm. that. And then again, as, as the battle ends and that kind of scenario falls away, we could automatically you know, analyze the data and say, okay, we're now back into an ambient situation. So you know, let's raise the, the level of some of these ambient sources again yeah I think that you know importance to what the uh, what the player needs to hear at that moment I think that's for especially on the FPS side that's gonna really be valuable so that concludes our look at some of the features and tech that we have in development in the SIG Audio team right now. Um, hopefully it's going to make the lives of the sound design team uh, much easier and hopefully some improvements to the way the game sounds too yeah I think um, the sonic aesthetic of the uh, this, this game is going to change for the better because of these tools and because of these workflow uh, improvements. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well, that's it from us. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your CitizenCon, and I really hope next year we can all be back together in person and we can see each other in person then. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Thank you. Cosmonaut is the premier online magazine for Star Citizen. Packed full of ship reviews, outfitting guides, upcoming events, org interviews, current affairs, history and more, Cosmonaut is your comprehensive guide to all aspects of life among the stars.
A talented team of writers, editors, designers, photographers and artists are all passionate pilots and aim to bring you stellar images, incisive articles and incredible design. Season 1 of Cosmonaut is available for download now. Head to www.cosmonautmagazine.com to get all 12 issues completely free. I've heard them say, with every goal comes a sacrifice. With every dream comes a letdown. You've got to give up something to get that big thing you're chasing. I couldn't disagree more. You see, everything is achievable. And you don't have to give up anything along the way. You want to know what I think? Sacrifice is what happens when you give up halfway. The Origin 300i. Sacrifice nothing. Achieve anything. This is Jack. Jack is a successful trader. Unfortunately for Jack, he encounters local pirates. They want ransom money, just a fraction of his profits. Jack refuses the proposal. In his mind, he is a hero. Now, Jack is dead. And all of his belongings go to the pirates anyway. Don't be like Jack. Be smart. Pay ransom. Sponsored by the Sinister Incorporated Pay Ransom Campaign. So, Marcus, you work for Addison's campaign, right? Uh, yeah. Did you guys get some sort of a winner's bonus? Well, yeah, we got a bonus. Oh, you did? How much? I did get myself a phoenix as a going away present. They got you a constellation phoenix? But hang on, why are we traveling on this rental tourist, Marcus? How was I supposed to know you'd prefer the phoenix? Oh, God, Marcus. You know what? I'm just gonna go have a shower. Route has been plotted. Quantum in 10. Uh, guys, there are no towels. You know, I think I had some towels in the Phoenix. Oh, no, just stop. <laughs> Sorry. Do not underestimate the talented and dedicated folks at CIG Audio. There is always a giant emphasis on video here, but none of it would ever hit the way that it's supposed to without that A to that V. And as we near the end of our show, we also saw the last of our community videos during the break, and I hope they stick around as a tradition for Citizen Cons going forward. For those of you who know my origin story, you might understand why I have a particularly soft spot for them but that's enough chat this is it we're at the end of our day it's time for one more panel and one more panel alone it's time for tony rob ben and luke to take you deep into the machinery beneath our universe in systematic gameplay stream of thought bon appetit Hi, I'm Tony Zervek, Director of Persistent Universe for Star Citizen. 
Today I'm going to tell you about some of the new technology, features, and content that we're aiming to deliver over the next several quarters, and how these things are going to impact your gameplay experience. To assist in that endeavor, I brought along a few others to give you some additional perspective, including SGS Assistant Director Rob Reininger, Senior Systems Designer Ben Dorsey, and, over in the UK, Lead Designer Luke Presley. Rob, we've been able to buy and sell commodities for years, but we're now looking to try and close out the entire loop by the end of the year by allowing players to sell weapons, armor, clothing, and eventually ships back to the shops. One of your favorite aspects of this has always been what it means to treasure. Can you elaborate a bit on that? I think it's huge because now it gives me a purpose to go out and collect the stuff because players are very meticulous. They'll go out and pick up every single gun, weapon, armor off of other players. Like loot generation is something that the Frankfurt team is working on. Uh, it means a lot for you know investigating lockers or just stripping down something we talk about salvage you know they, these are all things that are working towards the ability to buy and sell items but most importantly it's just curating your inventory right it's it's getting rid of this stuff it's another form of reward so i, I think it's a huge addition to the game sure and it also plays a big role in character advancement right yeah. because you can realize the equity from items that you've purchased in the past in other words i i buy a particular laser rifle now i decide that i want the better one i don't have to buy that one starting from scratch i can actually sell my original one assuming it's in pretty good shape and i basically pick the optimal shop at which to sell it you know that's a you know a shop that deals in that specific item, then I can actually get a pretty good price for that used item. I can then take that money and apply it and you know the differential towards moving up the ladder and basically getting better yeah. and better stuff. And so just like in the real world, it's like you don't usually start from you know from scratch and buy you know buy a house and then basically you know uh, have to you know buy another one from scratch. You basically take your you know realized equity in your original and you throw it into the other one and you just Reinvest. pay the difference. Yeah, and that's something that we don't have in the shops right now. Everything is is in the shop on a per item basis, and items sometimes come with default loadouts on them, like a sniper rifle or a set of armor or uh, ships are a great example of something that comes with the default loadout of certain laser cannons and power plants and etc. So as we go forward with selling, one of the things that we want to do is get an itemized price for every single attachment that's on an item, which includes laser scopes, magazines, uh, any uh, underbarrel attachments, right, things like that. So. Now that these have their own individual price, it's much easier for us to one, tune the economy. So now it's this thing is more expensive or less expensive. As stats change, we can, we can keep up with the, the statistical improvement of the item on a per item basis. Sure, you have the macro item, it consists of the child items. We change the price of the child item and the, you know, the macro item, the, big, the large item that includes you know, various quantities of this, its price is automatically adjusted, which is not something that happens now and causes us countless problems. Yeah, and, and it means that now we, we have less moving parts to, to worry about on a, on a global basis. And from a what is the world uh, have for sale in it. You know, you talked about, you know, taking something to a shop that deals in those items. That's, it's kind of the concept of, well, this shop deals in it and they refurbish it. They have an invested uh, value in procuring those things back from people in the universe. So we want to encourage players to go around to the different places that have the best price for it, much like commodity trading, right? We, we want players to go here because they can buy it for the best price, go here because they can sell it for the most money. Uh, same principle for selling items, right? So this shop deals in it, you should be able to go there and get more money for sure, it. Sure, and we, and we need this more you know, sophisticated method of determining the pricing of the more complicated items yeah. you know, that are composed of lots of child items, partially because of what it means to selling. In other words, I, when I go to sell my, you know, my, my pistol, I may have a custom scope on it, something for which we don't have a specific entry in our you know, global retail products list and that says this item should, if it were new, cost this much. This winds up becoming something to where, sure, we've got the base price of the pistol and we've got the base price Price, you know, of you know, of the scope, but we don't have any sense of what the combination is. As of right now, we don't have a means of solving that, and so this this is why we you know we are going to be pursuing changing even how the shops specify their default you know inventory. Like right now, we actually 
have shops the specify like every entries, individual yeah. item that they can sell as opposed to where we're going is it'll be classes of items this you know yeah. this particular shop deals in you know in in small handheld weapons uh, you know from this particular manufacturer now because they actually deal in small handheld weapons they will in fact purchase you know small handheld weapons from a different manufacturer right. you just won't get you know quite as good a price because they're not as adept at repairing them and they don't have a clientele that's you know that's geared towards purchasing those items etc you if you wanted to realize you know the best possible price then you would wind up taking your you know your your specific you know items to a shop that dealt in those specific things that's right. and that's where assuming the condition was perfect and assuming that the shop had a lot of cash on hand with which to procure these deals and so was willing to be a little bit more liberal that's where you could potentially recoup you know 70 80 you know, you know 85 percent of your original value whereas if you go to someone that simply you know sure they you know they deal in small arms but not necessarily that you know that particular manufacturer, not you know that particular caliber weapon or whatever the case may be. Then maybe only get forty or fifty cents on the dollar. Exactly. It's like when you're dealing with a car dealership. Like if you bring them their their brand of car, they're going to pay you more for that than if you brought it's, them. It's it's easier for them to service. Their exactly. mechanics are already familiar with it. They can do the They've work the at cost. They can sell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Totally. Uh, makes sense. It's it's big and it's something that it just feels natural, right? It's how the world really works, and we want to continue to to push that forward. Three point fifteen is a huge update to the game because of the localized inventory that's going to totally change the game. There are several aspects to this, and that starts with, I'd say, the personal inventory manager that Rich Tire and the Actor Feature team have put so much work into. They're going to cover that in a separate discussion, so we'll leave that out of you know uh, out of here. Um, on, over on our side, we've got the vehicle loadout manager, which has been adapted to al only allow you to modify vehicles that are in your immediate vicinity. And then we've also added a new Moby Glass app called Knickknacks. Um, Reiniger, so you've spent the last couple of quarters heavily focused yeah. on this. Go ahead and walk us through what's changed, starting with the front end menu. Yeah, so the front end, we've historically allowed players to kind of go wherever they want, right? But as we move forward with the game and the new player experience, we want players to be invested in their home location. So it's, it's more of selecting a home base because the inventory that you have at the start of your account that's entitled, you know, through all your web purchases, through whatever, you know, subscriber flares, et cetera, all of this stuff is going to go to that location as it's physicalized in the world. So now, you have a home base of operations. That's your place. As we explore out throughout the universe, you may move some of that stuff to a new place as you get persistent halves here, a new hab over there, persistent hangar, right? Uh, players are gonna be tangibly going up to, interacting with their, their weapon rack, interacting with the stuff in their ship. And so localized inventory is a massive change to how they've dealt with the game in, up till now. Uh, gone are kind of the days of this global inventory that you can go and, and interact with anywhere in the universe. If your stuff is at Microtech, you need to go to Microtech to do it. If it's in this hangar over here, you got to go to that hangar. So we want players to feel the, the pressure of prepping for a trip, right? It's, it's as you go out, this is the mission I'm going to do. This is what I need to go and do that mission. So I want to go here, get this, get this, or maybe go to a shop here and buy that. Uh, and so the front end is going to be the, the first step in kind of planting your seed uh, wherever it is in the universe from the very start. So what about the Knickknacks app? So this this allows you to basically, in its first incarnation, to see where you've placed all of your sure. loot throughout the entire solar system. It works on a hierarchical basis, so you can drill down into a particular planet, see you know the city. At the city, you can basically see what ships you have stored there. You can look within your ship and you know right. eventually see you know what cargo grids and you know what what you know storage closets you have within there and what items you have placed within there. You've also got a number of filters that allow you to quickly drill down through your your entire right. inventory and find you know all the you know the laser rifles or whatever else it is that you're you know specifically searching for. Can you just you know walk through that in a little bit more detail? As we kind of go into the localized inventory, the the VMA can only act on the ships that are at that location. Uh, the you kind of lose perspective of the global view because the personal inventory manager that the Actor Feature team has done has removed the PMA, which was also your kind of uh, global view into your personal items. So the Knickknacks app allows you to kind of see where your stuff is distributed around the world uh, at the individual location level. So whether it's in a ship or in a hab or in a hangar, uh, right now the locations are, are basically cities or stations, 
pretty much any place that has a shop that sells items, that can be some place where you can store stuff. So the, the ships also have their local inventories associated with them, so you can store things in the ship. And the, the Knickknacks app is, is good because now you, if you want to find laser rifles, you've got, you can search by type or, or subtypes, uh, basically the, the same things that you see in the shop, so the categories that you see in the, in the shop UIs. Uh, that's the same level of, of interaction and, and filtering that you'll have in Knickknacks. We've spoken a bit about how it's going to evolve in the future and what new capabilities we would wind up adding to it. You know, trading you know with other players is one of the things that's at the top of the list. Yeah, right. Right, clicking on something, being able to say, "Hey, open a trade window with with Ben here." Uh, I want to be able to show me on the star map where this is. So yeah, we, we, something that we want to do in the mobile glass as a whole is context ability to bounce to different apps that are, are you know, contextually relevant to whatever you're currently using. So, Like saying this is in this location when that's just a string, like it's in Ol Olisar, that's not super useful. Seeing that on a map, that tells me something. That tells me I need to go from here to here, I need to plot this location. Right. I'm going to go through this dangerous area to get there in order to access my stuff. Or, and, or and a hyperlink on that. Yeah, yeah, right? and, and you can also very easily discern you know, distance and stuff, which is, yes. oh, well, this one's not here, very... but is it relatively close yep. or is it really, really far away? And I need to be able to obviously you know, put that into my planning. Yeah, or set a route to see how much fuel I'm going to use. Exactly. Right? There, there's a lot of different reasons why these things are, are kind of relevant. We want to try and preserve all those elements that CR really wants to push towards, but still give you the context switching that you're going to need. Another area that's currently under heavy development is physicalized cargo. It consists of multiple facets and will be released in stages, with the first one relating to shop purchases injecting physical entities rather than what I would call render proxies into your ship. This is going to convey all sorts of benefits and advantages you know, to the gameplay experience. The first and one of the most obvious is simply the fact that now that you've got a ship that has physical entities placed within it, then when another player winds up disabling, boarding your ship, they can actually extract you know, that cargo from you. There's value there that they can actually take. Whereas right now, the only way to get that value is you have to you know, blow up the ship, and then we basically yeah. you know, create you know, these, these, these cargo yeah, facsimiles yeah. that together. basically get <laughs> blasted out into space, and you have to go collect those, you know, yeah. et cetera. And so this starts to hint at things like you know, uh, the fact that we're going to want to bring NPCs into defending these ships. So all of a sudden, yeah. you get this fantastic gameplay transition, what I would say, where you have ships doing this momentum-based combat, mm -hmm. and now I can disable a ship, board it, and I actually have to overcome the NPC crew and then physically grab the cargo, haul it back to my ship. At the same time, you're concerned that while you're basically on the ship and lugging this stuff around, that security or you know allies of the ship that you've disabled might show up and start blasting you. And so all of a sudden, the considerations, uh, you know, just explode, you know, for doing something so right now relatively basic. And it's, it's one of the aspects that I really love of, about this game, which is how we can add this low level gameplay mechanic and, it, you know, in one shot, it's going to totally transform so many different, you know, elements of the yeah. game. And we get stuff like the whole sea, which, you know, is an, another hurdle beyond the physicalization of cargo. Uh, I think one of the things that, that just physicalizing the cargo really does is it allows for the gameplay that CR wants where you're not blowing up ships, right? You're destroying an engine, which is not a critical failure, right? D critical failures are the things that lead to these larger scale destructions, but on average, you're knocking a ship out of commission. You're able to board, you're able to acquire the stuff, you're not killing everybody on the ship just because it, it got taken down to zero health, right? Um, so the, these are all things that just physicalizing the cargo allows us to do. You mentioned the whole sea. So the whole sea has some unique challenges related to attaching physicalized cargo to it when you're actually you know, docked at a station or when you're you know, parked in a hangar and its wings are compressed. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so the whole C, because it, it does have these two different states, uh, now we have ATC considerations. If I have cargo on the outside of my ship, my wings are exposed, now I can only go to a docking collar. I can't go to the hangar. So the ACC needs to know to route you to these different locations. Uh, showing all this cargo on the outside of a ship beyond 
you know, think of adding additional ships to an area and, and the kind of, you know, uh, slowdown that you might see on, on a server, right? You're adding more physical objects that, that, that can be blown up, can be interacted with. So there's a technical challenge that we need to overcome as well. Uh, how they get on there, these, these are shipping container sized objects that have a, a real world weight to them. They need a tractor beam that, that is large enough probably on an Argo ship, right? Uh, so you, you'll get these little transport ships going from a stations, docking, you know, a cargo bay, flying it out to the whole sea. And, st you know, think of it as a person walking in and out, but it's, it's on a, you know, spaceship scale. Another thing that's really bothered me for quite a while is what I'd call the lack of transactional friction. And what I mean when I say that is that it takes the exact same amount of time to load or unload one unit of cargo onto your ship as it does 1,000 or 10,000. There, there's no friction you know, uh, in this process. Right. And that's completely different from the real world where mom and pop retailers and major port facilities you know, designed to rapidly load or unload you know, cargo onto you know, some big you know, uh, you know, f uh, freight ship are able to move you know, much, much larger quantities in a much, much shorter period of time. And you've got skilled dock workers that you, know, you can actually hire that are trained to basically deal with special types of materials and all that sort of stuff. Where, where we're eventually going with this is that shop purchases are going to inject physical cargo into a storage space, and it's then up to you, the player, to basically move the stuff from that storage space onto your actual ship. And there are going to be, I would assume that at this you know, point in time, half of the people watching this are saying that sounds you know, incredibly rough, awesome, right? yeah. and the other half are saying this sounds incredibly <laughs> so tedious, and it sounds like a lot of you know, forced like medial labor that's going to be completely, to... you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, completely right. lacking in fun. There, there is a method to the madness. I mean, where we're going with this is we're going to make the concept of moving freight onto and off of ships not just a logistical challenge, but we're actually gonna make sure that you know, it's, it's a, fun, you know, a fun experience. Yeah. And this would include everything from eventually adding a service beacon so that you could recruit your friends, your org mates, you know, people you don't know to basically come and help you move cargo. We'll eventually add the ability for NPCs to be, to be hired at that location yeah. and the price will fluctuate depending upon how many other players are requesting similar services. Um, and you can use those you know, types of you know, ca you know, capabilities if you simply want to pay a certain amount, have your ship loaded or unloaded, and you're gonna go fly around and do something you know, completely unrelated. So Dorsey, how is physicalized cargo going to impact the gameplay experience? I mean, in a bunch of ways. As you kind of touched on, there's the whole concept of, of needing to move cargo from one of those uh, storage areas into uh, that ship. We've actually run into a lot of problems where when you go across, when you come across a derelict, for instance, um, we have all these crates on there that you can offload in, in a lot of the events that we've done. And um, that amount of time that it takes to do that makes it so that when you then go to sell those crates, they can't they aren't worth the time, frankly, um, yeah, it's because it's, over time. Exactly. Yeah. It is so much faster to just park your ship and, and click the button and have it instantly get filled and then drive over to another place and have it instantly be unloaded um, that we can't make those that that process pay well enough to also be balanced when you're getting 16 to 20 crates off of a ship and it's taking you half an hour to do that. But once you make it so that there is a much more similar timeline between those two, um, you can make it so that there's a much bigger reward on a crate by crate basis. And that allows us to make it so that derelicts become a lot more common and offloading stuff becomes a lot co more common. There's also just some really great benefits in that we can make missions reward you by putting cargo out yeah, there. That's right. It doesn't have to be that the UEC reward of a mission is is the only reward. This mission gives you 5,000 every single time. No, there's a ship that gets blown up or you blow up or disable a ship and um, especially disable a ship and then you can board it and take that cargo off. For pirates, that becomes then the goal. Like blowing up a ship now becomes almost a failure. You don't want to. You want to disable it. You want to be able to get on it and then you want to take that cargo off. And of course, the crew is going to be fighting you the entire way there. They're going to um, have their, their people to try and fight off your boarding parties. You've suddenly transitioned to, into an FPS map by doing so, which is this really great transition that just doesn't really happen in a lot of games. And that's amazing. And 
even just from a, a, a pure like gameplay uh, system standpoint of, of carrying that crate, that is a, a very powerful state for the player to be in, in that they are vulnerable. You can't be shooting a gun and carrying a crate at the same time. Yeah, that's actually the, my, one of my favorite, you know, a, a things about this entire process is the fact that we're finally going to reward the player and basically provide this differential in the challenges yes. you know where we've long had you know blow the ship up the ship basically ejects some cargo you right. you know you tractor beam it up and now you basically got your reward but what it's missing is that 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 transition from FPS mo or uh, from ship based momentum based you know combat to where you know you're shooting your big guns at these things etc and now you're sneaking around corners and you may or may not try to be stealthy exactly. and you're basically trying to extract the cargo out and the crews basically you know coming out of the security areas of the ship and patrolling for you and trying to you know uh, you stop you also got friends trying to protect each other too while the other people are trying to move stuff I right and tractor beams are based on weight so it may take multiple people to exactly. actually move a heavier box. And CR wants the, the gameplay experience to be less ships blowing up, more this ship got disabled, the engines go out, and unless there's a critical failure, the ship doesn't explode. So the opportunity to board a ship will be more common as we move forward. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about in this area, and that's, you've, you've heard me you know, talk about this you know, often, which is eventually I want the whole transport occupation to kind of revolve around what I call like a hub and spoke model right. to where you've basically got, you know, big port facilities that are specifically designed to provide the the quantity of inventory and the, you know, and, and, and all of the infrastructure to quickly get that stuff on and off certain ships, um, as opposed to small mom and pop retailers that are really just intended to deal in a very small number of items. And one of the more significant problems we have in the game, because we don't yet have you know that level of realism, is related to we've got a we've got a small you know we've got a small mom and pop retailer, and we need to have a decent amount of inventory so that it can satisfy demand across potentially a hundred different players, all grabbing theoretically you know, one or two or three items. But what happens in the real game right now, because there are none of these limitations, there's none of this transactional friction is, is one big ship comes up and it purchases all 300 of them because, because it takes absolutely right. no time to do that. It then flies to a destination and it immediately sells it and it collects you know, only the slimmest of profit margins, but because there was no, t no loading time, there was no unloading time, they can still turn around and make a fairly you know, uh, good return on the amount of invested time you know they put into it and turning all of this cargo into physicalized entities and basically adding these logistical challenges to where you have to move stuff on move it off you know you know you have to be more careful with volatile cargo bigger you know crates will require you know argos to move them or cranes or forklifts or whatever the case may be all of this is ultimately going to push players into being more selective about where for whatever they're trying to do what types of shops and stuff they're going to visit. And what you're going to get is just like in the real world where you'll have super tankers bringing oil from across the ocean and basically parking it at some sort of port facility for offloading. And that will then be transported by, you know, whether it's pipelines, by rail, you know, by those types of things to, uh, to distribution outlets. And from there, it'll be picked up by trucks and transported to the local gas station. And from the gas station, that's where you, the end consumer, can expect to buy six or 12 gallons of gas, but in the real world, you can't, you know, drive your truck up to you know, a port refinery you know, on the coast and basically, you know, request, you know, five or 10 gallons of fuel. It's like they, they only deal in minimum quantities of 10 or 100,000 or 500,000, you know, barrels of fuel. And this will be the same thing that we're going to eventually, you know, support on our side to where if you've got one of these big, you know, whole sea ships and stuff, there will be specific locations where you know we're we're trying we're, we're we're really basically pushing you to do your business it doesn't mean that you can't go and park at a small place yeah. it's like i can have a super tanker and i can go i can go With, park on the side though right because you do have the docking collar restriction on on the whole c type sure. ship right and but i think this is what the going to the per box model will actually do for us because we can just make those small mom and pop shops only have the smaller 
volumes of, of like a, commodities, right? You, you talked about how if, if you can only upload, up, unload and offload one box at a time, I'm not going to do a Caterpillar there. Yeah, like, there's nothing there, right, right. stopping you, but there's something That's just it. If, if, I, if, I, if, if my, if, if my ship no. holds 10,000 units of inventory and I don't have any of the automated stuff, and this, you don't have enough dock workers. I can't hire. At this place, there literally aren't. 100 NPCs or 500 NPCs that I can hire for any amount of money, they're, they're literally just not there, then you're going to have to do it yourself or you're going to have to request some friends to help you. And it's simply too tedious. It, it's not that you, it's not that we literally prevent you from basically going there and extracting the material. It's that it's simply not going to be worth your time. You're going to have to invest so much time and effort into doing that, that all of a sudden you would need an astronomically high profit margin. And long before the profit margins on that particular you know, commodity or material get that high, someone else with a smaller, more efficient ship that can more you know, effectively you know, uh, be loaded with a smaller quantity of stuff and then navigate to some you know, to another small uh, location to basically uh, sell it, they'll wind up, you know, taking, you know, taking that material from that location. Which well, means I, for a cat, like a, a, one of those bigger ships, like one of the Hull series or something, you're going to want to, by just that nature, go to a place that has a, a, a cargo elevator that can give you 20 giant crates at the same time. Right. Yeah, that's that's that's, what I mean. that's like with, where with, you'll make that profit with the infrastructure. In it's like some places yeah. you'll have an elevator that basically gives you easy access to. 10 crates at a time, and, yep. a, and a bigger facility will have 50, and a bigger one still will have 200, and this one will allow you to basically hire up to four NPCs, sure. and one NPC can move you know, 10 crates yep. per hour. But you're going to be in competition with you know with that small number of NPCs with everybody else, so the price can get fairly high. And it, this other place will have up to 500 or a thousand workers that you can hire. So it may still take you know it may take hours, but you have you know but that's only because you're you know loading 10 you know 10,000 or 100,000 SEU of cargo you know in, into your hold. Another very interesting aspect of this is going to be that you're going to have relatively clearly delineated transport routes, right. supply routes within the system. And this provides us an awesome opportunity to more precisely tailor what types of challenges you should run into when you're basically moving a big freighter ship from point A to point B as opposed to this other location. In other words, if you think about you know, pirates are trying to, you know, uh, abscond, you know, they're basically trying to disable your ship and, you know, and, and plunder it, take, you know, whatever valuable materials, you know, you have on board. But the types of ships that would be required to extract, you know, all of Very the fuel yeah. off, off of a big massive freighter are clearly dramatically different than the ships that would be needed to effectively and efficiently, you know, plunder a far smaller ship that deals in a totally different, you know, type of item or a totally different, you know, and more limited quantity of items. And so we'll be able to more more accurately tailor the gameplay experience so that you get the kinds of challenges you would expect. Well, and I think by nature it just it'll it'll allow it to naturally separate, right? You because it's not worth it over here and we can we can make those inventory volumes smaller to match the, the type of people that we want frequenting those stores, I'm just not going to waste my time. As a, as a large scale shipper, I'm going to go to the bigger places that can handle it, that can get me in and out faster, that I can hire more people, where there's going to be other people there that I can potentially hire, like the service beacon. It doesn't matter if I'm out in the middle of nowhere because nobody's there to that, come That have the specialists. Special, it's it's, it's yeah. only at these select ports right. where they actually have trained dock workers skilled in you know, in, in moving volatile cargo. And if you go to a place where you don't have it and you have, you know, Joe, you know, you know, Joe average, you know, NPC try to do it, then you may wind up, you know, suffering the consequences of, oh, you lost your cargo. It was blown up. Your ship was destroyed. You have to go to insurance, you know, reclaim, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all because you basically tried to, um, you know, Use a facility that was not appropriate for you know for the types of actions you were it's trying just to not do. Tailored to it, right? So it's uh, th I think it'll be a good change for the game. The key point from my perspective, though, is as much as possible, we don't want to necessarily make it black and white, right? right? Which is, it's not that you literally, as the owner of a whole sea, you're not able to buy fuel here. It's more that. You can buy it there, but it's going to, you know, if you're buying more than 10 or 20 units of it, it's going to be, you know, you're going to basically have to deal with the repercussions of trying to get all of that stuff onto here. And it's going to take a tremendous amount of time, and you're going to wind up 
having to pay an exorbitant premium because you're basically going to be depleting them of their entire you know inventory supply et cetera. And so it's really just you know the 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 logistical challenges that you would face trying to exploit you know non-optimal locations for the unloading or un, you know uh, for the loading or unloading of your cargo would simply not be worth it. Well, in the and end. I think another good point is that as you as you push the inventory to its limits, your bid ask spread is going to actually be going down as you you know price per unit of the cargo is is going to diminish as you get closer and closer to the inventory limits. So it's going to encourage you to go to places with those larger scale inventories so that you can keep your, your profit margin as high as possible. We completed the basic foundation for reputation late last year, and that followed that up in the first quarter with the release of the Delphi MobiGlass app that allows you to see exactly how different NPCs and organizations feel about you. This is a critical system within the game because it's the key mechanism by which you'll unlock more challenging and lucrative opportunities and gain access to organizations and areas that will bestow various benefits. We're still missing a few key pieces of the puzzle, though, and can't yet fully exploit this system. So over on the mission side, only the bounty hunting services give Give you a nice gradation of challenges at the moment, offer you more interesting missions as you gain reputation with them. Can you go into a little bit of detail about why this is? It, essentially, whenever we want to make a new mission, or even just a very small variant on a mission, it it requires an entirely new uh, record, a new new chunk of data that we have to put into the system, and that takes time. Um, to build out any kind of, of ladder is, is a, a, an awful amount of time, honestly. Some things that we want to do is just kind of make it so that some of that is more systemic and a little bit faster. And by doing that, we will be able to kind of um, explode wide, making it so that um, we make one mission, one template, and then just give it some variables that have some ranges. Um, and, and by doing so, we can, we can then allow it to almost generate its own chains of missions with difficulties that are driven by how much reputation you have, and those can give you different amounts of rewards and spawn different amounts of enemies and um, put things at different distances, etc. Um, just kind of dynamicizing that, that mission variation. Yeah, and there's, there's actually a lot to this, a lot of additional complication besides the mission itself, because when you think about it, you may have a mission giver, and the mission giver looks at your reputation and decides that he's only going to give you the junior starter missions. And so he calls up the, you know, go kill bad guys in this particular section, and he basically says, you know what, given your reputation, I'm going to assume that you can only take, you know, a difficulty value of one. And passing a difficulty value of one into that mission will only create one or two guys, and your reward will be be, you know, of a considerably lower rate than it would, you know, than what it might otherwise be. As you do that mission, you build up reputation with him, all of a sudden he's passing, you know, higher difficulty levels into that mission template. And one, one of the complicating factors that we face is we need to be able to take this template and before we've actually instantiated it, before you've yes. actually accepted it, we need to be able to extract information out of it and process that. What I mean by that is we need to know before we've created the mission how much money you should reasonably be paid in order to do this. And we need to know if we need to have a sense of where this mission might actually take you and what the current status of that area is. Or is he sending you into an area rife with pirates or is he sending you into an area that's you know got tons of Security and it's the safest thing in the world. Or an active supernova, or like any number of things that are terrifying to go. And, and, and this is this is part of the reason why we've actually made some significant progress on this particular problem, but there are multiple facets to dealing with it. And I'd actually say that at this point, we're in a relatively good you know place on the on, you know, on the on the underlying, the dynamic mission side, and we've still got a considerable amount of work to do over on the actual UI side to take a mission template, look at your reputation, create some proxy references to that mission template with different metadata associated, and then assuming that you actually select option number three, which has metadata this, then we'll instantiate the mission, pass in the metadata so that it actually customizes it as appropriate for the selection that you were just, you know, shown and you can then go off and execute that mission and you'll be paid the correct amount and you'll encounter the appropriate amount of difficulty for you know for what you were promised and for what he thought you were capable of doing given your reputational level because we already do have in game something that players can kind of play with right now the bounty hunter chain which is 
effectively what this will look like to players. It's just a matter of that took a lot of setup. And now it should be something that we can pretty much like click a few buttons and we're good to go. That's exactly it. Like in, in the end, it's all about allowing you to as quickly and easily express a solution to the problem of I've got a mission giver. This mission giver is going to dispatch you to deal with you know with bad guys. The variables wind up becoming well, how many bad guys and how quickly are they going to reinforce themselves and are they going to be you know are they going to be flying capital ships or you know little small hornets and what kind of stuff will they have on board and in what areas of the solar system you know. Will this conflict be taking place? So th these are all things that we can bend as appropriate, depending upon what you know, what we think you're capable of, or what that NPC you know would theoretically think you're capable of. Yeah. Well, and, and we talked a little bit about the procedural character generation uh, in the last USPU sync that we did on for Star Citizen Live, but. That's going to be taken into account. The, the back end is going to be generating more and more difficult NPCs based on the gear, based on the quality of the stuff that they can do, their behaviors. So all that needs to get fed into the mission and become part of how we reward the players and, and enhance that experience. But these are all things that are going to be fed into the mission instead of just the static data that we yeah. kind of have right now. Like you, you literally have to place nodes in the mission script logic that, that says like spawn this kind of thing right. if we roll this and this kind of thing if we do that. And it's just, it's It's work, just work, time work. and, and the, this is all data that, that we, as long as we can get it up front, we can pass that into the mission ahead of time and, and actually show that in the mission right up. You know, it's like here's, here's a mission that's gonna take you here and who's offered by this guy, here's General Expect rewards. a medium level of resistance, yeah. or this many hazards, or yeah. Fundamentally, that's why reputation is so important. Is it's it's your. It, I, I would it lets say us see it, how good you are. It's, it's it's the single most important means of progression within yes. the game. Clearly, you Hopefully. can you know you can basically upgrade your character by buying different ships. You yeah. can customize your ships. You can buy you know different armor and weapons you know for your character. But in terms of granting you you know membership within an organization or access to areas you know um with you know with with more or less hostility depending upon which yep. organization you're a member of and you know what your reputation is within there and how this character responds to you and whether yes. they give you the you know the super challenging and lucrative missions or the super easy things that mm -hmm. basically just have you you know doing you know piddly little stuff that, that, that anyone can accomplish because they don't yet know you and don't yet trust you um, that's what the reputation system is all about we, we've got we completed the you know as I said earlier the basic system the last year yeah. we incorporated the reputational logic into the, you know into the subsumption you know, mm -hmm. mission and AI language. Um, we got the Delphi app so that you can actually see what your standing is with all these different NPCs and organizations. The one piece, the, you know, the key piece of the puzzle that we're still missing is the ability of the mission system to basically, one, have the mission templates, you know, created that mm -hmm. actually take these inputs and then be able to feed them in and have it customize itself as appropriate. And uh, related to that is, you know, and it's no small talent. It is a fair, it is going to be a fair bit of work to adapt the the UI to actually allow for this, and that's you know just just on a brief aside, one of the big tasks remaining on the you know, on the USPU group for next year is going to be refactoring the entire mission interface and converting it from the old flash tech to the building blocks you know tech, and that's one of the reasons huge, why yeah. we made some forward progress on this, and then we kind of like waited because anything that we would have done over on the flash side would have been throwaway work, and so we made the decision to basically wait to complete the last 25% of this particular puzzle until we had the correct you know, UI foundation in place, which ultimately, A, it'll make it much easier to implement these changes that I'm talking about, and B, you know, we're not gonna have to you know, design it, throw it away, and then design it again. And, and it doesn't mean that the players won't be able to experience those changes in the game without the UI, right? That'll, that'll still be there, but we'll be able to present that and, and give you a better indication of how the mission is going to play out or what you're going to get as a result of the mission with the, the new UI. And, and also to show you, you know, missions that you don't have the reputation yeah, for. Yeah, right, exactly. Like, it's weird that, that how important that is, but it actually is, is vital that you be able to see, like, hey, I'm not actually with these people. They don't know that I'm that good of a cargo hauler, so they're not going to give me this super difficult cargo hauling mission. Um, we well, got to know what you're striving towards too, exactly. as well, right? It's like I, I, I want to get better at this. I want to do missions with these guys yes. because that's going to push me to go and get that one right there. That offers this much extra reward or this this membership here. Yeah, and, I, I, and I don't want I, I don't want to go into this. this is a this yeah, is like it, a, no. I just mean th this this is a topic, topic for another day. Sure. But yeah. I was just going to briefly mention you know, orgs, perks, benefits. So we're talking about reputation, and you can see your standing with you know with different organizations with players, and we will you know at some point you know next year you know start to move forward with. 
you know, with, with, when I say orgs, perks, benefits, you guys know what I'm talking about, which is basically all of the benefits that may, you know, uh, that may be conveyed upon you just as a result of being within this organization or having a certain level of stature within this organization. This may be anything from, you know, expedited, you know, ship deliveries, you know, after your ship gets blown up, you, yeah. you, you don't have to basically, you know, pay a fee to basically, you know, get it as quickly as possible. That's automatically covered. You may get, you know, discounted prices at certain shops. Um, you may, you know, simply not get a hostile response from pirates in this area if you're a member of, you know, of the Pirates Guild and things of that sort. And so this, this plays into what we're talking about here because you're able to look at an organization, you're able to understand what kind of benefits it conveys to, you know, its most exalted members, and then you can decide whether or not you want to basically try to increase, you know, increase your ranks, you know, within there. And you know, in, in terms of doing that, the challenge is simply having enough mission variety and diversity yeah. to enable the player to feel, hey, I, I started out, he didn't trust me, he gave me, you know, the real simple, not particularly lucrative mission, and I've been working on this for days and days and days, and I've been moving up in terms of the difficulty that I faced, in terms of the reward that I was offered, and finally I got to the promised land, and now I basically, you know, have membership within the organization, and now I can basically go to Grim Hex and have no concern that, you know, the local, you know, pirate organization is basically going to assault me. Turrets aren't going to shoot at you, et cetera. And importantly, like, that is something that makes your character unique. In an MMO, uh, it's very huge. important that you bring something to the table that other members of your, your friend group might not have, frankly, or your organization. You have to come in and say, hey, I actually have access to this really cool mission or this really cool thing, and, and by doing that, I can, can make things cooler for my group, and we encourage that community play that is so vital. Yeah, that, that actually brings to mind, right now we have We've historically had this faction system that we use to determine hostility. It's 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 always been it's 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 always been one of these systems that we know we're going to change it. We know that it's not sufficient, you know, for where we're eventually going. Um, it's it's very just rigid. never yeah. It's just yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah. just never it's never been a high enough priority. We're getting to the point where we're going to have to resolve this because the rest of the game is getting complex enough to where it's 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 really starting to fray at the seams. So earlier this year we released the Xenothreat mission and that was still entirely based upon the faction system of hostility and that imposed a serious limitation in that while players could join up and basically fight on the side of the UE and try to repel the Xenothreat invaders, there was no real officially sanctioned you know, means of you joining the side of the bad guys, the yeah. Xenothreat. You could go shoot you know, the players that were you know, supporting the UE, sure. you could shoot the UE itself, you could get a crime stat, but the Xeno threat would still view you as hostile. They would yeah, still exactly. engage you, still try to kill you, et cetera. This was something that we got right up to the very end with Nine Tails, and it was driving you and I crazy. Yes. And we wanted to fix it. And we put in what equates to, I'd say, a, it's a temporary hack yeah. to where what we can effectively do is allow a faction to override its normal you know, dislike of someone in another faction based upon whether or not they have a particular mission yes. token in their inventory. Well, it's if they're doing a certain mission at this time. Yeah. Um, and, and that is honestly not how we want to do this. A hundred percent. So, so yeah. in this particular case, if you accept the support nine tails you know, mission, Suddenly everyone then flips. they would normally view you as hostile, but because you're holding that, you know, that token, that mission reference, yeah. they'll go ahead and grant you an exemption. But this is, you know, it is clumsy. It was viewed as a, a very temporary solution. The long-term solution that we've always discussed is going to a more reputational yeah. you know, based, uh, uh, you know, hostility system. Can you go into a little bit of detail about why that's so important and what kind of additional things uh, we'll be able to support in the future when we have such a, a more flexible system? Sure. I mean, the, the, the why it's important is, is fairly obvious. Like, if I have to make sure that you have a certain mission in order to do something, then I can't say, for instance, you can't go to Grimhex. I'm sorry. You're on the side of the police. Like, they will shoot you. That is a problem. No, right now, like they are actually just civilians, so that they don't they don't care. Essentially, um, if it's reputation, it's something that persists. It doesn't matter if you have a mission or not. You have done.
done something that has made these people like or dislike you, and no matter where you go and what you do, unless that changes, they are going to attack you or not attack you, and you can kind of count on that. Well, your actions have an impact they do. Uh, on how the world perceives you, right? Yep. And it's especially important, like, as, as we go into Pyro, as out. there's multiple factions that are that are kind of at war with each other out there, we, we want the players to be able to get in good with one or, one or the other. Exactly. So I, I, it, it's a change that we know we need to make, and I think it's really going to take shape and form as we go into Pyro, because UE in Stanton is a pretty you know, binary thing. There's little pockets of pirates, but it's not sure. it's not like Pyro where it's gonna have like these very distinct groups that are kind of warring with each other and we the reputation system is perfect for that. It will allow us to open up also just like an entire branch of content. Like we don't really have missions where you work with criminals for the criminals. There's there's nothing that really makes you a long-term criminal player. Y your crime stat can be wiped. You can kind of, you know, get rid yeah. of that source. It's it's not something that I am a criminal player and I, I, I log in and I'm going to do these kinds of things. I'm going to be on this side of things. These people hate me. These people love me. Um, that allows you to define your character. That allows you to define your play style. That allows you to, to define where you're going to do and what you're going to do in the game. The entire game shifts if you have the ability yeah, to say. Yeah, I would say it's much more like the real world to where it's, you know, the concept of what, you know, hostility, it eventually equates to binary. Either yeah, I engage sure. you, either I well, attack you, or I do not. But in between, there's there's literally just, you know, a sea of grays exactly. in terms of, yeah, of this there. organization hates that one, this one likes this one, yep. you know, this one doesn't like, this one's neutral towards that one, etc. And you wind up having, inevitably, some sort of unique mixture of all of these yeah. different things. And so in the end, you know, you'll, you'll, you know, we will prioritize these things and determine it's like, oh, well, you're, you know, you're a member of, you know, the, you know, the walk old ladies across the street. Well, I, I like <laughs> that. Oh, but you're also a member of the Pirates Guild. I, I really hate that. So even though I like that one, I'm still going to attack you. And so it's just, it's much more flexible in terms of, de, you know, in terms of determining all of these, you know, complex relationships that players are eventually going to instill upon their characters. Like, it's not going to be either I'm left faction or right faction. It's like there's going to be lots and lots of different organizations, lots of different NPCs, and your standing with those will be all over the map. Some players will be in really good standing with this. Some players, you know, will be really low on this other one. And, you know, the, the, the level of variability that we'll be able to support with, you know, with the reputation system is just going to be, you know, far, far superior to what we have now. Dorsey, you implemented the Nine Tails mission, which allowed players to fight on either side of the conflict. How does the gameplay experience differ depending upon which side you choose to support? And can you explain how this actually, in the end, wound up being a server optimization of sorts? Well, I mean, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. What happens differently is if you are on, on the, uh, the lawful side, you are working for Crusader Security, uh, they are sending out scanning ships to try and locate the Nine Tails fleet. Um, and you have to go and protect those. And then once you have found that fleet, you go and destroy that fleet. You are killing ships until you basically deplete their resources and make them retreat from the area. On the Ninetales side of that, you are of course going and hunting those scanning ships. You are uh, given their locations and you're told, hey, go destroy these. And then once the fleet portion of it gets found, you go and try to defend that fleet. And if you can hold them off for long enough, then Ninetales will actually uh, win and, and uh, Crusader will be unable to drive them away before they achieve their, their objective, essentially, which is a, a hidden objective that, that we aren't revealing at this time. Um, but we are now. But, well, hmm. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the genesis of this, though, Ninetales was not originally actually supposed to be a PvP event at all. It was, yeah, yeah. much like Xenothreat, supposed to be just pure PvE. That had performance problems, frankly. Uh, spawning enough ships in a, a pure giant fleet battle to challenge 30 to 50 players made the server just tank. Um, it, was, it was incredibly painful, and it just didn't play very well. Um, it also, to be honest, was the same thing as, as what Xenothreat yeah, already exactly. had done. And I wanted to do something a little different. Um, and that, that kind of combined into to this, this push to get um, the aforementioned kind of duct tape solution for hostility in so that you can align on, on both sides. And, and by doing that, I make it so that I don't need to spawn ships to challenge 30 to 50 people. If things are running smoothly, I have 25 versus 25, and I don't need to spawn really just about anything. Right. 
Um, you, you bring the NPCs in just to flesh to, out, to, 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 to even the odds, yeah. to, to get the challenge you know, to the level you need. Um, but when you actually have players that will legitimately fulfill a particular role, you, you take off. advantage of that. Yeah. Uh, it was a creative way to load balance the mission and yeah. the population in the I, area. I, I would nice. say, though, that in general, this is 100% exactly what we do want to do, which is we want to give the players yeah the total freedom to basically do whatever they want and right. then as i always say it's like you know they live with the consequences they live with the mm -hmm. repercussions of their actions if you go and support nine tails if you support xenothreat it's like that will have you know an impact on okay. how people view you you know the aforementioned yeah. reputation system and you're standing with you know with key npcs within the game and how you the ue views you and you know whether or not certain organizations want to allow you within their ranks and some of these things you do will have Long-standing impact yeah. where if you ally yourself with a group, you know, uh, you know, like the Nine Tails, you may be prohibited from joining some organization that yep. you've been aspiring to for a very long time. Unless so, you do something to work that back, like yeah, you got to well, earn it's a that balance, trust, right? Yeah. And and we want we want those scales to go one way or the other. It's not that we want you to be able to be perfect with everybody all the time, like that. It comes at a cost. It depends upon the severity, right? Which is, if you do jaywalking, well, yeah. then sure, someone is not going to find it that difficult to basically assume that from now on you'll stay on the right side of the law. So we'll go ahead and let you into our transport guild. If, on the other hand, you're you know committing acts of piracy and murder and everything else, it's like, oh well, now I'm not sure that I actually want you in our organization, which adheres to all the laws of the nearby area and everything of that sort. That element of being able to pick your side and, and do what you want to do in the game is something that, you know, because of that we want to allow in pretty much every piece of our content going yeah, forward. It, it needs is, to be as much a, as possible. Ingrained in the game with yeah. everything else. Yeah. The only reason we haven't you know, traditionally supported is, is it's the tech. It's it, it's well, and and to a large degree that you can call out a few specific pieces of the tech, right? Yeah. Which is the reputation system certainly plays a role. Um, the, you know, the lack of a reputation-based hostility system. We're still using the old faction system for Xenothreat. That was literally the number one reason why early in the development process we nixed it on Nine Tails. We were literally within weeks of release, and it it. it so it, it, would, it, it was going to bother me to yes. put out a second one yeah. that had the exact same yep. limitations as the first. And so despite the fact that it was going to be you know, an unattractive hack to fix it, yep. I wanted to fix it. It, it did. It completely changed it the did. experience. And so it, it is you know, what I always refer to as it's duct tape. We'll get some value out of it as soon and as quickly as we can you know, convert the hostility system over to the, you know, the proper reputational version. We'll do that. Um, but in general, for the short run, we can continue to use this hack for some other missions that we have in the hopper. And once we have that reputation version in, like we will update Ninetales to handle that, and it will play better as a result. Yeah, that, that's actually another uh, point that I want to like touch on a little bit, which is, so we did Xenothreat, and we released it, and then we basically brought it back and you know did some relatively mild alterations. We changed how the two middle phases basically transitioned automatically between them as opposed to being distinct, so that we could have the whole salvage process, and then you had you know the climactic battle, and then it kind of like rolled around, but there was still salvaging you know, during the later part. On Nine Tails, we basically released it, and you've already identified a number of shortcomings with yeah. it that you want to address, not just for 315, but even beyond that. And yes. this is this is something, so I wanna, I wanna get to that in a second, but this is something that we're gonna continue to do with a lot of these dynamic events. They're intended not as one-shot missions, you play them for you know, a month, a quarter, you know, six months, and then we lose interest and we move to other stuff. The, the basic idea for these things is these events represent some sort of, you know, archetype almost yeah well I, i'd say they they represent it's almost like a customized chunk of gameplay it's yeah. pirates have locked down an area or xenothreat has decided to invade the solar system or pirates have basically run amok you know over in this area or you know drug runners have completely you know seized control of these you know manufacturing facilities you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and the idea is that we'll have all of this information over within quantum and then we'll look within our yes. extensive library of these 
these events, and we'll decide which one most closely you know, matches that. We'll customize it as appropriate and then trigger it. And so the idea is that we're, we're layering all of this, this custom handcrafted designer content onto this systemic background. Yes. And so we really get the best of both worlds. We get you know, a nice, logical, systemic universe that ebbs and flows, it evolves, it basically changes logically in response to player actions. But at the same time, we get all of the you know, incredible stories and the explicit dialogue and the intricately designed challenges that a designer has put a lot of you know, time and thought and effort into doing. Um, and so you really get both of these blended together. But back to nine tails. So on 3.15, we're going to tweak a couple of the problems that you've identified. So you want to start with that? They're relatively small things, honestly, just due to the schedule. It's probably the most impactful one and the one that I've seen the most people talking about. There is a portion of um, Ninetales on the lawful side where you can deliver medical supplies to the blockaded station for a bit of an extra reward. They will pay you a little bit more if you have a certain mission. Um, and also their inventory is just very rapidly depleting, so you can pretty much always sell there and, and they, you will be selling at the best price that they can offer. The problem that occurs there is that everybody buys all of the medical supplies out there. And while that's really cool on a realism statement, with, with the game in the state it is and with trading in the state it is, that means that a lot of people can't participate in that part of the mission. And that's problematic, um, particularly at this right. point where we want to be testing how those play. We really want people engaging in that part of things. Those of you who were part of the, the first wave of Ivacati when we first tested this way back might actually remember that we originally had shop modifiers on the places that were selling medical supplies to make it so that they had a higher inventory that refreshed fairly frequently so that everyone could kind of engage in that. We were asked to remove those so that we could emphasize the derelicts, which are around the station that um, you can take medical supplies off of, because basically the derelicts made it so that there was another way to get those medical supplies, but they didn't... It, it, it took so much more time that there was really no reason to do that if you could do well, the It actually trading. goes back to what you were talking yes. about earlier, which is I can buy them instantaneously from the shop and there's no loading right. time and then I can move them over here and I can instantly unload them. If I had to physically pull them off, you could more easily balance these things. Whereas right now, I really do have to go manually pull each individual one off of the derelict ship. And so I'm incurring all of the you know, the physicalized cargo expense on one side and not on the other. And so in the end, sure, you know, just due to the sheer amount of time, it's like it takes me 30 minutes to get 12 boxes this way, or I can go buy 50 boxes, you know, in a split second. Which one are you going to do? Some people might still do the derelict because they're fun, frankly. It's a fun little FPS raid, but yeah, a lot of people are going to look at the, the, the dollar signs and just go, okay, this is obviously the better option. That being said, we're probably going to put back in, it's actually a pretty easy, I left them in there because I had a feeling we might want them back. Uh, we're just gonna flip a switch and probably put those shop modifiers back in. We, we've seen how people play the derelicts. There's plenty of them in Xena Threat. Um, we wanna see the trading, frankly, and, and so that will allow that to come back online. Another relatively small change um, that, that, that is probably going to be coming in, we are seeing that many people are not engaging with the criminal side of things, and that is very much, like, the whole thing that we were doing with making it into a PvP mission for, for uh, the purposes of, of okay, helping we're performance gonna, We're going to have to gets, better gets entice them to basically so, fight on the exactly. you know, side of the Exactly. We, we need to entice them. So that means, I mean, they already are being paid more than the other side. I'm probably going to up that even more, frankly. They are going to become very lucrative, hopefully. And that is the short-term solution. And, 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 and this is where, like, ideally, you you know, helping out the Nine Tails building reputation. Becomes, Ideally, we yeah. would be able to yeah. offer Long other term. benefits of yes. being in that organization. Other things that some percentage of the players would aspire to and want. You know, other rewards that you get for building, you know, for building up your standing with them. Which won't be for 315, you know, 100%. But, but that is definitely where that is intended to go. The other thing that we might want there is a system to dynamically modify jurisdiction because one of the big punish points that happens to a criminal when they are uh, helping on that side in that area, despite the fact that Ninetales has supposedly taken over this area, when they get killed, they go to jail, which right. is a bit 
weird, frankly. We, we originally did want to make it so that you wouldn't get brought to jail, but there just wasn't enough time to fit the tech into the schedule. There still won't be for 315, but that is a longer term thing that we want to have, is the ability to kind of dynamically modify these yeah, jurisdictions. Yeah, that's just light on a problem, right? Yeah. Like it, exactly. Yeah. It was one we kind of saw coming, but frankly, it was good to have it confirmed, and now we can hopefully put some pressure on that, that happening. Yeah, we, we, we were a lot of those. Like, we added yeah. this, we had the shop modifiers, we had the probability volume modifiers, we added the ability to do, you know, the quantum lockdowns, you know, through the dynamic events and stuff. We haven't yet added the ability to add the, the dynamic population modifiers. And so this one was, as you said, we, we knew this was going to be an issue. You can't necessarily get everything you'd like into every release. And so the point is, we got nine tails out. You had some other longer term yes. things that you wanted to address as well. Can you talk about those? It's, it, well, some of them, frankly, are just things that are going to be uh, things that will naturally happen, to be honest. Um, performance is uh, still a big problem. I do want to like talk to the performance thing for you know for a second, which it is the progress. Huh? It's been we we basically generated something on the order of 120, 130 yeah. different individual gyras um, that people were addressing in the run up to Xeno threat. Because what what inevitably winds up happening is is we get performance to a certain level, and then we're at, you know, we're basically adding Tweaking. more locations. We're basically enhancing the AI logic. Yeah. We're adding you know new functionality, and so it's 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 always a running battle to where you're adding more you know you're adding more stuff as you're making other stuff run faster, yeah, and so you tend to get a net wash. And we actually ball. found ourselves. With Xenothreat, one of the reasons we held it for a couple of extra weeks was we wound up finding ourselves in a very bad spot to where there are inevitably, there are, there are problems now, we're very familiar with them. Um, they were much worse, you know, just a few, you know, uh, you Before, know when we were originally yeah. supposed to release it. We fixed just, it was it so was many. an endless litany of these things where it's like, you know, on profiles, you know, things well showing 100, up, yeah. you know, stalling the main thread, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Those are getting cut down to a millisecond here, two milliseconds, but there's just such a quantity. And so the what I want to touch on a little bit is, is as we finalized some bits of tech, like part of the reason we were able to devote as much time to getting things back into at least, you know, uh, what I'd call like, you know, an acceptable state, not a great state. We've got a lot, you know, we've got a lot more work to do to get this thing to the level of performance we want. There's a lot of problems, you know, the rubber banding that, you know, we're yeah, intimately that's, familiar that's with. Cool. We absolutely positively want to deal with it. It drives us, we, you know, we all hate it. You know, we want to fix it, um, but as, some of these people roll off of things like their server meshing, you know, tasks and stuff. We're now getting to the point to where we can keep people focused on this particular yeah. problem for, you know, certainly a longer period of time than they've been able to do in the past. It's just I, a matter I, of that being the focus. I, that, that's exactly certain, it. Yeah. It's, it's just a matter of it being the focus. A lot of the engineers that are working on server meshing are the people that would be fixing these optimization yeah. problems, right? So your your game's going to run as fast as your biggest bottleneck, and that's about it, right? And you're going to hit the next one and the next one, and you're going to keep fixing them until your game runs a yeah, little it was, better. Yeah, it was almost an endless litany of spawn stalls, the entity, you know, deletion stalls. And it was impressive to see how quickly those guys were eradicating, you know, some of these really, really Big egregious, ones, like, you know, performance, you know, impactors. Like three, four hundred millisecond spikes going down. Go, to going down to like, yeah, one or two milliseconds. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's absolutely. We, we spend a lot of time crafting to make sure that, like, this the, these waves are coming at the appropriate amount of, of, of um, difficulty for the number of players that are there and, and all this stuff. And if the spawn queue starts to slow down, that kind of snarls. It doesn't it just doesn't work. You can't design a great experience. You can design an okay experience, but not a great yeah, one. As, as you know, on, on Nine Tails, I know we, we we played with this quite a bit. Yes. We definitely did on Xeno Threat, where it's like, well, we want to bring in ten guys at once to present right. a certain amount of challenge, but then yeah. you got to like spawn them all simultaneously, and so we wind up bringing them in. One at a time, so we're basically distributing, yes. you know, the spawn load over time. And while it's true that, you know, on average, the you know the amount of you know uh, you know challenge you're going to face will be identical. Mm -hmm. There is a big difference between yes. sh ten ships showing yeah. up at once versus one. And it was the same thing with the number of capital ships was originally larger, and we had to whittle that down. And so as the performance gradually improves, obviously we'll basically start to expand our ambitions in terms. In terms of you know what we're you know what 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 kind of experiences we're actually putting out there for players, and the existing ones will just improve. Frankly, those missions will almost become new beasts just by the very nature of that happening. And that's that's what when when you say like what is the long term thing? That to me is is the biggest thing because a lot of these events will just be better. 
You're currently working on a sequel of sorts called Jumptown V2. Can you go into some more detail about what players can expect from that with the initial release? Yeah. It's, it's actually, I'm trying to keep it very, very simple. Uh, Jumptown was originally this, this community event, uh, and, and I want to keep that, that vibe as much as possible. I, I'm, I'm trying to have a very light hand. So what I'm doing is I'm basically taking a location, um, I'm going to make it so that it starts to spawn physically um, a bunch of boxes of, of a very lucrative uh, uh, material, in this case, maize, commodity. Um, and and that will then, uh, it'll start to spit that out at a certain rate, which will, will entice people to go there and, and, and collect it, put it on their ships, fly it away, whatever. Um, but but, but the, the, the point there is that that is an area that will be very, very lucrative for a, sh a short period, which will entice a lot of people to conflict over it. Um, when, when you've got a place that is, that is popping out a box of maize for free that you can just pick up at every 30 seconds or so, like, that is, that is dollar signs, and, and people will kill for that. Not only because it's fun, but also because it's, it's worth it, frankly. So, so essentially, there is a location, there is a, a thing that spawns these boxes, and I'm going to turn it on. And that's about it. One, one of the things I didn't like about the original Jump Town was it was at a fixed location, and it was always on, and it basically spit these things out at a certain frequency. Outside of the fact that it was a bug, but well. yeah. <laughs> So, but but it was it, it, was, it was very static. Yes, yeah. that, that that's exactly it. And in, in general, I I just I hate static things yeah. because you know it, it's 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 always the same. So how, let's talk a little bit about Jump Town V two is being designed as a dynamic event, yes. and it's also extremely configurable. So yeah. We're going to start with support for any of the drug labs, the three. although that's really just a function of whether or not we could get environmental art team support Correct. for the other areas. Longer term, we will be able to activate this yep. at you know at a wide variety of different locations. The, we the all, concept itself is pretty simple, and it can be worked at all these different places. Yeah. Um, sorry. Sure, but but there there's a lot of things like uh, we put a lot of thought into recording additional lines of we dialogue did. to support different types of you know you know drugs or different types of commodities. Yep. You know, we have some generic lines so it can apply to you know all the stuff you know that's anything. You know, we don't want to be stuff. hampered by that because the the the, the lead-in time for for getting that dialogue can can be a little bit. Um, uh, damaging to doing just quick ads, frankly. Like, we want to be able to just say during a quarter, hey, you know it would be really cool? If there was an underground facility that was pumping out data or um, metal or, or at a refinery, and we want people to fight over that, and we can just add that because we, we so, planned ahead. So we've got dynamism for Jumptown V2 with respect to location. location. We've got dynamism with respect to what exactly it's going to be pumping yep. out. Another one that I wanted to support was the quantity. In other words, how, how long how will this fast, thing be much. spitting it out? Is it going to spit out 100, you know, you know, 100 SEU of cargo or 1,000, you know, 100 units of drugs, you know, you know or, or 10,000? And this was something, again, so it's been configured as a dynamic event to where it can have this this information passed into it and then configure itself as appropriate. At runtime. Like that means whoever yeah. or whatever. If That's it, the critical it, part. It, it, it currently is, is launched by a person who is literally like pressing a button on a, on a page. Um, and when they do, they can enter in a bunch of variables and, and those will determine where it's happening, what it's spitting out, how long it's going to last, sure. how fast. Yeah, I, I, I'll actually talk about that a little bit later sure. to where right, right now, you know, all of the events that we've launched so far are triggered, you know, via Quasar, and a person goes in, specifies the event, and, specifies the inputs. You know, and you'll talk about it being 100 percent driven. So Jumptown V2. An another one of the specific design objectives was to use it as the first test case for these systemic triggers, to sure. where we can actually have quantum inject this information dynamically. Yes. And so like right now we're running nine tails and one of the complaints that I've seen is, you know, hey, it doesn't fire you know, often enough. It's like I missed it and then it's gone. And so one of the you know, one of the directions in which we want to go is having some of these events, like Jump Town, which can be triggered by player by, actions, by player actions the, or Quanta, or player yeah. and Quanta, basically doing whatever we determine. Maybe it is a certain amount of drugs are being bought, sold, inter, you know, yes. lots of you know drug runners are basically you know traversing this shipping lane. Whatever kind of you know conditions we want to put, and then we can measure. 
you know, both on the quantum side, you know, eventually, and then you, even in the short term, you know, on the players, it's like how many players are basically moving drugs back and forth here? Yeah. How many players are basically, you know, dropping commodities off at of this location? And if we have a dynamic event compatible with whatever these, you know, with whatever these, you know, uh, whatever these conditions are, then we can go ahead and automatically trigger it and inject, you know, inject those customized parameters into it so that it, so that it basically more accurately represents what's actually going on in that area. Right now, we're just shortchanging that, but, but eventually, yeah. That, that's it. that's actually you know I, I I like the whole you know jump town concept but I, you know my my favorite aspect by far is the fact that it's being designed as a test case for some of this you know up and coming you know systemic yeah. technology on the back end so that we can start to go oh at 3 a.m. conditions you know were met and we're going to go ahead and trigger jump town you know on you know on on Lyria and we're basically going to put this particular drug into it and it's going to be 679 you know units of drugs and you know however quickly you know if players are there to basically you know pull those things out that will be how long it lasts and so all of a sudden you have you know it's it's a transient event which is sometimes we may inject, you know, we, we, if we can scale this however we want, sure. such that, you know, when these conditions are met, do we take the total number of, you know, you know delivered drug, you know, drugs or whatever and multiply times 10? So we can basically turn it into something that's going to range for an hour or a day or 10 days or whatever else, but we can, we can add that variable factor to where it's not always a constant. It's not always, you know, on for the entire, you know, for, you know, for the entire lifetime of the release. It's not always seven days. There's actually going to be, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's going to depend upon what is really happening within the world, and that's going yeah. to cause it to be customized. It's just something that's happening in the game. I mean, it's yeah. it's you, it's uh, natural events triggering in the world. You mentioned people on... saying like Nine Tails wasn't happening enough, and they would log on and they would wait for it to happen. That is not the goal. The goal is I log on and I see something is happening. There should always be an event of some kind that you could go and do. Maybe you log on and you want to do this particular thing, but also, oh man, that's happening right now. Cool. Kind of thing. So yeah, there will be there will be, there will be some of both. You know, Xeno Threat is the obviously big, yeah. you know, the big ones, and then you've yeah. got what I'd call like you know the the, the mid range you know things like the Nine Tails and stuff, sure. where you're locking down an entire area, and all of a sudden we've basically we've cordoned off you know. A region, and we're not allowing you to easily transport you know, uh, you know, quo. cargo, you know, back and forth to there, which basically starts knocking the prices up. Which is why we added all the, you know, the price alerts and things like that, so that you can actually be enticed by the fact that oh, this area that's been choked off. They really, really need copper. They're willing to pay this. Don't you want to try to break through the blockade? That actually does kind of get to uh, what you were saying earlier in terms of allowing some of the player ships that are going to, or some of the NPCs that are going to interdict you to actually be more effective at it yes. as we start to expand yeah. those quantum interdiction zones you know, it, to a larger size. It all interconnects. Yeah, and it could be influenced by players or the back end yes. simulation. It's, it's it's something that we'll be able to balance. We'll be able to pull analytics from the back end. It's it's measurable, and it'll be something we can tune over time. An another one on on uh, another point we're talking about on Jump Town for future directions forward is, and you and I have had this conversation a couple of times, is I would like to eventually be able to have NPCs basically fill in the other side. Like oh, right yeah. now, sure. one of the inherent flaws in it is it's purely PVP, right? Which is, I go there, I basically you know, control that area, I get the loot for as long as it's pumping it out, and unless other players come and try to basically kick you out of that area, it's, it's a cakewalk. And what we would want to be able to simulate, obviously, is, you know, if, if players are not going there, you know, would, would Quanta, you know, over on the simulation side, would they be attracted to, you know, this value generator? Of course they would. Great. At, at what rate? And that what rate's going to depend upon what it's spitting out, what the street, you know, value of that stuff is, how far it is from civilization, and they therefore have to travel, et cetera. And so the point would be that we want to be able to, just as we were talking about earlier, we want to, be, you know, with nine tails to where we were aligning, you know, players on either side saying, we'll use NPCs to basically, ba you know, to balance it however we want. In this case, if there are zero players on you know the you know on the attacking side trying to like take it over, well we're gonna have to fill those ranks with NPCs. That being said, one of the things that is called out very often as being an exciting portion of Jump Town, the original, was going there and not knowing if you were going to find resistance. That can kind of keep you on the edge of your seat a little bit. There's that it's too quiet. So it won't always a be a hundred percent, but but you don't need th that that 
Uncertainty doesn't necessarily need to only come as a result of whether or whether or not players are willing to do it. We can have uncertainty on the NPC side and say, exactly. maybe we will, maybe we won't basically you know, have them assault. Maybe they'll come in a straggler, one guy at a time. Maybe they'll come in a big coordinated group of 12 NPCs, Our all in heavy right. armor, armed to the tooth, and you know, and, and you'll basically be doing your absolute best, you know, to you know to hold that calling your friends, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The 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 point is, like right now, unless Unless we have the ability to basically set those scenarios up, then you know th some players on some servers will never get enough. that cool experience yeah. of a whole burst of guys you know arriving at one shot or the stragglers. Now, if players are basically going in there attacking, well, sure, I've already got 20 yeah. players on this side. Maybe I don't need to throw any other NPCs out to you know to. Or maybe I want to add fuel to the fire, frankly. Or, like or it, maybe you want to throw it, yeah. Players it, the, were very creative in the first one. Yeah, <laughs> like and and that's honestly what I'm really looking forward to is is what is. The, the tools that have been added to the sandbox at this point, it's such a simple event. I really am looking forward to seeing how they, they handle it. Like, you can come in in a, a land vehicle and you can, you can set up a tank or a ballista and just like pick people out of the sky, defend that area, turn it into a fortress. You can have dogfights in the air over it. You can, um, if you're stupid and you leave your ship turned off with its shields off, like someone's gonna blow that I, up. You and I talked in the early, early stages of Nine Tails about the fact that it's a drug lab. Why is it basically spitting, you know, spitting these things out? And the idea would be, well, they've produced a lot of them at that location, and so who would be one of the most logical people to come and try to take back control? It would be the guys that, you know, that basically, you know originally had control of that drug lab, it'd be, you know, whatever, you know, uh, criminal organization Happened we to want to basically yeah. have that thing. Or and a competition. A hundred percent. And so you could see, you know, players are in there basically, you know, reaping the rewards. Another, you know, player team assaults them and now the much, much larger threat comes and the players, you know, it could be a three way. The could players can alliance. team up, yeah. you know, with each other to basically hold them off and then split the goods, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the, 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 the real point to my mind is it just comes back to is configurability, which is I want to I want to be able to vary the location, vary the you know the type of material, vary the quantity of that material and the frequency with which it's produced. I want to be able to vary the challenges you'll face trying to basically hold it, and all of a sudden that starts to become representative of what we're trying to do with all these different dynamic awesome. events, which is. Yeah. We have a, we want to make templates that we can. You know, I always call it object-oriented content creation. You know, it, it's such a common concept over on the coding side. You don't really see much focus over on the content creation to basically put all of these rules and procedures and processes in place so that you can basically build nice modular chunks of content and easily link them to other pieces so that you're not reinventing the wheel every time you're doing this. Uh, like a good you know uh, you know a good example is the spawn clauses that we're doing you know, over for some of the infiltrator missions that we'll be talking about. It's like, that's absolutely going to play a factor in some of these you know, future iterations of things like, you know, whether it's Ninetales, you could see Ninetales eventually you know, supporting on the derelicts. Some of those derelicts actually have Ninetales members on them that we can basically create two or 20. You know, we can create them over time. We can basically you know, change you know, the you Or know, taking what over the station. Are. Like there's so many things you yeah. can do with that, so. Yeah, Pyro is going to be a good test bed for a lot of Pyro's that stuff, just with the, the strife for that. that is yep. supposed to be going on out there. So, Not to looking forward away. to it. All right, let's bring Luke into the conversation now. We started working on the Xenothread event around March of 2020, and it took about a year to get it out the door. We knew that it was going to be extremely difficult because we were missing so much of what we needed, including everything from the dynamic mission service that would drive the back-end logic, to the capital ship AI, target prioritization for turrets, functional countermeasures, tons of dialogue, and countless other things. Part of the allure, though, was that in one shot, we'd have a great test case for a litany of important features, like battles far larger than anything we'd previously done, and a test bed for creating missions that supported a variety of different play styles, like ship-to-ship -ship combat and salvaging. So, Luke, from your perspective, what were some of the big lessons we learned from Xenothreat? Well, Xenothreat was our first attempt at a large-scale fleet battle, so we learned a lot. The biggest takeaway was that we needed to develop our overly simplistic friendly fire system, which was leading to players receiving unfair crime stats and being kicked from the mission. So in the recent re-release of the event, we made major improvements to our friendly fire detection and tolerances, which drastically cut down on unfair crime stats, according to the feedback and analytics we received. What's great is this kind of change improves the whole game, not just the event, 
and paves the way for more large-scale space battles in the future. I think it's also important to add that another thing that became clear was that players wanted a counter mission involving PvP. So we've started planning with this in mind for subsequent releases. Luke, as the performance gradually improves over the next few quarters, what sort of things would you most like to change about Xenothreat? I think most people would expect my answer to be throw more AI at the player. But it might be that when performance improves, our AI becomes much deadlier, which could actually lead to us reducing their numbers. And this balancing is always the most difficult part of mission creation. The AI's performance can be wildly different on our local servers versus what it might be like on an overtaxed live server. And if an mission is too easy, it's not just a case of throwing more AI at it, as this will only compound the performance issues. We were happy with the balancing we achieved, but it wasn't quite what we hoped for. Once performance has improved, we hope to rebalance and deliver the experience we intended. Luke, we've invested a lot of engineering effort into our spawn closet tech, which allows us to precisely and intelligently push NPCs into and out of an area. The first major test of this tech will be the infiltrator class of missions, which I wanted to provide much more varied and challenging FPS situations than anything we've previously seen. To that end, we can now determine at runtime the type and number of NPCs we want to insert at a location, often at the behest of quantum. We can also apply a litany of rules to the spawning, like how many can be active at once, how the spawn rate changes when an alarm has gone off, and whether a boss might be found wandering the area with his guards or only after they've all been dispatched. The mission template supports a wide variety of objectives, ranging from killing everyone at that location to only killing select individuals, to protecting NPCs from any harm, to hacking computers, to extracting designated materials. Can you go over some of these mission variations in more detail? Of course, Tony. The underground facilities were the locations we chose for our first implementation of spawn closets, so this is where players will find new missions, as well as some existing missions that have been vastly improved by the addition of spawn closets and non-combatants. One of the new missions sends players to kill a heavily armoured target who only shows himself once his crew have been wiped out. Another involves the player searching a friendly facility for a number of boxes, identified using information provided on their mobiglass. At any point during the mission, small enemy assaults can be triggered, and the thing I love about this one is that players can choose to avoid the fight and gamble on the facility's defenders being able to repel them. And the last one I'd like to mention is, thanks to spawn closets, we now have our first FPS defend mission, where players join friendly AI in defending a facility from multiple waves of enemies. And the nice thing about this one is that in addition to the basic mission reward, Players also receive bonuses for the AI who survive to the end. Some of the benefits from this mission template are coming from smarter use of existing tech, like more modular subsumption logic, and some of it stems from new features like the spawn closets. Luke, how has the design setup of the infiltrator scenario varied from what you've done in the past? Well, spawn closets have had a dramatic effect on the types of missions we can build. Without them, we were unable to spawn AI mid-mission, as we couldn't risk them spawning out of thin air without warning, as that's really unfair on players. Thanks to spawn closets, we can now spawn reinforcement waves and spring ambushes anytime we want, with players able to recognise where AI is likely to reinforce from. Not only does this allow us to build brand new mission types, it allows us to spawn manageable amounts of AI and only reinforce when some of those are dead, to better balance the difficulty of the encounter. And you mentioned we're building our logic in a modular fashion, and the Eliminate Boss mission is a great example of that, because we've essentially taken the Eliminate All and Eliminate Specific objectives and combined them to create a new experience where players must draw their target out of hiding by first killing all of his crew. Luke, another mission template we're currently working on is called Rescue Transport, and it revolves around getting NPCs to a specified location. One of the variations allows the NPC to request personal transport via a service beacon, just like a player, to a designated location. Other variations involve adding assorted complications to getting the NPCs on board your ship, like having to first outsmart or outfight their captors, unlocking their prison door to release them, safely escorting them back to your ship for transport to the desired drop site. Longer term, we're going to add support in this mission template for a lot of other combinations, like having to drag unconscious characters onto your ship and back to a hospital and trying to lead NPCs through a burning ship. Luke, where do we stand with the current implementation of this and what remains to be done before we can push it out the door? Well, Tony, we're at the point where we have a working prototype in which AI can be asked to follow, wait, and take a seat aboard your ship. And even with this rudimentary setup, we've been able to flesh out the mission flow to a very detailed degree and have made a lot of headway into planning the dialogue requirements. 
We've got some effort to make sure that the mission is more than a delivery mission where the box has legs, so the client has patience that can wear thin, with your tip and rating being calculated based on your performance. We'll also be developing AI behaviours to deal with what happens should the player decide to kidnap them. The rescue mission module has been designed in such a way that it can work in conjunction with others like Infiltrator, meaning that we can easily inject some obstacles in your way, like a base full of captors. These missions will drive the development of AI following, so once complete, we'll be able to leverage that throughout the rest of the game. I want to pivot now and give an update on some of the systemic functionality that I detailed last spring. I said that we were soon going to have quantum controlling a few select bits of the universe and that we were going to be very measured in the rollout. We remain on track to activate these changes with 3.16 at the end of the year, and this initial release will allow Quantum to dictate three encounter frequencies, the prices of three commodities, and everything related to Combat Assist service beacons. As the simulation is refined and more of the linkage to the game is completed, we will expand the scope of these early tests and enable Quantum to play an ever larger role in shaping the universe. So let's go over how the gameplay experience is set to change. Probability volumes dictate how the likelihood of an encounter type varies within that region, and historically that information has always been static. Dynamic events, introduced in early 2021, allow that data to be changed by mission logic, but still don't support systemic modulation. You can see the frequency curve for pirate activity in red on the screen here, and the long and short of it is that no matter how many pirates you, your friends, or the entire community kill, the likelihood of encountering a pirate at this spot right here would always be about 5% per minute, and farther out, right about there, the odds would drop to 2%. Now, let's see what happens when we activate Quantum and it starts to provide real-time guidance to the probability volume service that controls this information and distributes it to the game servers. As is often the case with such demonstrations, the simulation is running at an exaggerated rate of speed so that I can easily illustrate some key points. The first thing you'll notice is that the fixed pirate curve just flatlined because Quantum says there aren't currently any pirates in this area. There are some valuable materials on the surface of Selen, though, and that's starting to attract some quantum miners represented in green. The distribution of the miners determines the shape of the green curve, and the quantity determines the amplitude. With the value of the ore available on Selen sky high and no threat in sight, the number of miners continues to increase, and you can see the encounter curve changing to reflect that. Pirates are drawn to high concentrations of wealth with minimal security, though, and are starting to swarm into the area, and as they do, you can see the red pirate curve adjusting. Quanta security, represented in blue, is drawn to conflict and is thus often a lagging indicator of criminal activity. So at this point, there are several distinct things happening. The number of miners in the area is still increasing, but the rate of increase has slowed dramatically as they start to weigh the increased risk of piracy. The number of pirates is still increasing because there's still sufficient value in the area to attract them and not yet sufficient security to dissuade them. The number of security forces continues to rise because the pirate problem is raging out of control and thus security pay in this area has gone through the roof. This trend continues for a while until finally the risk of piracy gets too high and the quantity of miners starts to drop. The pirates are doing their own independent mental calculus and still see sufficient value in the area, even once the miners start to fall off, to continue increasing their numbers, but that simply speeds up the rate of decline in the miners while at the same time, the threat from security continues to grow. So, eventually, the number of pirates in the area begins to fall off as well. As the threat of piracy begins to subside, the impact gradually ripples through the economy, lowering the rate of pay and demand for security services. The quantity of security forces streaming into the area eventually peaks too, then, and begins to decline. If you watch the curves, you'll see a rhythmic action to it all, with miners looking for high-value ore in safe areas, pirates searching for unprotected wealth, and security chasing conflict. Three different but very interdependent calculations. The system is always searching for equilibrium, and just as in a real economy, sometimes overshoots a bit in one direction or the other, which ultimately equates to opportunity for the thinking player. MPC Combat Assist service beacons have historically been generated via probability volume data, and were thus every bit as static as the encounter frequencies that I just covered. The odds of a request for combat assistance at a given location didn't vary based upon what was happening in that area at that time, and no amount of concerted community effort to stamp out what was putting those NPCs in danger had any chance of succeeding. To illustrate what's changed, let's jump back to Quantum. The miners are back in force, but there aren't yet any pirates, and thus there aren't any requests for combat assistance. 
Just as previously occurred, though, the pirates are going to slowly sniff out this opportunity and begin gravitating to this location. As their numbers increase, so will the odds of conflict with the miner, and thus the likelihood of a combat assist service beacon being issued. You can see a few contracts now, represented by the green icons. Quantum is dictating how many beacons should be present in this area in the exact details, such as how much Alpha UEC is being offered, but the data is actually maintained by the service beacon service that interfaces to the game servers and exposes these contracts to players. So, every contract that you're seeing pop up, which is a direct result of the amount of conflict happening within Quantum, can be seen and accepted by someone within the actual game. Security has started to show up, but isn't yet a major force, and the risk of piracy has gotten so great that some of the miners have decided to exit. The frequency of combat assist beacons is a function of both the quantity of miners and pirates and clamped by the minimum of either. So, as the miners depart, the number of outstanding beacons drops. Security has now reached the point where it's really starting to deter the pirates, and the reduced number of miners is just adding fuel to the fire. So, now the number of pirates starts to fall off pretty dramatically, which also impacts the total number of active beacons and instantiation frequency. Player actions are fed back into Quantum, such that if a lot of beacons are accepted and the NPC is successfully defended in the game, the security risk as perceived by the pirates in Quantum will increase, thus affecting their sense of whether the risk justifies the reward. This means that not only will the system ebb and flow of its own accord, but your actions within the game will directly impact the simulation and thus the overall state of the universe. There's one other important thing that I want to mention here, and that's the value of the additional context that Quantum is providing. We now know exactly who issued the request for combat assistance and even the likelihood that multiple ships might be involved. All of this information can be packaged up and associated with the beacon so that when and if a player accepts the contract, the instantiated mission can be customized to better reflect what Quantum says you should be seeing. The shop service has always had the ability to modulate the price of commodities based upon things like the amount of inventory on hand and its rate of change, but we haven't really exploited that feature for some of the basics like fuel and HPMC, which is the material required to affect repairs on a ship. One of the reasons for this is that it's one thing to have tradable commodities fluctuate in value according to some algorithmic logic that doesn't consider anything beyond the confines of that particular shop, but it's quite another when those materials are critical to playing the game. Now that we can properly gauge demand based upon factors external to the shop, though, even if the simulation logic still needs a lot of work, we're going to flip the switch and let the prices of fuel and repair materials start to undulate. So let's bring Quantum up again. The Tram and Myers mining outpost on Selen has been selected so that we can see its real-time prices for plasma fuel, quantum fuel, and HPMC. Keep an eye on these prices as the Quanta arrive on scene. A few of the miners are from distant locales and will be looking to top off their quantum fuel tanks, and that increased consumption is causing prices to trickle up just a bit. Plasma fuel is jumping quite a bit more, though, because it's in constant demand due to the fact that the miners routinely have to traverse the surface of the moon looking for valuable deposits of ore to extract. The price of HPMC hasn't budged because there hasn't been any conflict in the area, but that's about to change. The pirates have started to arrive and attack the miners, and that means that there are going to be some damaged ships that require repairs, and the price will continue to rise as the amount of conflict grows. Pirates require fuel, too, and most of their need revolves around the plasma that they'll use to engage ships in close proximity, so it's starting to get fairly expensive. Security forces have now started arriving in force, which means even more conflict in the area, which is why the price of HPMC has finally started to take off. Security forces burn a lot of plasma fuel hunting for pirates, and this is proving to be more demand than the local stores of inventory can satisfy. This means temporary shortages and skyrocketing prices until either the demand debates or the economy rebalances to ensure a more regular supply of fuel to this area. Up until now, all of our dynamic events have been manually triggered by someone loading up Quasar, selecting an event, specifying the input variables, and activating it. This works fine for major events that are intended to run for a long period of time, but it's problematic when the event needs to run multiple times per day or only when specific conditions warrant or needs to be customized based upon the current state of the universe. The solution to this problem is systemic triggers, which are small analytical programs that let us specify what sort of conditions within quantum warrant the creation of a dynamic event and allow that event's inputs to be mapped to all sorts of simulation state. I'm going to bring quantum up one last time and highlight the location of the three drug labs within the Stanton system. Raven's Roost is on Microtech's moon Calliope. Jumptown is on Crusader's moon Yella. 
and Paradise Cove is on our Art Corp's Moon Lyria. For this test, I've removed all commodities except for drugs, and thus any green quanta you see moving around are focused on moving these illicit narcotics. A systemic trigger has been set up that monitors the total drugs purchased at any of the drug labs, which you can see in the graphs below the star map. If the total amount of drugs purchased at one of these locations over a period of time exceeds the specified threshold, it will trigger the Jumptown V2 dynamic event. The location and quantity of drugs sold would be passed to the event as inputs, which the mission logic might use for any manner of things, such as temporarily overriding the shopping date at that site for the duration of the event. The shop service that communicates with the game servers is linked to Quantum, and thus all player transactions in the game are filtered back into the simulation, and their purchases are therefore just as relevant to the totals as those initiated by Quanta. All of the drug labs are seeing a bit of action, and Paradise Cove looked like it might be the first to breach the threshold. Some red pirates have started moving into that area now, though, and the green freighters have started to flee. It looks like they've decided to focus on Raven's Roost, and you can tell by the constant level of elevated purchases that they're probably going to trip the trigger pretty soon. There, that's it. The conditions for the systemic trigger have been met. You can see that Jumptown V2 has now been added to Quasar's active dynamic events list at the top right, and below that you can see the input parameters that it was sent, which include the Raven's Roost location and a numeric value of 916 for the total purchase drugs variable, which the actual Jumptown V2 logic uses to configure how many free units of drugs the location will produce over the lifetime of the event. The ultimate purpose of systemic triggers, then, is to allow us to easily and programmatically dictate when and exactly how handcrafted custom content will be layered onto the background tapestry driven by quantum systemic logic. As our library of dynamic events grows and the sophistication of the simulation evolves, you'll eventually find that it's difficult to tell where one system ends and another begins, and the whole experience will just feel more engaging and unique than what either technology could deliver by itself. That's it for our show today. I hope that you now have a better sense of some of the things we're aiming to accomplish over the next year, and that you're as excited as we are about the potential of these new features and technologies to really transform the gameplay experience. Until next time. So that's it. We're done. That's the whole show. Another Citizen Con in the bag. This one's a little different than others, but still our chance to come together safely and celebrate our shared interest and commitment to making Star Citizen everything we all want it to be. So what did we learn this year? I was going to, you thought I was going to do it. But I got to bust those bingo cards, right? If I had to guess what we learned, we learned that I'm just the lucky one that gets to sit here in front of the work of dozens of others putting today together, themselves in front of the work of hundreds more who dedicate their efforts day in and day out to making the biggest and bestest damn space game ever. It's my honor that, and that of the team that are here to represent their work every week, every month, and every year. For CitizenCon 2951, I'm Jared Huckabee. Until next year, have fun, be safe, tell those you love that you love them. I love you, John. And now here's Chris Roberts to take us home. Well, I hope all of you enjoyed everything you saw today. Um, we're very proud of what we've achieved so far, what we're working on, what we're doing in the, in the future. And it was great to be able to get in depth and, and show and discuss a lot of that today with you guys. And I just wanted to tell each and every one of you how much we appreciate all of you, your support, dedication, the hours you put into playing the game, giving us feedback, putting up with crashes and server disconnections and all the frustrating things that you can get when it's an alpha as we're striving to make the best game, or well, I think the best universe simulation you possibly can make now. That's kind of where we're going. From myself and the team at CIG, we're incredibly lucky to be in this position because I think no one else in gaming has the luxury that we do 
to really sort of dream for the stars and build something of the ambition that Star Citizen is. It's been a longer journey than I imagined at the beginning, but the game we're building is far more complicated, uh, far bigger, uh, you know, far more possibilities um, than I conceived I would ever get to do. Uh, but it's because of your guys' support and you know, everyone at CIG feels the same in terms of they get to work on a dream game. They get to do all these things. People don't say, oh, you can't do that. We've got to make it for this quarter. It's got to come out. And you know, the investors need their profits this year. It's like, no, we want the best game possible. That's all we at CIG care about. And that's all you guys care about. And so to be in that position is because of you guys. And I really, myself and everyone at CIG appreciates that. So thank you all very much. And I'm really looking forward to doing this in person for you guys next year, as opposed to uh, digitally. And hopefully um, all things, you know, fingers crossed, we'll get on the other side of this uh, pandemic and uh, we'll be able to do that. So uh, for me and everyone at CIG, thank you so much for watching.